back to panic stairwell. Susanna made it outside. Everybody out, let's go! And I get out there and I look to the right and everyone's staring up and I look up at the towers and that's the first time I've seen them and that's when I just started to completely lose it. In the chaos outside, the Petka's couple got separated. I didn't know if I have a husband anymore if because I knew how close he was to the to those buildings and when they collapsed, I said, that's it. I don't know if I have a husband anymore. While Susanna and David made their way north, so did a frantic Sylvia Petkus. Instinct led her to St. Vincent's Hospital and into the arms of her husband. Thank you, Thank you. And Susanna finally reached her family. Even they couldn't believe they were actually hearing from her. Every one of them told me they thought I was dead. They just grabbed me and just said, I can't believe you made it out of there. There is nothing better than a story which shows a family reunited. And I want to tell you again that the authorities in New York City are very reluctant to make any assessment of how many people are lost. We know just by looking at all and listening, looking at and hearing all of the appeals from family who are disconnected from family members particularly and colleagues who worked in the trade tower um, but um, there's nothing better than a family reconnecting under these circumstances we have incidentally confirmed that the New York police um, have evacuated the Empire State Building because there was a bomb uh, scare there um, we didn't know at first how serious a threat it was um, the FBI says that a dog reacted strangely and they obviously err on the side of caution. There has now been an all clear given on the Empire State Building, uh, which is a great relief to the authorities and everybody else here. And we, you can see it's well away from the World Trade Center. It's well above 14th Street in Manhattan, uh, one of the most significant landmarks in New York City. A landmark, uh, one of the tallest buildings in the country until of course it was eclipsed in this city by the, by the twin trade towers themselves. And now, as this young woman we were talking to just a little while ago who, who saw the trade towers every day coming across New Jersey, the Empire State Building and the Woolworth Building will stand out again as the significant landmarks in New York City that they were for so many years until the 1960s. But the important thing tonight, I don't believe there were many people in the Empire State Building uh, at this particular time, and there are just simply not many people out and about who do not have something of an urgent nature to do in New York City, but the police do confirm there was a bomb scare, they evacuated the building and gave an all clear pretty quickly, which suggests that there were not many people in the building. But it's, a, it's, a, it's another reflection of how high the state of alert is, not only here, but in many parts of the country as well. And to that end, here's a report from ABC's Martha Raddatz. In downtown Washington, D.C., this is what the war on terrorism looks like. Humvees and military police scanning the streets. The United States military has plans for a whole range of contingencies and I'm sure that all those plans are being updated now and as the latest intelligence is available it's fed in. The action the U.S. military has taken since the attacks is unprecedented. At sea, the Navy aircraft carrier USS George Washington with roughly 50 to 60 strike aircraft on board is off the coast of New York. Another carrier is stationed near Washington warships capable of responding to threats from the air, sea, or even underwater. In the Pacific, the aircraft carrier USS Stennis, along with guided missile destroyers and cruisers, are providing protection along the west coast. And overhead, AWACS, the Pentagon's airborne early warning system, and fighter jets are flying over New York and Washington. Every military airstrip in the country has F-15s and F-16s ready to fly. This military plan was activated Tuesday by NORAD, the Aerospace Defense Command in Colorado, charged with protecting the U.S. against air attack, attacks that before Tuesday, officials believed would likely come from abroad. We are, in a sense, seeing the definition of a, uh, of a new battlefield uh, in the world, a 20th, 21st century battlefield. Bases throughout the world are on high alert, checking IDs and vehicles. The real challenge for U.S. forces lies ahead once the enemy is identified and the promised retaliation begins. Martha Raddatz, ABC News, the State Department.
Thank you very much, Martha Raditz, who has monitored the U.S.'s relationships with the rest of the world and the security situation uh, in many different parts of the country tonight. It, it was only a matter of time, it seems to me, before the question of the Winter Olympics in Salt Lake City came up, and they have come up. Uh, they are in February next year. They are the next major, um, enormous international event to be held uh, in the United States, the Winter Olympics at Salt Lake City in February of next year. And given what has happened, but even before what happened here, uh, officials associated with the Winter Olympics were clearly anxious, given everything else that has happened in the world in the last several months. So here's ABC's Judy Muller. With the Winter Games coming to Utah just five months from now, Olympic officials are reevaluating their security plans in light of yesterday's terrorist attack. It does make us sit back and think, okay, now is a plan, can we really do what the plan says it can do? The plan already calls for restricted airspace over the Olympic venues, such as Rice Eccles Stadium, where the opening and closing ceremonies will attract tens of thousands of people. But the security challenge is still enormous. How do you screen that many people? Uh, how, do you, how do you protect all the venues? Uh, how, probably more importantly, importantly, how do you protect the routes between the venues? Ernest Lorelli is among the anti-terrorism experts who happen to be in Salt Lake, attending a conference sponsored by Jane's Defense Information Group. The Olympics, they say, present a tempting target for someone who wants to send a message, as we learned at the Atlanta Games. Uh, approximately 10,000 members of the press are in town. They're all set up. They're looking for stories. It is an enormous security challenge. The venues are scattered for 100 miles all along the Wasatch Mountain Range. Transit systems and tourist attractions outside those venues could present prime targets, targets that may be impossible to protect. I don't have an answer for that because it would be impossible to put a police officer every 10 feet. Can you have 100% security? Not without, you know, searching everyone individually, everyone, uh, every bag. The challenge for Olympic officials is to balance the need for security with a respect for civil liberties. Given this week's events, however, they may find the public more willing to sacrifice one for the other. Judy Muller, ABC News, Salt Lake. Judy Muller, who's been working in the western part of the United States tonight in many respects, and that report, as we said, about Salt Lake City was just bound to come up. Uh, we had Senator Joseph Biden here a while ago, you know, talking, we've had several people in to talk about what the Congress um, has been doing today and what it plans to do tomorrow. Senator Clinton from New York was going to come and join us this evening. She canceled, and nobody blames anybody for canceling under these particular circumstances. Tomorrow, uh, the president is going to meet with the joint leadership of Congress, I think we believe that now, uh, sometime mid to late morning at the White House. Is Terry Moran still with us? Okay, uh, is, um, okay, all right, um, and, and I want to continue to try to work through uh, the situation about the security yesterday as were all the others. As the night wore on, convoys of empty dump trucks sped to the disaster site. Wishing life to be normal again, Bob Arkin played his bass in a bar last night. On his way home through a traumatized city, he ran into his friend. I can't stay in the house because I'm all alone and it's like not even my own apartment. And I'm walking up and down the steps and I'm saying, I don't get it. I like so many in New York tonight, they can't quite take in the news and they analyze it relentlessly. And the thing I don't get is if, someone were, if I were on a plane with somebody with a paper cutter, I don't get that. Well, I don't, in the I first don't place, it. you're assuming that they held it to the throat and forced him to drive the plane, the pilot to drive the plane into the building, which yes. might not have been the case. I wouldn't be driving that plane in the well, building. Well, I mean, he, I don't think he didn't necessarily either. The pilot did. I think they, they probably just killed the pilot and drove it themselves. I mean, I'm concerned about terrorists all the time. All the time, and people laugh at me because there haven't been, there hasn't been a hijacking in New York since, like, 1991. And so they tried to make sense of it all, while others seemed lost in a state of shock. And the night wore on. Some bars were open late. Inside, people glued to CNN. There were no other topics of conversation. 
I'm here now because I couldn't get to sleep. That's why I'm here. I, I don't know what effect it's going to have on me, what effect it's going to have on the city. It's just, it just doesn't seem real. I mean, it just doesn't seem real. Do, do you think it'll take a long time to get over this? I guess. I mean, you know, it's going to be some kind of prolonged impact. I, I, you know, I'm not going to go to work tomorrow. Nobody's. I, I know my building. I saw on, on the news today when I was watching the TV, the, like the ground floor of my building was, was, was you know, the windows are blown out and it was burning too. So I don't even know if I have a building to go to when all this stuff clears up eventually. But, you know, I just feel, I mean, it just makes you sick. When I saw what I saw, it just, it just makes you sick when you realize that these people just were up there and had nothing, no option other than just, you know, just jumping. I don't know, you know, I mean, everyone's going to get over it, life will go on, it's just, it just doesn't seem, it just doesn't seem real when you watch it happen, you know, it just doesn't, it doesn't make sense. The next morning, the day after what everyone is calling the attack on America, people grab the special edition newspapers. The streets look normal, like New York except there surely has never been such light traffic. People go to work, and the mayor makes sure that garbage pickup goes on as usual. This is for morale, he's announced. Yet the city, in the morning anyway, is eerily silent, not the famous cacophony of New York. Surreal, like being in a movie. These are the words some New Yorkers are using to express what they see here. They're standing around mostly in shocked silence, looking at the still thickening smoke and the terrifying gap where the two World Trade Towers used to be. And what are you looking to do, right, thank you. No, personal belongings, no. And many are confused and frustrated. Ralph Edwards, evacuated last night, still isn't allowed home. Can you tell us to just come here and wait for a while and uh, he's coming in? Yeah, I mean, I have, nothing's life-threatening, but I need, I need stuff. Uh, we just need all our stuff. I just, Jesus. I mean, it's right here. But lower Manhattan still is considered extremely dangerous, and no one's permitted in the no-go zone. Ralph Edwards, his wife Cheryl, and neighbor Mark all worked near the Trade we Center. Look here, the buildings, you know, no longer there, and then you start to think about all your co-workers that um, you don't know if they're... You know, if they made it or not. And then you think about all the merchants that you've met because you go through the trade center every day, you pick up lunch, you pick up breakfast, you buy things in there. You know, were those people able to, to get out? How about you, Mark? I, I know we've, I've had that same thought. I mean, there's certain restaurants and newsstands that you stopped at every day walking through that, walking through the, you know, the underground there underneath the plaza. And uh, you just think about those faces you saw every day and those people and just hope they got out. Really do nice people. Do, do, do you feel like you're in another city, not New York? I don't know, Beirut or... I don't feel... How does it feel to you? I don't feel safe. I don't feel safe anymore. I mean, I don't... Uh, I didn't sleep at all last night. I thought I handled it well yesterday, but last night it's just everything just started coming back on me. And I, you know, I even saw people jumping out of the building, which was just terrifying. And so, you know, and all of it, when I tried to lay down last night, all of it just coming back to me. And so... I don't know. I, I don't feel safe anymore. Well, most people probably know someone. Yeah. Either you're gonna know someone that was that was um, that was killed in this, or you're gonna know someone who had someone. But over there, they're not gonna let me down. No, they won't. David Zinsner and Davi Abrison live in Tribeca, and they're not allowed home either. They saw the planes hit the trade center from their rooftop, and then they ran. This huge, I mean, when I'm telling you, it was like a huge tidal wave of smoke coming at you, rolling, like dense. Yeah. I could actually see it when it got to the base of Hudson Street at around Chambers or just below there. And that's when I thought that probably we should get out because the air was going to be, you know, uh, no good in a minute. <laughs> we ran, and I think most people did. Our whole building ran. I mean, all of us together like we had ran. A place to go that was. Yeah. We could spend the day watching it helping people out a little bit. Yeah. So that, that, I mean, you live here. Your life is here. How do you get past something like this? Well, it makes you think, you know, sometimes that people want to live in New York because it's the center of everything and 
conversely, if at the center of everything is as dangerous as this appears to make it, then you have to reconsider whether it's worth it. Really? On a basic level. I mean, sure, I think everybody does. That most people are, you know, can't get up and leave, but, uh, you know, it's certainly uh, can't be nothing heavier could happen. Do you feel any anger about this? I think everybody should work and pray for peace. I don't want this country to go to war. I don't. I think more people will die. And I don't know what we can do as humanity, but I'm hoping that this will raise it to another level where people can maybe figure out a way not to kill each other over the path to God, essentially. <laughs> a lot of it's religious driven, and I, I just, there's got to be another way. There's got to be another way, too. The second day draws to an end as the military adds its presence to the rescue effort. And the days of living in a war zone continue for New Yorkers. For The National, I'm Leslie McKinnon in New York City. Well, as we mentioned earlier, Canadians were caught up in the destruction and some are known to have died. Many more are missing. And that has plenty of people in this country waiting for news. The CBC's Matthew Pace sat down with one family now fearing the worst. She's my sister and, and I'm here with my parents. Jennifer Ewart calls the hotlines every hour. But as each hour passes, Robert and Kathy Ewart grow less certain. We've only heard rumors. People said they saw them leaving. People said they heard my daughter calling to people to leave, to get out. Their daughter, Meredith, and son-in-law, Peter, moved to New York a few years ago. They worked for an insurance company in the World Trade Center. Uh, certainly no one appears to have seen them leaving the building. We have called hotels. We have tried to get in touch with the New York Police Department, but the line is always busy. I don't mind seeing people talk about it, but I just can't watch the building fall down. That plane going the through. The plane going through. I just can't. It's just, I can't watch that. As bad as the images were yesterday with the plane going through Tower 2, somebody has even worse images today. <laughs> it's just mind-boggling. They're both quiet. They are gentle towards each other. Um, they have determination. He's, he's always laughing, smiling. I mean, that's his, that's his face right there. What can I say about my daughter? I love her dearly. We have hope as long as we don't hear bad news. I, I still have hope. They're still pulling people out of the rubble today, and there's people in hospital. And uh, I just pray to God they'll be okay. Uh, as each hour went by, I lost hope of ever seeing them again. And I am beginning to try and reconcile that fact. It will take a miracle, I think, for a call that comes and says, hi, Dad, we're both okay. Matthew Pace, CBC News, Otterburn Park, Quebec. Please stay with us. We'll be back in a moment. Tomorrow morning on Washington Journal, more reaction to the terrorist attacks in New York and Washington. We'll talk with Senator James Inhofe, who's ranking member on the Armed Services and Intelligence Committees. Also, House Minority Whip David Bonnier. He'll Something out of a movie. This, this is life-changing. There's no doubt about it. It has been a very long day, and there you see the New York skyline, which has become so familiar now, which was uh, brand new, introduced to us just, uh, seems like years ago, but just September 11th, 2001. 
when the Twin Towers came crashing down. Now, you see that not much is going on at this time, and this is important. It is not going on because there has been some shifting in that rubble around the Twin Towers. Makes it very, very difficult for workers to get in there, very dangerous for workers to get in there, and there is the risk of other buildings falling. One of them, one Liberty Plaza, which is the home of NASDAQ, 54 stories. There is a belief that there is a giant crack in it. It has at least the possibilities that it might come down as well. There is also another building called the Millennium Building, and that one might come down as well. And so there is considerable concern about that area. Obviously, as we are running out of time and finding survivors, this is uh, distressing news that they've had to pull back as that timeline begins to close in on us and as the hope for survivors begins to get smaller and smaller. As the investigation has been moving forward, uh, there is news about the, the pilots, news that the pilots have been trained right here in the U.S. At least one of them went to Rimbri, uh, Embry Aeronautical College and others went to the Huffman Aviation School in Venice, Florida. Now, these are some of the suspects that they've been tracking down. As you can imagine, there are thousands of agents that have moved out there. And as for the question of force, as for the question of the United States response, that is being discussed in Congress as well. Should the United States declare war? Should the United States simply wait, study, and then move? As you know, NATO already has said that an act of war against one nation is an act of war against all. Therefore, if the strike on the buildings are determined to have been from the outside, not domestic, then that would be considered an act of war against NATO as all. Pete Williams has been studying this investigation. Pete Williams is watching all the agents fan out through so many different places. Literally thousands of men and women who are, who are pouring over documents and talking to people, Pete. Probably about 8,000, in fact, Sawyer. If you look at the number of uh, actual special agents, those that carry a badge from the FBI and all the other agencies and the support personnel, and the Justice Department says it has what it calls tonight a tremendous number of leads as this worldwide investigation now moves ahead at a surprisingly brisk pace, partly because of solid detective work, partly because of lucky breaks. Federal agents respond immediately. More than 4,000 FBI special agents and 3,000 support staff already on the case, sweeping the nation for evidence from fragments at the scene of the attacks to any documentary proof of what the suspected terrorists were up to between three and six per plane, authorities now say. The United States Attorney's Office's terrorism units and the FBI's Joint Terrorism Task Forces are obtaining the passenger manifests rental car receipts, telephone logs, videotape from parking garages, and pay telephone uh, videotape records at all scenes for review and appropriate follow-up interviews. Scrutiny of those passenger lists leads the FBI to this flight school in Florida, where officials say they believe at least two of the terrorists received pilot training during the past year. A man who worked at the flight school says he allowed both of them, who described themselves as Germans, to briefly live with him and his wife. While they were here, um, I know that they had used this address uh, initially, uh, the, and I know that because I would get insurance renewals uh, for them, uh, addressed to them uh, at this address for, uh, for that call. In Boston, agents swarm area hotels where registration records match suspicious names from passenger lists of the hijacked planes, detaining at least three people for further questioning, holding them now on immigration charges. And in a hugely helpful break, the FBI impounds a car found at the airport after a witness says it was driven by two Arabic men. In it, authorities say they discover airplane technical documents. Federal agents also stop an Amtrak train in Rhode Island today, part of a frantic nationwide effort, the FBI says, to make certain no other conspirators remain at large where they could mount further attacks. Our first effort is to identify any associates in the United States who might be related to the hijackers and to remove those associates, investigate and uh, arrest, given the evidence, those individuals and to remove any threat to the air system in the future. 
Among other searches today, agents descend upon this mailbox rental office in New Jersey, where some of the suspected terrorists may have received their mail. Now, Forrest, the latest tonight. Let's go back and look at some of the events of today. After detaining those three people at the hotel in Boston, uh, federal officials have now let them go and decided they will no longer detain them. A possible case of mistaken identity, they say, but no reason to hold them. As for the Amtrak train, very dramatically stopped. Uh, the possibility that some conspirators could have been trying to flee the Boston area. The uh, federal officials say tonight they, after checking, decided they had nothing to do with the stopping of that train, that it was all done by local police, not at the request of the FBI, and probably not connected with this investigation, although it certainly was very dramatic today. Now, a couple of other notes here. It, is, uh, it seems to us now that the FBI, from the information we have, is probably conducting, either has conducted or is preparing to conduct, something less than a dozen searches in five states. We know of some of them in Maine. We know of some of them in the Boston area. We know of some of them in Florida. Uh, but they've also done searches in New Jersey and Pennsylvania. And there may be other states involved tomorrow. Uh, a couple of other things. It appears now that some of the hijackers got their pilot training, or at least their small craft, their beginning pilot training, at that Venice flight school in Florida. But officials say tonight that some of the other hijackers may have received other training as well at another flight school outside Florida. So they're looking into that as well as this investigation continues, churning up leads, giving the FBI and the other federal agencies plenty of investigative avenues tonight, Forrest. Well, Pete, obviously, just, just looking at the, this uh, misadventure on its face, the extent and range of this conspiracy is, is extraordinary. But to be able to establish that, moving from the small fish to the large fish during an investigation is going to be awfully tough. Well, it is, and you know, we've seen it time and time again. We saw it just uh, most recently in the investigation of the mon a millennial terrorist plot when the Customs Service agent stopped that car with explosives coming into the border from Canada in the northwestern part of the U.S. Uh, authorities were able to identify, arrest, indict, and convict some of the people involved in that conspiracy, but were never able to get the kingpins. And of course, that's going to be the issue here. If it goes all the way to bin Laden, that will likely be out of the, outside the hands of the FBI. After all, bin Laden has already been indicted and is already wanted on the charges that he was the mastermind of the two African embassy bombings. So that would probably be outside, that would not be a law enforcement matter, that would probably be a military matter for us. Well, certainly the FBI and the intelligence community is going to be hearing this mantra that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And I heard you talking to Chris Matthews earlier, and he was saying, so how come we couldn't know this earlier? It is a fair question to ask, why couldn't the community have targeted these kinds of people who have these connections if they're able to move this quickly afterwards? Well, uh, let's look at those two questions. The, uh, I think it is a fair question. Why are they moving so quickly afterwards, though? It's, it's, it's a matter of you know which planes went down. So you have four planes, four passenger lists now to look at. Now, granted, the FBI says that after checking it, it appears that some of those suspected terrorists were on lists of suspected terrorist organizations. So it's a fair question to say, well, why wasn't some kind of red flag raised when they tried to get on those airplanes? Um, you know, I know for a fact that the federal government can stop people from entering the United States if they're on what's called the State Department's terror watch list. What I don't know yet, and I'm trying to find out is, is there any federal law that gives the FAA the power to deny boarding to someone who is suspected of being a terrorist? In other words, somebody has some information about them, some informant said something about them, there's no evidence they're a terrorist, but they're on a list. Uh, could the FAA legally prohibit that person from boarding an airplane? Uh, could they do it before? Will the law possibly change on that? That's, that's the other side of this. So we know why they were able to get so quickly at them now. And it's partly just not just that they were on these suspected terror lists, but then going back and looking at other things and seeing how they line up, uh, seeing who's, what you know, movements, people coming across from Canada, staying at certain hotels. Uh, one of the things that led them to the uh, hotel in Boston, they say today, is that several people bought a ticket off the same credit card, which was suspicious because it's not the usual kind of behavior. So those are the sorts of leads that you follow that lead quickly to these names. I'm not sure that answers your question, though, about 
why red flags didn't go up when some of these, at least one or two of these suspected terrorists tried to board the planes in the first place. I'm not sure there is an obvious answer right now. That question will be answered a lot or asked a lot in, in the coming days. Pete Williams, thanks so much for talking to us, Pete. Yes, sir, you bet. Those are the questions you're going to hear. Could we have known more? Should we be doing more in the future? Is there something that uh, could prevent these kinds of acts in our intelligence community, in the FBI and its counterterrorism operations? And, and this number right here will tell you why this is so terribly important. Rudy Giuliani has now asked federal officials for 6,000 body bags, and that is probably just the beginning. That is an indication of just how bad uh, this attack actually was. Andrea Mitchell has been looking at uh, the questions about terrorism, what are hanging in the air right now, and sort through it for us, if you would, Andrea. What, what do you see hanging in the air? Well, first, let me bring up the very questions that you were discussing with Pete Williams. Good questions, questions that I had asked earlier today of two experts, Brent Scowcroft, who was the National Security Advisor for George Bush's father, and also Sam Nunn, who was the Armed Services Chairman and has chaired or co-chaired many intelligence committee uh, conference committees since leaving the Senate and asked both of them what more could be done and both had the same response that we're going to have to sacrifice some of our individual liberties if we're going to really go after these terror groups and that once people are in the United States if they have not broken any any laws they can't really be pursued or watched that closely their internet privacy for instance is inviolate so those are the kind of sacrifices that the US has to really debate now and decide whether or not they want to give up those kinds of freedoms. Really critical constitutional questions that we still may be facing if uh, we are really going to come to grips with this problem. But Forrest, you, you fundamentally raised the question of why we didn't know. And in pursuing that question, uh, you have to know that tonight the intelligence community is re-examining itself, trying to discover why we didn't know earlier before the assault on America. How could the terrorists operate right under our noses? And why didn't billions of dollars spent on intelligence give us an early warning? As they hunt for the culprits, Bush administration officials are also asking tonight, was this a colossal collapse of intelligence? So we did not get the, uh, the queuing we needed. We did not get the intelligence information needed to predict that this was about to happen or be aware of, uh, of this kind of event coming our way. Tonight at headquarters of the top secret National Security Agency, analysts review hundreds of millions of pieces of information intercepted before yesterday's attacks, searching for an overlooked warning, a pattern of activity. It isn't just simply uh, information that predicts operations. It's information that t t talks about meetings among suspicious people, traveling uh, uh, activities, movement to finance. The problem, experts say, too much information, too little smart analysis. We're getting to the point where our ability to collect information far exceeds our ability to analyze it. Uh, we need some help. And terrorists speak in codes on the internet, use chat rooms, instant messaging, emails, and rarely, if ever, an explicit threat. You just don't pick up a phone call saying we're going to blow up the World Trade Center tomorrow. That's not how it works in reality. It's far more complicated, and, and that's the difficulty. It is not cheap. Before the attack, the counterterrorism budget request for next year, $13 billion, more than double what it was six years ago. And today, the president talks about spending billions more. I am sending to Congress a request for emergency funding authority so that we are prepared to spend whatever it takes. And tonight at Langley, CIA Director George Tenet goes on closed-circuit television to rally thousands of demoralized troops, telling the nation's spies, quote, though we did not stop the latest terrible assaults, you, the men and women of CIA, have done much to combat terrorism in the past. Put some spirit in your steps, square your shoulders, focus your eyes, we have a job to do. And say experts, that job is getting a lot more complicated and more dangerous. There are groups out there that really are no longer just trying to get publicity and make a political point. They're trying to kill massive numbers of people. So tonight, while re-examining what went wrong, the more alarming possibility is that our nation's spies will never truly be able to prevent this kind of horror. Uh, Andrew, I want to pick up on something you said right at the beginning of your report that uh, both Sam Nunn and ben Brent Scowcroft said that we will have to sacrifice some of our freedoms if we are to have the kind of security that we're talking about. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking of an FBI program that's been very controversial for snooping on the, on the Internet called Carnivore. Right. Uh, is that the sort of thing that they're talking about? Exactly. 
they say that we have to be willing to sacrifice our internet, excuse me, bad, bad cold, suffering through this, um, our internet privacy if we're going to really go after these people. If they have a suspicious person, even if they've not broken a law, they want to be able to go and look at what their communications are. And I, I don't know too many people who are going to be willing to give that up, but now we're facing a new reality. This is the new America that uh, was born on September 11th. And the point, of course, is if, if these people have to sacrifice their rights, then really that means that all people in the United States sacrifice that right. Well, in talking to General Skokoff, for instance, he said that the FBI can be trusted to only go after those who are truly suspicious. Well, one person's suspicious character is another person's hero. I mean, we've got some really tough choices to face here. Uh, General Skokoff knows that, so does Sam Nunn. But these are the kind of questions that I think we have to be debating, not just getting into the blame game over what went wrong. I have to tell you, I know the men and women at CIA, and you won't find a more dedicated group of people. They are really suffering tonight and mourning the fact that they were not able to prevent this. But it was not for lack of trying. You're right. Some very hard choices ahead of us. Andrea Mitchell, thanks so much, Andrea. Thank you. Well, let's go to a fellow who uh, really has been in the hot seat and could answer some of these questions for us. His name is Larry Johnson, and he is the former deputy director of the State Department Office of Counterterrorism. So all the questions that we have been raising, Larry, seem to come right to your doorstep. And, and let's start with the hard one. Okay. How in the world could this have happened? How could such an, a well-organized, so thoroughly deep plot go completely undetected? Well, let's not exaggerate how sophisticated and difficult it is to do this. Number one, if you, let's assume you had a maximum of six people per aircraft to hijack it. Four aircraft, 24 people. You can go on the internet you can make reservations for those people and you can pay for the tickets over the internet in four hours. You've had, it's clear that some of these people were in the country for a year. So that there is advanced planning to that standpoint. In terms of flying the airplane, they, they didn't have to go through the complicated task of takeoff and landing. They had to just learn how to maintain airspeed and then turn the yoke and to steer the craft. So I'm not trying to say that it was simple, but it was not like building a rocket ship. So it is someone who wants to kill Americans, someone who is willing to die in that process, yes, that makes it very difficult to detect. What made the, the intelligence failure on this, if, you, if we want to call it that, and I, and I agree with Andrea, we don't want to blame the men and women of CIA, but the CIA as it exists right now is an anachronism. It is designed, organized, structured, to deal with a Cold War threat that does not exist. Because we're not talking about having to penetrate terrorist groups in 150 countries. The groups and individuals that are involved in killing Americans over the last 20 years number less than five. And the two particular individuals, Osama bin Laden and the former Hezbollah security chief, Imad Mugnia, they account between them for 72% of all Americans killed. Well, this is, this, look, this is the point. Here is Osama bin Laden, who, who, whom the United States seems to believe at a 99 percentile level of assuredness is the guy who's behind this. These right. people, they believe, were directly connected to him. This is not just the CIA. This is the NSA. This is the FBI. This is all of our organizations who are tasked with watching these folks. Well, now, presumably, these are exactly the people they should have had their eyes on. But they're limited. And, and here's what I mean by the anachronism. You can, to, to penetrate these organizations, they're not at a diplomatic cocktail party where we traditionally would recruit spies from other countries. They are religious fanatics. They represent an extremist group within Islam. This is not mainstream Islam. You're not going to run into them at the normal mosque. So therefore, to penetrate it, you have to have somebody that speaks the language, that you're willing to insert, and that they may be asked to carry out a terrorist, a a terrorist act. To this point, we have been unwilling to put ourselves figuratively and literally into the sewers with these people. If you're going to kill the rats in the rat nest, which is in the sewer, you've got to get in the sewer. But, and again, as Andrea was pointing out, we are in this dilemma. We want to stay clean. We want to stay above the fray. We want to get rid of the rats. 
but we don't want to go to where they exist. Well, let, let me give you just one clear, hard example. Maybe they don't want to get in the sewer with the rats. Maybe we'd like them just to watch the rats for openers. Now, we know that some of these suspects' names were on watch lists, and if they had been coming across the border, their names would have been tagged. And yet well, they were able to get on the airplanes, and their names were not tagged. They got a visa. Someone somewhere gave them a visa, and there needs to be a good, hard look at that. Uh, we have seen in the past that other individuals, going back to Ramzi Youssef with the World Trade Center, some of those folks got into the country. The blind sheikh, Sheikh Old uh, uh, Rahman, who was implicated in one of the plots to attack a tunnel in New York City. So, uh, you know, there is clearly a breakdown in the system on that front. Uh, it is it, it should be more difficult to get into this country. And part of the problem we have is not that we don't have the capabilities. We have such a proliferation of agencies that there literally is no one in charge. People stumble over themselves, and when you have so many chiefs, there are lots of things that fall through the cracks. Larry Johnson is former deputy director of uh, State Department Office of Counterterrorism. And if I, if I hear what you're saying, you say that there are some problems, and we really do have to get at digging through those. Yeah, the, the, we have, this provides us an opportunity to refocus our national security effort, which has not, which has been in place really since 1948, and it's time for a fundamental reorganization. Larry Johnson, thanks so much. Thank you, Forrest. From uh, from Larry, we go to Brad and Deborah Burlingame. Now, they had a brother, and his brother was a pilot of Air uh, American Airlines Flight 77. It left from Dallas uh, Dulles Airport outside Washington D.C. It was on its way to Los Angeles. Really, a routine flight, kind of a milk run. They call these kinds of things, but it turned. Uh, turned out not to be so good at all. It wound up crashing into the Pentagon. They are joining us right now. First of all, uh, just a word about your brother. I imagine he was a, he was a terrific pilot. He was a terrific pilot. Uh, Chick was a graduate of the United States Naval Academy. He flew fighter planes for the U.S. Navy. He was a decorated officer and retired uh, captain in the United States Naval Reserve. And in fact, the irony of him crashing into the Pentagon is that he worked there for many, many years in the United States Naval Reserve. Now, this is, this is the question that I think a lot of people are asking, and obviously there's no, no easy answer. When you describe your brother, here you've got a man who is heroic, who has served his country, and who we all know, under no circumstances, if it meant sacrificing his own life, would ever consider crashing his plane into the Pentagon. So something must have happened with these knife-wielding guys that took out both pilots, and that's, that's a tough one to figure out. Okay. Well, it is a tough one to figure out, and uh, it, it is uh, impossible for any of us to speculate what actually happened on that aircraft, um, and we might never actually know, but I can assure you uh, that uh, my brother did everything in his power uh, to save his passengers, his fellow crew members, um, and his aircraft, and he would in, at no time have compromised uh, their safety. If that airplane came down, uh, it's because um, he was facing forces that were beyond um, any human being. Um, and I assure you, he was well trained. He had unassailable judgment, uh, was a very courageous guy. He was the kind of guy that you would really want to have around in a crisis. Well, we, uh, we, we thank you for that assurance, but I don't think anybody has ever raised even a single question about either his courage or his abilities. We do have questions about the system that could allow this to happen with four airplanes, and I'll, I'll bet you have some of those same questions. We do have questions, but um, we feel that uh, this is an ongoing crisis. There are people still in peril right now in New York City, and um, uh, we trust that the professionals whose job it is to look um, into that question are doing it and giving it their all the same way our brother uh, approached his job with professionalism and uh, a great deal of competence and we are, we're trusting to do that but right now we're still focused on the the victims uh, their families and um, the, the incredible loss um, that's what we're that's what we're focused on right now given all that you're going through right now that's awfully generous to be able to look uh, toward what other people are are suffering how did you hear about this when did you first get word um, the American Airlines family is very, very tight, and uh, Chick's colleagues were quickly at my uh, sister-in-law's side, Sherry, his widow, and um, I received a phone call from one of his ta colleagues, Tom, and uh, uh, two of his other dear friends were there very quickly, Mike and Bart, and I know they're there with her now. Uh, we knew very shortly after the crash that uh, 
chick was captaining that airplane. They were informed by the chief pilot. Um, and the chief pilot, um, who knew my brother uh, very well, um, made sure that his dear friends and colleagues in, in, um, at American Airlines were with Sherry um, when she got the word. And they informed us. Had he ever raised any, any concerns about, uh, about piloting aircraft like this or any questions about how to deal with this, this kind of circumstance ever? No. Uh, you know, whenever there was any kind of aircraft uh, tragedy, I would talk to my brother about that. And uh, uh, he always reminded us how uh, rare those tragedies were and the statistics that we've all heard many, many times about how safe air travel is. And it still is very, very safe. Uh, and because he was such a by-the-book and competent guy, I don't think anybody in our family ever questioned uh, Chick's uh, ability to, to have no problems when it came to flying a plane and, and dealing with these circumstances. And I, I just have to say that uh, when it comes to hijackings, this, this, this hijacking was very, very different. It's the first time that, uh, other than the hijacking that what, which a crash occurred and they ran out of fuel, it's the first time a crash like this has occurred. All other hijackings have been brought down uh, in some other city. So this is, this is very, very unusual. The pilot of American Airlines Flight 77 was uh, Charles Burlingame. And of course, you have our deepest sympathies. And uh, the nation mourns with you. And we thank you for talking with us. Thank you. Thank you. The, the flight system is not uh, flying right now. Let's check in with Robert Hager, see what's happening. The delay will also give officials more time to prepare for a major crackdown on security. Sweeping searches of airports and empty planes using explosive sniffing dogs. Clearing garages too close to terminal buildings where there'll be no parking from now on. Tougher searches of passengers and carry-on bags. No more curbside baggage check-in. Even plastic or metal knives banned from airport stores or concessions. And a temporary hold on carrying mail in passenger planes. The post office adding more trucks in the meantime. The Air Travelers Association's David Stempler. The security lines at the security belts are going to be much, much longer, going to take much more time. There's going to be much more random checking for explosives, and so it's going to be a much longer process. A few flights are allowed today to get some passengers from cities where they were diverted on to their original destinations. But thousands more remain stranded. Does anybody want to be part of a carpool going to San Francisco? Right now, it's, it's up near what I'm going to do. Whether I'm going to try to stay here and get a flight tomorrow, or maybe take Greyhound, I'm not sure what my plans are right now. Hundreds of Americans returning from abroad left in Canadian cities where they were diverted. In Nova Scotia, many housed overnight in a gymnasium. Meantime, do other security precautions need fixing? For instance, how could weapons like knives get through passenger screening? Intelligence consultant Bruce McIndoe. It's really very difficult, and with modern technology of plastics and ceramics that can avoid metal detection, it's a very steep challenge to try to control those kinds of things getting on planes. But it doesn't help that until today, some knives were allowed on planes. From now on, they'll all be banned. One warning from officials, the hush-hush program that puts armed sky marshals, shown here in a drill, puts them on a few international flights now as a deterrent to terrorism, will now be extended to a few domestic flights as well. That's Robert Hager reporting. And of course, for those people who believe that this is a dividing line between what America was and what America will be, this is an indication of it. When you fly now, you can expect that there will be a lot more delays. It will take a lot longer, but that is so that you will be safer as you move through the skies. That is what we all desperately hope for. We will be back with further coverage. Do stay with us. This is MSNBC. And welcome back. Uh, I'm Forrest Sawyer. This is MSNBC. We're, of course, following the attack on America. And here is the latest of that we are following. President Bush, as you know by now, has declared that the attacks are acts of war in their turn. NATO has said these attacks, if they come from outside the United States, if they originate from there, the attack against the U.S. would be a considered an attack against all. This is the first time that this charter has ever been invoked, Article Number 5. Thousands are likely dead. We knew that. We still don't know how many. Some people are saying it may be as many as 20,000. Uh, 6,000 body bags have been requested by the mayor 
of New York, and a candlelight vigil is being conducted at the White House. 1,500, 2,000 people thereabouts in front of the White House in the D.C. area, impromptu at the Capitol building, actually. Patriotic demonstration there. They sang patriotic songs. They recited the Pledge of Allegiance. Uniformed Secret Service officers watched in the background as these people came, feeling that there would be at least something that they could do. And now let's go to this report from Rahim Ellis. At ground zero today, firefighters on the front line still spraying the smoldering wreckage more than a day after the explosion. Working all through the night, hundreds of rescue teams picking through the rubble, but it's tough, slow work. There are literally mountains of debris here. The soot alone is two feet deep. The air is filled with choking dust. Power saws cutting through steel, blow torches slicing mangled girders. Though the chances of getting anyone out alive are now fading, there is still determination. I've seen a couple of police officers, a couple of firefighters, a couple of civilians. There's a lot of people being pulled down. Rescue teams from across New England and the mid-Atlantic states are working in 12-hour shifts. But most don't want to quit, even when their shift is done. They don't want to give up. We work here, the other rescuers work there, and we all work as a team, so everybody's working as hard as we can. And yeah, these guys would work till they drop to get people out. The emergency workers behind me are waiting their turn to go into the rubble. It is hard to imagine that what is on the other side of these workers is what is left of the World Trade Towers. You can see a portion of the archway that literally connected the two towers. It is crumbled now and on the ground. And just a few blocks, two to three blocks away, what was the top of this 110-story tower is now collapsed, and it looks like a structure that's arching out of the ground. It's a mess. It's like your worst nightmare. You could never even believe what it's what it's like in it. Did you want to come? Oh, of course, everybody does. We're going to need everybody because it's going to take a long time. Even after more than a day at the heart of an unthinkable disaster, all the firefighters like Robert Fithian want to do is keep working to make certain no one is left behind. Rahima Ellis, NBC News in Lower Manhattan. Always a shock when you see those pictures of what's going on down there in South Manhattan. Let us turn now to Ron Klemensik who uh, ha was actually involved, his firm was involved in putting up the World Trade Center towers, a structural engineer for the, uh, for the building. And, and Mr. Klemensik, help me understand, when, when the planes struck the, the Trade Center towers, what was it that caused them to be so um, taken aside that they've just collapsed on themselves as though they had had, you know, the people who, who, who intended to do it exactly that way? Yeah, the initial attack and the initial impact of the airplane uh, definitely damaged a number of the exterior supporting columns and we sus suspect probably impacted a number of the interior columns as well. Uh, fortunately, due to the uh, original impact, the plane uh, didn't actually take the towers down and that's due to the high degree of redundancy that was uh, inherent in the structural design of those buildings. Uh, it was really from the inherent or the ensuing fire that occurred after the initial impact, the initial impact weakened the structure and then the fire and the heat from the fire actually weakened the steel further and after an hour or an hour and a half of intense heat uh, reaching temperatures probably in excess of 1600 degrees, the steel softened enough such that the weight of the building above the impacted floors simply couldn't be supported anymore and what we saw in the collapse videos that, that I've seen many times is, is what we refer to as a pancaking of the building, one floor progressively collapsing on top of another until what you have on the ground essentially is a large stack of cards. Now the fact that it pancaked instead of tipping over and falling on its side, as some of us might have expected, obviously saved lives. Is that what you would expect it to do, just fall like that? Uh, well, the, the fact that it didn't tip on its side is really related to, again, this redundancy in the structural system. Uh, redundancy in, in uh, a more lay description is the fact that there are uh, building elements, columns and beams, and if you uh, eliminate one or more of those elements, that the structure that remains still has a capacity to carry its own weight. And that was, was the case with the World Trade Center towers. Uh, when several of those columns, many of them in fact, were uh, damaged or demolished by the initial impact, the tower didn't tip. 
Uh, and it was really only again from this fire that ensued later that we suspect is why uh, the columns actually collapsed an hour and a half later. Later, seven World Trade Center went down. Now the uh, One Liberty Plaza is at risk and appears to have already had, had tremendous cracks in it. Of course, the Millennium Building is at risk as well. Right. Why would the neighboring buildings run the same kinds of problems? The, the Tower 7 building, I'm familiar with the, the adjacent buildings, our firm wasn't involved in, so I'm not as familiar with the designs of those buildings. But what I can suspect from what we saw with Tower 7 was there was a great deal of what we'll call collateral damage. As the towers collapsed, the, the bits and pieces of those towers fell on the adjacent buildings, uh, damaging those buildings as they came down. Uh, in addition, uh, a large number of fires ignited throughout various buildings. Tower 7, I know, had a large fire inside of it. And what we saw then in Tower 7 is several hours later, again, due in part from the damage uh, from the adjacent towers collapsing and then in part from the fire that was in the building, uh, Tower 7 collapsed. The other buildings that are on adjacent uh, sides of the towers, I can only uh, suspect that similar kinds of things are happening with those buildings, but like I said, I'm not as familiar or not familiar at all, in fact, with the designs of those buildings. You, you've seen pictures of people who are sorting through the rubble and who are pushing up into those buildings. How dangerous is that work in your estimation? Uh, it can be quite dangerous, again, depending on the amount of damage those buildings sustained and the amount of, of instability that may be in those buildings. It, it can be quite a dangerous situation. Uh, not unlike what we saw in 1993 with the uh, prior attack on the World Trade Center towers, there were a number of columns uh, exposed significantly by that bomb blast and those columns needed to be braced rather rapidly uh, in order to create a stable situation. So I can only imagine if there is a, a critical danger that it's, it's related to damage created in these adjacent buildings where there's unstable conditions. Ron Clementic is president of Skilling Ward, Magnuson, Berkshire and their firm uh, actually uh, helped, helped put up the World Trade Center Towers. You're very good to talk to us, sir, and uh, I'm sorry that your buildings aren't there. Oh, thank you. Thank you for talking to us. Let's go to Chris Matthews, see what's on his mind. Chris, you've been talking about this. What is the thing that it rises to the top as you think about this tonight? Well, I think the Federal Aviation Administration has got some answers. Uh, we have some questions that need to be answered. The permission of people to take knives on the planes, I think, struck a lot of people as a big surprise. I think a lot of people are wondering how planes could have gone so off course as all four of these planes did, and not have that immediately picked up by someone in traffic control. Why was a plane able to go that was supposedly on course to L.A. end up in New York, or a plane that ended up uh, going back from Dulles Airport back to the Pentagon the wrong direction? I think people must, we always assumed that to be so sort of a Bardol shield, something that would go up and stop planes from doing that, stopping a plane from going anywhere near the New York skyline. I think that's a shocker. I also think that we're all so careful about tolerance and diversity that we're missing a, a key point here. To recognize that terrorism against this country comes from the Arab world is, is normal and reasonable. It's not to assume that all Arab Americans or Arab visitors to this country or student visa people or whatever are dangerous. It's simply to assume that when we go looking for Arab terrorists, start with the Arabs. Look at them. There's nothing illiberal about that. Why we would allow people on a watch list to take training in airline training in this country without having their names pop up on some list, to have people get on airplanes with impunity, leaving their cars behind with all their literature behind about how they're going to fly a plane, and all that going on with no one checking because of some fear that you might be illiberal about this. We're not saying Arab Americans or Arabs are bad people. We're saying that the terrorists are Arab, and we should go looking for them in that regard. And I wonder why it's so complicated. And what bugs me as an American is the FBI was able to identify these people within a few hours right after these crashes. They know which people in the manifest for the trouble by simply identifying their names. That's all they needed to go by, the unique identification between a name and a person. Why didn't they put that connection together before this horror? I don't know whether it would have stopped it, but I think it's lame brain not to try. And here's my question. If the exact same perpetration goes on two weeks from now or three days from now, people get on planes using ID cards, whatever they get them from, setting, up, setting off to blow up other planes, to take over planes with little knives or little toothpicks or whatever, are we going to catch them this time? Or are well, we not? I have a feeling that our system isn't any better now than it was two days ago. 
once we get back in the air again. It seems to me that there's there's a distinction that ought to be made here. It, it does raise a serious question why people who were on the watch list were not tagged as they went on to the, to the airplanes. There's obviously uh, a disconnect between the FBI watch list that it, it tickets people at the border and people who are able to get on domestic flights. That's a problem. However, I am sure that uh, some of our brothers in the Arab American community would would raise their eyebrows when they hear you say we should focus first on Arabs. If you're looking for Arab terrorists, look first at Arabs. Well, perhaps you should look first at those people who have reason to be connected rather than to focus on an entire ethnic group. No, you don't focus on the entire, uh, you try to find those among them who are the trouble. Ben Laden has declared war on the United States. He comes from a certain part of the world. All his followers come from that part of the world. They are all ethnically connected to him. They are his followers. They are identifiable. You don't go looking in Norway for people from Ben Laden's crowd. You're wasting a lot of time. We don't have a lot of time or a lot of money to find the bad guys. You go looking for them where they are. I don't think that's unreasonable or illiberal to assume that. We are not profiling people because of who they are. We're profiling people because of who the terrorists are, and we're trying to find them. We were warned that this was going to happen, and we didn't catch it in time, and that's our fault. We can't put up a big sign and say, oh, the reason we didn't stop this is because we're liberals. It's not our fault. I think it is. Would you, by that same reasoning, say that if crime occurs among one particular ethnic group, much more... No, it's not more... crime. It's terrorism aimed at the United States. It's not just people that go around mugging people or raping people or murdering people. It's people that are coming after the United States. So it's the nature of the crime A particular political faction, you... a particular political ethnic faction with religious zealotry behind it is coming after the United States. If, if we don't want to see them coming, it's because we don't want to see them coming. We can see them coming, and we missed them this time. And I'll tell you, I'm amazed by that watch list story tonight that we discovered we're talking to Pete Williams and the other guests tonight on our program tonight when we were on how this man was able to get flight training in this country this man was able to get on airplanes and only when this accident this horror occurred did somebody say oh yeah we know that guy he was involved in terrorism in, in Israel oh well wait a minute why do we only find out afterwards that this guy was on the list when all they had to do was check the name well certainly the question has been raised by Andrea Mitchell by Pete Mitchell by myself tonight Larry Johnson was talking about it there is this uh, continuum between uh, civil liberties and security and it sounds as though uh, you're falling on the side of security when it comes to terrorism and well yes no. you are Chris yes no, you I'm are saying Wait, that now, in the case now, where Chris, you have let, a me, let me say a word or just possibly two words it seems to me when you're saying let's focus on a particular ethnic group when it comes no. to terrorism you are you're talking about people who come from a particular geography these people are worried they're from the Mideast. It's not their ethnicity, it's their geography. They're identified, they come from that part of the world. They're identified with his group. It seems to me we may, should make some effort to find out who is in the bin Laden group. Why don't we try to do that? So and then we might find out where they are in the world. So you're saying those groups who are actually, who actually are from another country, who might yes. be here from Afghanistan, not whether they are of Arabic uh, descent. I don't mean Arab Americans. I mean people who have come in here on student visas or people that have come in here for a couple of months. It seems to me we want to be watching them. You, Why not? Why wouldn't we watch them? You would monitor all of them? They got trouble in their area. They have got, it's coming from there. The, you heard the earlier guest tonight said that all 72% of the terrorism practiced against the United States has come from two groups, bin Laden being one of them. Why aren't we watching everybody in those groups? Why aren't we putting all our forces in that, that group of people? Maybe some of them do the paperwork. Maybe some of them sing songs to keep the group's morale up. But they're all working together, and it seems like we ought to be watching them. It sure. seems like... We're not making any effort to do that. I don't think anybody questions whether, whether if, you, if you already know that somebody has connections to a terrorist group, whether you should keep an eye on them. However, that is very different than saying that everybody who comes from one area of the world ought to be monitored when they come to the United States. I'm, a massive task, even if you wanted to do it. Right. I think you have to narrow it down. The people who are looking for this thing, uh, looking for these kinds of people, have a lot more information than I do. But it seems to me that it isn't an impossible task. Here's what I'm saying. If you spend a limited amount of money, say $15 billion in intelligence money, and you divided that money evenly in looking at every commercial passenger in the United States, well, you won't have a nickel per passenger if you're lucky. You've got to put the money where you think the problem is. Isn't that common sense? Sure. Why do you want to put anybody, everybody you know, under surveillance that has no reason to be under surveillance? But a guy who was on the, was on the watch list, I put him on the list. <laughs> I mean, I think this is a thumb that we have to deal with here. I think it's a matter of triage is what we got to deal with here. I'm just betting, Chris, you'll be talking about this on your program for days to come, won't you? Yes. Chris Matthews, awfully good to talk to you again, Thank Chris. Thank you. Thanks so much. Frank Lutz is uh, a pollster. We often use him here, and he has been out talking to Americans about how they feel about these kinds of things. Frank, I want to I begin with a, with a, 
something that I read from yours in the, in the Washington Times to sort of set the stage for how you've asked this poll. This is what Frank wrote. Imagine for a minute that a popular restaurant in Manhattan's Times Square was blown to bits by a terrorist's bomb. Would the American public demand from the Bush administration an immediate and aggressive effort to prevent similar attacks from occurring in the future? Or would Americans prefer a wringing of hands so as not to perpetuate a cycle of violence or inflame an already volatile and dangerous enemy? Now, Frank, just, just to me, on its face, it seems like the former is what most Americans would say. Is that right? It is what most Americans say. I know that there's an NBC poll out tonight that does say that. Uh, what was coincidental about what you read was that it appeared in yesterday's newspaper uh, only a matter of minutes before uh, the tragedy took place. And one of the things that we found, and uh, we've got some numbers, and I believe, Forrest, you have some numbers, is that there was a tremendous gender gap between men and women and how they feel about this. A couple of points. Number one, men believe that we are less likely to be victims of terrorist attacks than women are, and yet men are actually much more likely than women to be willing to accept the loss of life among innocent people if it means getting the terrorists first. Second point, and if we can pull these uh, couple of slides up there, we ask the question, how much do you worry about terrorist attacks against Americans? And this poll was taken about 10 days before uh, this incident took place. Only 19% of Americans said that they were either every day or frequently worried about terrorist attacks, and half of Americans never even paid attention to them. Yeah, now, let, me let me tell you the ones that we've got here, Frank. So we've got these on, on screens for you so that you can look at them. Uh, Everybody's been saying Pearl Harbor infamy was one of the, one of the newspaper headlines referring to uh, President Roosevelt's speech. How do you compare this to Pearl Harbor? 66%, look at this, 66% say it's more serious than Pearl Harbor, which got the United States into World War II. 25% say equally serious, 5% say not as serious. L let me just focus on this one. That is astounding to me. Because after all, Pearl Harbor led to the conflagration and our involvement in the conflagration of World War II. How could it be more serious than that? A couple reasons. Number one, Hawaii was not a part of America at that point. So that was not, well, it was a part of America, but it wasn't a state. And the second point is that, let's face it, when you think of the American economy, the World Trade Center is dead center of that economy. And the Pentagon is at the center of the American governmental, the American defense system. My building is only a matter of, of feet away from the Pentagon. The concept of being able to look out of my window and watch the Pentagon on fire was incomprehensible for me, and it was incomprehensible for most Americans. Now, they're not saying that, they're not minimizing what happened at Pearl Harbor. What they are saying is that the loss of life here was tremendous, and that this is one of those days, like the assassination of John F. Kennedy, that people will not forget. And, and I, I think I hear you say that the symbolic force of this is greater. You have to remember the symbolic force, because all of this was brought to us. Pearl Harbor, we heard on the radio. The fact is that when the World Trade Center collapsed, millions of Americans and billions of people worldwide watched it collapse with their own eyes. They watched the Pentagon burning. And this is something that Americans aren't used to. This was a war right on our shores that affected our people. And we saw it exactly as it was happening. Let's go to another question. How do you feel about the way President Bush is handling the crisis? 80% approve of it. 8% disapprove. 12% are not sure. Now, actually, as I remember, Frank, when we have crises like this, uh, people, in, anyway, tend to rally around the president, do they not? They do. If you remember back in 1991 when we declared war against Iraq, uh, President George Herbert Walker Bush had an 89 or 91 percent approval rating. So this number is not surprising. I will tell you this. It has put the issues of budgets and Social Security and the partisan differences, they're completely off the table. No one's talking about that now. People are making phone calls, they're trying to get through on cell phones, on email, to see who is still alive, if they've lost friends, neighbors, relatives. And the public has come together as one to demand some sort of solution to this, to demand that there be some accountability that these people not have died in vain. Should the U.S. take military action? This is a question that Frank asked in his poll. Here's an astounding number. 83% say yes, take military action. 8% say no. 9% say not sure. Now, I've covered an occasional 
uh, engagement or two. And, and I can tell you that throwing cruise missiles at a problem tends not to really solve it. So if the United States actually gets involved, this is likely going to mean that American blood is going to be shed. Well, it's a similar question to what we asked before this incident took place for the American Middle East Information Network. And in our survey, we found, and this was just asked of what should Israel do if they were in this exact situation. Three out of four Americans said that Israel was, was justified in using violence to eliminate those who would hurt their people. That is, that it was acceptable, and I'm going to use a very ugly word, Forrest, it was acceptable to assassinate those who would kill your people so that your people could stay alive. And now with Americans facing the same situation that Israel's faced, not just in the last weeks or months, but for the last 50 years of that nation, you now see Americans believing that it is justified for us to go out and find those people who did this. It doesn't matter whether you're Republican or Democrat, young or old, East Coast, West Coast. None of those traditional differences exist. The country has said together, united, we've got to go out and send a message and punish those people that have hurt us so tragically over the last 24 hours. Frank, I Nora Donnell is at the White House. I'd like to pull her into this conversation. Nora, if, if you, are you with us, Nora? I am, Forrest. There you go. You've been listening to this conversation, I expect. W would it be reasonable to assume that the White House not only is paying attention to this, but possibly has done its own polling? Not the White House, perhaps. Um, I think at this point that they are in a crisis mode while they are not trying to project that image. But clearly they are concerned foremost about the lives of the Americans that have been lost, about the action that the U.S. military uh, should take, that what the Bush administration and the Congress should do in terms of appropriating the right amount of money. But it is fair to say that at the same time they are trying to project an image of strength and concerned about this. And I'm sure that once the White House does see these numbers, which of course just have come out tonight on NBC and will be digesting them, that they'll be pleased by these numbers because overwhelmingly uh, the public supports the president and overwhelmingly the public supports some type of response to this action which the president has said uh, that they plan to do saying today in effect that uh, we are at war um, other just note Forrest is that um, it's interesting too there was a large gathering outside here of the White House tonight um, more than a thousand people gathered for about an hour with uh, in a candlelight vigil singing songs and a show of support that also happened on Capitol Hill so there's a strong presence here as well in Washington of many people concerned about this this have gone to the landmarks uh, to let it be known how they feel there's a strange sense of deja vu about all this uh, uh, Nora in the sense that the former President Bush just about a decade ago had a similar problem that is to say that there was an act of aggression uh, this time in the Middle East the invasion of Kuwait by Iraq and President Bush had to rally the American people around his his ideas of what to do about things and had to rally the international community exactly what this president is facing. Well, I, it's interesting that you note that for us because as I listened to the Secretary of State Colin Powell today, what came to mind, of course, was this. Of course, remember that Colin Powell was also served in number 41 or, or former President Bush's administration as well, and that thought of building this coalition. And that is exactly what this administration is doing reaching out to leaders um, around the world, making sure that everyone is in line with the United States taking a slow, patient approach so that any response is a calculated one, an exacting one. As someone at the Pentagon said today, it's not going to be a pinprick of an attack. If there is one, it is going to be a full-scale attack. And this, the White House heartened and welcomed today um, a response from NATO, um, which invoked today a mutual defense clause for the first time in history. And what that does is in many ways sort of opens up the way for a, a, a possible collective military response. NATO now behind the United States. Um, also, um, as we heard from Andrea Mitchell later when you were speaking with her, that in fact uh, the Saudi ambassador, uh, Prince Bandar, also saying that they would be with the United States. This is building that coalition and as you say, echoes back uh, to a decade ago. Uh, Nora, you say a full-scale attack, but doesn't it raise the question of a full-scale attack against whom and what kind of full-scale attack? Well, absolutely. That's the difficult question here, is that there is a war against whom. It's a faceless en uh, enemy without a state, perhaps. 
Um, and that's why there are so many law enforcement officials out tonight. That's why the president spent most of the day with the vice president and the national security team um, working through this. Um, it's fair to say that they are going through this in a slow, deliberate process to make sure that they are doing this in the right way. But the president signaled in his response, in his, um, in his comments to the American people, that the U.S. would take action against any nation harboring anyone um, who was involved in this attack. Of course, the reference to Osama bin Laden and perhaps Afghanistan. But they want to be careful about this before any action is taken. It's also worth noting, of, of course, today is two for us. The Secretary of Defense, Donald Rumsfeld, telling NBC's Tom Brokaw um, that once again reminding those that are involved with classified material that any types of leaks uh, whether to the media or to others, could endanger men and women who may be involved in any possible military action. Nora O'Donnell at the White House and Frank Luntz, who's been conducting this poll, a fascinating poll uh, for NBC just out tonight. Thanks so much to, to both of you for talking to us. You can believe that there will be an awful lot of questions that are going to be asked. We've asked you just a few of them this evening, but if we are moving towards some kind of military action, the question will be exactly what kind of military action, against whom will this action be taken, and will it involve American troops on the ground? That is always the critical question. An air war is never as effective as a ground war. A ground war is always more dangerous. I'll be back in a couple of hours. Brian Williams is along next. This is MSNBC. I just think it's people coming together. I mean, instead of just sitting at home, they're, they're getting out and doing something and, you know, coming together and just showing that something like this isn't going to keep us down. I'm not a medic, and, you know, I don't have a background um, in disaster relief, so, you know, I, I obviously am not going to be allowed into the site to try to help save lives, which is, you know, what, of course, all of us would really like to do. We can't even get blood. They have so much blood that this is the only thing that I think that we can do. We painted a big giant sign, and after we hung up the sign from the light post, I mean, there was probably 60 or 70 people came out and started cheering with us. And I mean, this is the best feeling I've ever had in my life. I just joined the uh, police cadet corps last week, and I just feel like I need to be here and do something because I can't believe it happened, and I don't understand why. Did you guys find any more people alive? No, never. No, pull anybody out? There was really nobody that we found in one piece. They were under tons and tons of steel. It was like the center of the building is like a, like, like a, a cauldron of fire in, in the center of the building. There must be 60 fire trucks that are totally destroyed. My heart hurts. I can't imagine what they see. I just think that they're amazing people that they do this. They should keep doing what they're doing. They're great and they're wonderful. It's tough then. Were you there overnight? We were there till 3 o'clock in the morning. But it's, it's, yeah, it's like Planet of the Apes. You got 200 guys dead. It looked like apocalypse now. I mean, I was in Vietnam as a Marine, and I have never in my life seen anything even remotely close to what I saw there. Nothing like it. It's terrible. They're going through, through a lot. I mean, it's just they're not getting much sleep. They're, I don't know what we would do without them. I mean, they're heroes in the boldest sense of the word. Any comic book character you've ever imagined pales in comparison to the men and women in there risking their lives. New Yorkers always get a bad rap, but I think we're just like this. We love each other underneath it all, underneath all the bickering. We just, we really do stick together, and it's, it's essential in a time like this. Thank you! You always hear it can be cold, tough people, but here, I mean, I don't see that at all. I see a bunch of people coming together for support. daughter to see that there are more good people than bad people and we're all together here and this is something we're going to overcome together. We're here in this world to live and be peaceful and no fighting, no weapons. And we will survive this and we'll be better than we were before.
Terrorist attacks can shake the foundations of our biggest buildings, but they cannot touch the foundation of America. These acts shatter steel, but they cannot dent the steel of American resolve. Stand beside her. This is uh, a vicious attack upon New York. It's an attack upon America. It's an attack upon the whole concept of freedom and our way of life. Uh, and we cannot let these at attacks succeed. From the mountains to the prairies to the oceans, with all. Our hearts go out to all the victims and to their families. It is a tragedy, but as the president has made clear, it is a tragedy that we are strong enough to overcome. Our spirits will not be broken. We are, in a sense, seeing the definition of a, of a new battlefield uh, in the world, a 20th, 21st century battlefield. God bless America, my home sweet home. New York is going to be here, and we're going to rebuild, and we're going to be stronger than we were before. Hi, everybody. I'm John Gibson, and this is Fox News continuing coverage, Terrorism Hits America. Here is the latest. I put it on the screen. The New York and New Jersey Port Authority uh, says that casualties are expected to top 20,000 in the World Trade Center bombing, casualties defined as both dead and injured. The State Department issues, issues a worldwide caution uh, for Americans anywhere in the world uh, because a threat still exists. Uh, David Lee Miller joins us now. Here are some more before we go to David Lee Miller. F the uh, feds are considering armed law enforcement agents on all flights in this country. It's called Sky Marshal. The Department of Justice search warrants are executed in more than three states, including Massachusetts, Florida, and New Jersey. And the, uh, there is a possibility some hijackers pose as pilots to gain access uh, to cockpits. The FBI says that the World Trade Center crime scene is unworkable because of dangers to agents and rescuers. Now, as I was saying, uh, David Lee Miller joins us now from Ground Zero at the World Trade Center, where rescue operations continue throughout the night. Hi, David. Hi there, John. It has been now almost two days since the attack on the World Trade Center, and we are told that a total of only nine survivors now have been plucked from the rubble. One of them, though, an absolutely miraculous story, a uh, police officer for the Port Authority here. His name, John McLaughlin. He was on the 82nd floor when suddenly the building underneath him collapsed. It gave way, and he rode that debris all the way to the ground. His injuries, broken legs and shattered ankles. An absolutely incredible story. And just a short time ago, we had the opportunity to talk to Dr. Emil Chin. He's one of the volunteers here at the site and he personally treated four of the other survivors and said there could be more. In the rubble, there's actually some big cavities that they're going into now with the uh, canine cores. There's a search and rescue team with dogs from uh, Massachusetts that's down here. And um, I think there's always a hope for a limited number of survivors, even days after the accident. Tell me, what have you seen? You say you have personally encountered four survivors. I was here about 12 hours yesterday and almost 12 hours today. I saw two yesterday and two today. Um, so they're, you know, they're coming in a very slow trickle, but we're always hopeful for more. Can you tell us more about them? Were they conscious? Did they talk? What condition were they in? Uh, I remember one woman was in pretty good condition. Um, so it seems like the people are either doing uh, very well or unfortunately there uh, seem to be fatalities, but not that much in between. We have not yet had to do any surgery at the scene ourselves. They're just going to hospitals by ambulance. And from a medical perspective, what is the scene like down there? It's a little bit chaotic, but it's really uh, encouraging because there's so many different specialties volunteering. I'm volunteering today, and I would say the majority of the doctors are here as volunteers. You said you had some thoughts about people having the right to, to, to see close up the, uh, the site. I think it does a disservice to the American people not to have media access right at the scene, as long as it's uh, secure and it doesn't jeopardize any national security because 
what you see from far away, the shots that I'm seeing, it does not describe the horrific nature of the trauma, both physically, in terms of life, in terms of uh, psychological trauma, of all the rescue workers, the victims. You have to be up close. It looks like it looks like a volcano went off, not a bomb. There's ash knee deep. It's the craziest thing you've ever seen, and the American public needs to see it. They need to see what has been done to this country. I'm not sure that many Americans would actually like to see the disaster site. Personally, we got a statistic from authorities a few hours ago upping the number of fatalities. They are now estimating it could be over 20,000 here at the World Trade Center. And, John, we've also gotten word that New York City's mayor, Rudy Giuliani, is asking the federal government to supplement the city's supply of body bags and to come up with another 6,000. Back to you. David, uh, back to Dr. Chen's comments about uh, um, the American public seeing the scene at the World Trade Center. Uh, I'm a little confused. Are we not seeing what he's talking about? Are we not able to get cameras close enough to see that, uh, those scenes that, he's, that he described to you? Well, it was his opinion that uh, the shots that he has seen, which are the pictures we've been showing you regularly and the other networks have as well, are just too far away. He says you really have to stand there up close and personal and observe this devastation, which he describes as horrific. He says that the TV pictures just don't convey that emotion. But I think even if we did that, what I'm hearing, John, from a lot of these workers, television is only uh, you know, a two-dimensional medium. It still wouldn't be enough to convey the real horror. When you stand even where I am and you smell the air and you breathe in now what might be asbestos particles in the air, you really understand, not just in your brain, but in your heart, what has happened to this country. John? David Lee Miller, uh, down at the scene of the World Trade Center bombing. Uh, David, thanks very much. Uh, joining us now from Washington, Fox News senior correspondent Rita Cosby with more on the investigation as to what happened. Uh, Rita, what do we know? Well, John, law enforcement sources are telling me that they are almost certain that indicted terrorist Osama bin Laden is behind the deadly hijackings, and they are quickly getting some significant leads. Law enforcement officials say that they have the names of virtually all of the hijackers. Sources say that they got the names with the help of the plane's manifests and also intercepted cell phone calls. Fox News has learned that at least one of the hijackers was previously known to authorities as a supporter of bin Laden's. Sources also say that the hijackers were mainly Egyptian and Saudi nationals, the two groups that comprise a good portion of bin Laden's followers. Now, investigators tonight are following the paper trail. Some of the passenger tickets purchased by the hijackers were, I'm told, bought in cash. But in one case, sources say that a single credit card was used to buy tickets for seven of the hijackers. Also, a car left at Boston Airport, Logan Airport there, containing technical flight training information, led authorities to a flight training school in southern Florida. Four of the men who authorities believe participated in the hijacking of the Twin Towers in New York lived in southern Florida and at some point were trained at two separate training schools there. Heavily armed authorities also stormed a Boston hotel today. There they found, according to sources, a vacant hotel room rented out by one of the hijackers. They also took three men into custody. One law enforcement source telling me tonight that the men have been released, that there was not sufficient evidence to hold any of them at this point, but that they're still going to keep an eye on them and also others. An Amtrak train from Boston to Washington was also held up for two hours in Providence. Rhode Island. Now, the mayor there tells Fox News that one man was arrested, the man you see there, on weapons charges. Sources now say that this may not be related to the hijackings, that they're still looking into this. Authorities are rounding up individuals, I'm told, in at least five states, including also in Pennsylvania, Maine, and also New Jersey, trying to get people with possible ties to bin Laden behind bars, even on immigration offenses, whatever offenses they could in hopes of preventing any possible future attacks and also in hopes of getting valuable information leading to who they believe masterminded this highly sophisticated attack. John. Rita Cosby in Washington with the latest on the investigation. Rita, thanks very much. Meantime, Fox News correspondent Brian Williams uh, Wilson joins us live from the Pentagon. Brian? Yes, uh, the, the cleanup it continues here. They're, they're trying to find the right balance here between going in and destroying a crime scene and uh, also trying to stabilize the situation. Now, the feeling here is is that no one has survived, that there will be no survivors pulled from the, uh, the debris here. That's because the 
impact, the fire, the smoke over the last day and a half was just too much, that no one could have survived it. And now the question is, what do they do next? And uh, there seems to be some concern about the stability of the building. They're trying to shore it up, doing the best they can to make it in a more stable situation before they go in in depth. Uh, also today, something, a rather poignant moment this afternoon, as workers climb to the very top of the south side of the Pentagon, not too far from where the plane impacted the south side of the Pentagon building, and unfurled a giant flag. And I must tell you, as I, as I came to work today, all over Washington, in neighborhoods, uh, hanging from overpasses, the American flag is on display in this city, a patriotic display, and here on the Pentagon, a patriotic gesture uh, at a time when the nation is still reeling from the events of the past day or so. Now, the area around the Pentagon has been locked down, but only recently have they opened up the streets to the public, and it seems the public is coming by to take a look. For the first time since a plane crashed into the side of the Pentagon, folks were allowed to get close enough to see the damage firsthand. It was an unusual mix of people on this night. Sure, there were those who came to see the bright lights in the media trucks, but others came almost out of a sense of obligation. And in fact, my daughter said, do you think we're being disrespectful to come down and look? Uh, because I don't want to appear that we're gawking. And I said, no, I really think we're showing our respect. Still others came because they couldn't quite believe what they had seen on television. Like anything else, the, the pictures on TV don't uh, do justice to the scene. And you really, it, it doesn't seem real until you come down here and look at it. As you might imagine, some people were just angry and wanted to vent. It's a shame. It's a shame. And whoever did it, hey, we're going to get you. And then there were the people who came to explain the unexplainable to their children. And the children seemed to understand. People have just lost everyone, like their moms and dads in this, so it's just sad like that. So that's just what I think. Isn't it funny how the young children, even though they may not understand or grasp everything that they see, get the real basic here, that there's been a human loss of life and that some people will not have their mommies and daddies coming home. A poignant comment from a very young viewer of the damage tonight. We're here in front of the Pentagon where the work continues and the death toll now stands at 80. John, back to you. Brian Wilson at the Pentagon. Brian, thanks a lot. More details coming in now about what happened on those four doomed hijacked airplanes. Pas passengers made chilling cell phone calls to 911 and to loved ones. Steve Brown reports. As terrorists took over four flights Tuesday, passengers and crew members used cell phones to reach out with urgent cries for help, with information for authorities, or with last-second words of love for family members. Mark Bingham was aboard United Flight 93, which had left Newark for San Francisco. He reached family members at home. He just said, I want to let you all know that I love you very, very much in case I don't see you again. I said that that the plane has been taken over by hijackers. And, um, and then I said, well, we love you very much too, Mark. Let me go get your mother. An unidentified man hiding in a bathroom aboard Flight 93 dialed 911 on his cell phone to reach a dispatcher outside Pittsburgh. We are being hijacked. We are being hijacked. This is not a joke, he said, before his phone went dead. Aboard the same flight, Lauren Grand Colas, on her way home to San Francisco from her grandmother's funeral in New Jersey, was able to reach her husband, Jack. We have been hijacked, she told him. They are being kind. I love you. Flight attendant C.C. Ross of Fort Myers, Florida, put through a panicked call to her husband, Lauren Lyles, who had just gotten their two sons off to school. He heard screams in the background as she told him, We've been hijacked. I love you. I love the children. Still on Flight 93, Thomas Burnett called his wife Dina and told her of a final act of resistance to terror. I know we're all going to die. There's three of us who are going to do something about it, he said. Flight 93 was the only plane that didn't reach its target, crashing into an empty field in southern Pennsylvania. Peter Hansen of Groton, Massachusetts, was aboard United Flight 175 with his wife and their three-year-old daughter as it left Boston for Los Angeles. He reached his father in Connecticut. Hansen told his parents he knew they were all going to die, but he tried to reassure them. Don't worry about us. It's going to be quick, Hansen told his father. United Flight 175 was the second plane to crash into the World Trade Center. 
Fox News commentator Barbara Olson was aboard American Airlines Flight 77 as it left Washington for Los Angeles. She was able to place two calls to her husband, Theodore Olson, the U.S. Solicitor General. Our plane is being hijacked. She then asked, what should I tell the pilot? The call was cut off, but she immediately called back to ask again, what should I tell the pilot? Those were her final words as minutes later, American Flight 77 became a massive missile and crashed into the Pentagon. Steve Brown, Fox News. Joining us now, counterterrorism and Middle East expert Brian Jenkins. Brian is a former member of the Clinton administration's Commission on Aviation Safety and Security. Brian, I hardly know where to begin, uh, but let's talk about those cell phone calls. It sounds as though, uh, to me, and maybe to you as well, you can tell me, if uh, that, that plane that crashed outside of Pittsburgh might have made it to Washington, might have hit a target if the passengers hadn't conducted what amounts to a, a mutiny of their hijacking. It, it certainly seems that way. Uh, the natural reaction of passengers in a hijacked aircraft, uh, and, and normally quite sensibly so, is to remain passive and to, to, to not attempt to confront the hijackers. In this particular case, however, uh, they did so, and their heroism, in fact, is uh, probably saved hundreds, if not thousands, of more lives. Because the plane undoubtedly was headed for some other dramatic target, do you think? I, I suspect so. I mean, we don't know what that target was, uh, whether it was going to be uh, a, another plane into the Pentagon, whether it was going to be aimed at the White House, uh, whether it would crash somewhere else in, in Washington, the Capitol. We, we don't know. But the fact is it went down in a field in Pennsylvania, which was certainly a tragedy for the passengers on board. Uh, but, as I say, save the lives of many hundreds, perhaps thousands of others. Uh, okay, Brian, let's back up. We are now talking about declaring an act of war against Osama bin Laden and the countries that harbor him, uh, who, whichever ones those might be. Uh, is, are we swinging at air here? Is there something in particular to hit? Well, there's going to be uh, undeniably some frustration between the, the shock uh, that turns to grief, that will turn to anger as we become fully aware of the magnitude of these losses and, in fact, begin to see the visual images of, of thousands of, of, of caskets and, and, and funerals. That, that fury is going to demand a response. The administration is preparing a response. Uh, and that response is probably going to exceed the kinds of responses that we've seen in the past. This is not going to be a single salvo of cruise missiles, but rather the beginning of an ongoing campaign. But um, the frustration is that that is a war that is directed against a network. It's directed against cells of fanatics. There are not going to be any landings on Normandy beaches here. There's not going to be eventually anybody that steps out on the decks of a, uh, of a battleship and signs a surrender. But is there going to be a scene like the one we're looking at now, this utter destruction of, of what amounts to a World War III scene in someone else's country? Probably not, uh, nor do I think that, that the American people would desire that we respond to uh, an act of terrorism such as this by simply wantonly killing uh, uh, civilians in, in other countries. However, however much our emotions and anger may be aroused by this, that is not an appropriate monument uh, to those who are killed. We will, we should take every measure that we can to identify those who are responsible, those who assisted them, to break up other terrorist cells that may exist. I mean, one thing that's important to keep in mind here, uh, as your own early report uh, underlined, Preparations for this operation took place, began months ago when people began training for, uh, 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 for, for flying training. Uh, we do not know at this very moment how many other cells may exist around the world of individuals who are ready, perhaps even in the process of preparing to carry out additional <coughs> actions. Okay, let's go to the other area of your expertise, and that is aviation security and safety. Uh, it, it probably goes without saying that we've been unnecessarily lax in our security in commercial aviation. Uh, but what is the new world going to look like when we finally go back into the air in a few days? Uh, how are we going to be assuring our security now that, now that we've seen this? 
Well, clearly, uh, uh, these events will call for a wholesale review of the security measures in place, and we'll have to try to put together more details about exactly how this took place. Uh, did these people smuggle on uh, board something that they should not have had on board, or are the procedures inadequate to, to prevent uh, otherwise harmless-looking objects, uh, cardboard cutters described in one of the cell phone calls, uh, from coming on board? Did they have the assistance of uh, suborned members of the, of the ground staff? All of those will, will be investigated. On the basis of that investigation, then we can look and to see what precise vulnerabilities were exploited in this particular uh, 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 set of uh, hijackings and what we might do to improve the situation. There is no question that we can need to improve aviation security. The biggest problem has not been lack of ideas. In fact, the biggest problem hasn't even been the lack of measures that we have recommended uh, in, in the past. The biggest problem has been complacency. Right. Complacency. All right, Brian Jenkins, a terror expert. Uh, thanks very much, Brian. We appreciate you coming in tonight. Joining us now from Washington, Stephen Emerson. He's with a group called Investigative Project, which researches international terrorism. Stephen, before I get into your direct area of expertise, just segueing from Brian Jenkins, um, <coughs> there are techniques the Israelis use on El Al. We don't see a whole lot of El Al hijackings anymore. Uh, and that may be a model for uh, our new aviation world. What do they do that's so different uh, from what we have been doing? They do two things. One is they do certain types of psychological profiling uh, of all types of uh, 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 people traveling on the planes to determine whether they looked at part, whether they're traveling alone, wh where they've traveled before. And uh, they make an instant determination whether that profile merits a, an exhaustive examination of everything in their baggage, including uh, squeezing sometimes a toothpaste out of a toothpaste tube. So uh, that, that process can take a while. That's why they advise people going to El Al to, to get there sometimes two and a half hours ahead of time. Um, and I think that type of intrusive uh, you know, inspection of our own personal belongings, as well as the willingness to endure a certain type of profiling, is, is the key to the success of the Israeli uh, air, airline uh, security success story. Stephen, uh, into your main area of expertise, uh, who did this, why they did it, and whether actions we take might deter them from doing it in the future. Is there, is there, are there things we can do to stop this? Listen, you, you've raised very good questions. I, I wish I had magical answers. The, you know, the, there's no doubt that the evidence, the indication, the wherewithal uh, clearly points to Osama bin Laden and his disciples. Whether we'll ever find the, the magical uh, you know, uh, connection as we found in the embassy bombings in Kenya and Tanzania is, is, is probably doubtful at this point because in Kenya and Tanzania they captured several of, of the would-be suicide bombers uh, because they never uh, blew themselves up and they talked eventually and some of them even confessed. Um, here, the FBI is no doubtedly going to round up the people that assisted in this. I mean, I, I have a list that I brought with me of, of some of the names of the hijackers they've got. Actually, some of, one of the hijackers actually secured his reservations for the, uh, for the flight through a Kinko's, and, and they've traced the IP, the internet protocol address, so they know exactly where it was made. They're, the FBI is doing an extraordinary job tonight and, and, and will be for the foreseeable future. Now, you raise another question. Can we stop it? I don't know. I, I do know this, that, that the answer is not going to be found in one, uh, as Brian Jenkins said, in one cruise missile strike. It's going to be a sustained war. Uh, we, we, it's going to take years. We've got to build up our deterrence and intelligence. And those are the two things. We can't just build security, because if we just build security, they'll do car bombs in, in Washington. The idea here is to really rebuild our human intelligence, our connections, which was, has been really decimated, and two, build up deterrence. In other words, show that we will not allow Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Lebanon, and other countries to sort of, uh, you know, not be as forceful as they could with, with terrorists. We, are, we will confront the entire network of militant Islamic fundamentalists, Stephen, wherever uh, they just are. Hold on a second. I've got to interrupt you. We're going to pause for just a moment here so some of our Fox stations can leave us for their local news, but we are going to continue. Let's just pause.
as we look at a scene of the uh, of, of the rescue workers going through the rubble at, at the World Trade Center, where I mean, we're at this point down there where they're really going through the stuff not only with big front end loaders and, and cranes, but by hand. I mean, you can see people with buckets, uh, buckets of dirt, uh, and 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 bucket brigades uh, passing the buckets along and digging away, looking for uh, both the people who were killed and, and with any luck, uh, some survivors. Uh, Stephen Emerson, uh, terrorism expert. T Stephen, I, I guess what I was asking, and maybe you can tell, is are we at a in a war with the Muslim world at large that we're just never, ever going to all get along, in Rodney K King's phrase, and that, that there's just going to be somebody mad at us all the time and so mad they're going to try to do things like this all the time, no matter what. Look, th there's no doubt that there are going to be people angry at us at all times b because of who we are, because we're Americans, because we're democracy, because we've got separation of church and state, because we we're, not, we're infidels, we're, we're apostates, whatever. But I do believe that the, the vast majority of the Muslim world uh, with the right leadership in their own countries, uh, with the right uh, encouragement uh, and carrot and stick approach, can be made to see the fact that their alliance with the West is the only wave of the future. And the fact of the matter is that, that countries like, like Afghanistan and the Taliban, which support and protect the bin Laden, uh, Pakistan, which has this quasi-love-hate relationship with bin Laden, um, these countries have to be made to know that their price of support for bin Laden is going to be the price of economic investment uh, or political isolation. We have to be willing to stop politi politicizing terrorism, to basically adopt across-the-board doctrine with our Western allies. And I think now we have an opportunity for the first time ever to get Western support, European support, they've been traditionally reluctant to support our anti-terrorism. Now I think we have a window of opportunity to get them to go along. There's no guarantee that it's going to work. This is not a war against Islam. This is a war against militant Islam. The vast majority of Muslims are not interested in fighting a war with the West. They're interested in the same things you and I are interested in. But it is definitely a war that we have to declare against bin Laden, Hamas, Hezbollah, the whole spectrum of groups that operate worldwide with the intention of annihilating the United States or Western values and ideals. Okay, so what happens next? The president is, uh, is getting his allies all lined up behind him. Uh, actually, I think a lot of people are kind of surprised he's taking as long as he is to, to strike somebody. Uh, so what happens next? What is your prediction? It's hard to predict here. I, I think, one, there, there's obviously a, a, a waiting to determine whether they have the right, sufficient intelligence to launch a military response against bin Laden's camps in Afghanistan. And, and I believe they have identified with very sufficient clarity the, the exact location of those camps. Whether they could ever get bin Laden himself is, is very unclear. What about Remember, other countries? Look, th well, the president was very clear that he said that he will get the terrorists and those who harbor and protect them. And the fact of the matter is that there are other countries that have done this. Um, and, and we have got to be willing to sort of cash in our chits with the Saudis, with the Egyptians, that will uh, stop the Saudis from, you know, uh, turning a blind eye to some of the bank accounts that bin Laden has in his country and, and to stop and, and to uh, demand that they allow extradition to the United States of terrorists to blow up other marine barracks or, or U.S. barracks. Um, look, it's not going to be a one, two, three punch. It's not the traditional war, and, and that's what we have to understand. This could take three, four, five years. Uh, it took bin Laden 10 years to develop the capability that he had to do, commit this horrific crime yesterday. It's going to take us several years to restore the balance of deterrence, to make sure that his protectors, and he has state protectors understand that the price of supporting him is simply not worth it. And that means we're going to have to go it alone or go with the Europeans. We're going to have to be willing to use military, economic, political isolation, as well as stop some of the networks from operating in the United States. And that's going to raise questions about whether we lower the threshold about investigating groups that advocate violence. Right now, you can advocate destruction of the United States, call for death to America, in Chicago or Washington, D.C. or Detroit, Stephen, and you're protected. Stephen Emerson, I'm uh, out of time. Thanks very much for joining us. Stephen e Emerson, terrorism expert. Uh, we are going to continue.
Stephen Emerson says it's going to take years. Uh, it seems like years already, and it's only been a day or so. Uh, with us now, Fox News senior business correspondent Brenda Butner to talk about uh, the huge ramifications of these uh, these incredible acts of terror on on our markets. The, the markets are now talking about opening up on. Friday or maybe Monday? Friday at the earliest, yes, Monday at the latest. There really is a very difficult balancing act because they don't want the efforts to resurrect the markets um, and the ability to effectively uh, uh, transmit transactions um, to in any, any way interfere with the recovery efforts. But they also want to send a clear signal. When that opening bell finally rings on either Friday or Monday, it's going to send a signal to the terrorists that yes you can go ahead and fell buildings but you cannot take down the freest and fairest market in the world and that is intended to be a a symbol of defiance in in many ways so they're they're really balancing between those two those two issues right now we see that the overseas markets are trading Thailand, um, Malaysia, and Taiwan are taking some significant dips, but that's basically because they didn't trade last night. The other markets that did have some downturn uh, last night are all stabilizing. You can almost hear them holding their breath, waiting to see what happens in the United States. Get back to that in just a second. But in the meantime, uh, the World Trade Center had a huge number of people uh, directly involved in the major companies of, of the yes. financial markets. Uh, we've gotten some kind of good news. I, I think it was Morgan Stanley says a lot of their people are accounted for, and that and that they didn't. It, that Morgan Stanley didn't simply disappear. Uh, but what about I don't know hundreds of other companies in that in that building? Is word trickling out about people getting out safely? Word is trickling out that they that uh, wonderful rescue stories and heroic efforts to save people, but also unfortunately, um, there are many losses. Um, people that uh, that uh, we have known very well, that we've interviewed on on our air, who were just trapped um, and never made it out. Um, so uh, there is that flip side as well to to the. Uh, stories of safety. So Brenda, th this thing has a kind of a ripple of effect through the economy and through the business psyche uh, and so forth. Is it predictable? Um, it's predictable in that basically we have shrugged off other acts of terrorism and of war. The markets have. We've seen a quick downturn and then the market just keeps going up. That's important to recognize, but we've never seen something of this magnitude. A lot of it is going to depend on the consumer. Will the consumer rally around and say, we are not going to take this. We are not going to sit up and, and, and zip up our wallets. We're going to continue to trade. We're going to continue to spend. Um, or will this be the shock that this economy did not need, this very vulnerable economy? Brenda Butner, uh, uh, taking a look at what's going to happen when the markets eventually get around to opening, either Friday at the earliest or at uh, Monday, if things don't go as well as everybody would like. Brenda, thanks uh, for staying up. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you. New York's business district, as Brenda has been saying, will never be the same as the Twin Towers are lost forever. But the buildings initially survived an impact that would have instantly destroyed most, most skyscrapers and bought enough time to save many lives. Claudia Cowan has that story. Once the jewels of New York's skyline, the World Trade Center towers stood up against terrorism long enough to save countless lives. The plane came through, it took out a few of the exterior columns of the building, and then set off this massive fire with the jet fuel. And fortunately, because of the perimeter tube system of the building, it was able to withstand the initial impact and allow a lot of people to get out. Other buildings would have toppled immediately, but the towers remained upright for nearly an hour, supported on the outside by closely spaced steel columns and struts, and on the inside by a second set of columns designed to bear the load of gravity, a double support system that withstood the crash, but not the raging jet fuel fire. The, the girders or the joists that hold up the floors collapsed, and as those fell to the floor below, they overwhelmed the capacity of that floor and we, we, we had it was what we call a progressive collapse which then continued on through the base of the building until there uh, it was a complete and total failure most experts say tall buildings will continue to be made out of steel what may change they say is the design of signature skyscrapers the tallest and most exposed buildings they may never be built in quite the same way it's not like we could ever design every building for this scenario or should we but after 
Every major earthquake, for example, we change our building codes to improve our practice in the future, and uh, I would expect a similar thing will happen here. One possibility, designs that include more escape routes around the perimeter of the building as well as in the center. But experts say no building can withstand an attack by a pilot willing to die for a cause. The challenge ahead, simply finding ways to reduce the loss of life. In San Francisco, Claudia Cowan, Fox News. Just a side note to that story, the Wall Street Journal reporting today that the steel in those buildings is uh, designed to accept uh, 800 degrees temperature, melts at 1,500 degrees, and the jet fuel fire produced 2,000 degrees. Our next guest is an expert in the study of hate and extremism. Brian Levin used to be with the New York Police Department, now a professor at Cal State University. So, uh, Brian, you know, there's still a, a situation today that was alluded to by Secretary of Transportation Norman Mineta. He wanted to open the uh, nation's air system at noon. He was convinced by the security experts he should not. What he didn't say, but hinted at, is there's still some guys running around that they're not quite sure about, or they're not quite sure there aren't guys running around who want to uh, uh, carry out further attacks as soon as planes are back in the air. What, what do you know about this crazed determination to do this kind of damage uh, from these people? Well, we know that uh, religiously motivated zealots who bastardize religions are the hardest to deter and the hardest to infiltrate. And uh, if there is intel, and it appeared when he was questioned, I saw that exact uh, press conference. When he was pressed, he, w he basically said, look, this is uh, a law enforcement security thing rather than an administrative preparation kind of thing. And I think they did the responsible thing. Look, I just drove uh, 450 miles from San Francisco to be here with you tonight. Um, I think uh, sometimes prudence, even if it inconveniences people, is the best way to go. And if he's relying on some decent intel... Uh, okay, but, but read between the lines. Yeah. Is the Secretary of Transportation, Norm Mineta, saying, uh, we can't put planes in the sky in this nation or let planes land from elsewhere in this nation because on the loose are still more elements of the Osama bin Laden organization that carried out these four hijackings and these terror attacks on the Pentagon and the World Trade Center. Well, I think, I think we've had people on the loose uh, for some time. But the fact of the matter is, when you have an event of this magnitude, uh, I, I don't think he has a choice other than to be prudent. And uh, even if there is a possibility and there's some reasonable intel on it, I think he did exactly the right thing. That doesn't mean you know we should shut down all the, all the post offices and, and all the banks and everything. But when it comes to the instrumentality that was used and the worst act of terrorism in American history, I think it's prudent to wait a few days until we can scramble our, our resources together and find out exactly uh, what this represents. Okay, Brian, now, th about the people who do this. Is it necessary to merely threaten them with overwhelming violence, or do the individuals have to be the victims of overwhelming violence in order to stop this? In other words, you go around and bomb a few places and make life difficult, will they stop, or do you have to actually get these people? Well, well, the problem is there are legions of people throughout the world who loathe the United States and would gladly give their lives uh, in the process. Uh, the thing here is this isn't some 22-year-old with a backpack with a pipe bomb and shrapnel. We're talking about someone who not only had the motive, but a network and resources. So I think what has to be done is we have to be very careful to do our homework, find out who's responsible, who has the resources, and then be very careful with a proportionate response. But I think, again, uh, we should step back a little bit and not shoot from the hip and potentially alienate those who might be our allies. Let me like, point like who? Well, well, let me just give you an example. I um, mean, we, we got, have we have potential friends in Iraq we could uh, uh, alienate by uh, bombing Iraq for some complicity in this thing? Well, first of all, we don't know if Iraq has any complicity. Well, uh, let's just say we do. Let's just say, let's just say it's the usual suspects, Brian. What is the point of staying our hand? Oh, I, I, I don't think we should stay our hand. But what I think we do have to do, and maybe this is where I'm, I'm diverging with you a bit, is, is we have to make sure that we have persuasive evidence as to who did this. But, for instance, if we, uh, if we attacked uh, Iraq, for instance, and we didn't have a basis for connecting them to this, 
uh, I think that there would be extreme political fallout, particularly because we're going to need the cooperation of moderate or the more moderate Middle Eastern countries in, in pursuing this. And again, I think Emerson was right in, in the fact that this is something that's going to take years. It's going to take intel on the ground, which you have to develop uh, over some time. And I think that's why, you know, it's important sometimes to walk softly and carry a big stick. But when we do identify those uh, responsible, I think it's uh, okay. important to All do right, a Brian, look, you're, you're an expert in this area. Here's a quote from Osama bin Laden, who says he didn't actually have anything to do with it, but reacting to the news that this has happened. Uh, this was, a, of course, a, a, a television reporter uh, in uh, Abu Dhabi, uh, the bureau chief there uh, for uh, Abu Dhabi Television, says that uh, Osama bin Laden thanked Almighty Allah and bowed before him when he heard this news, uh, but he went on to say he didn't really have anything to do with it himself. He's just very happy, very happy that it happened. Now, okay, we all know we, we, we want to go after Osama bin Laden. That, that's no big news. And if, if we had to, you know, bomb most of Afghanistan, I don't suppose anybody would be very shocked. Whoa, 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 whoa. Hold on a second. One of the things I think we have to step back and, and recognize is that many of these countries are, are in extreme, under extreme tensions themselves. Algeria, for instance, has had a civil war with tens of thousands dead because there are extreme uh, zealots out there. And Afghanistan, too. The uh, a, a main lieutenant in the opposition to the Taliban was killed by a bomb the other week. So a, a Taliban we, bomb, right. Right. So if, if we, so quote unquote, carpet bomb Afghanistan, we're going to, first of all, hurt many... No, but we would, we would bomb... I mean, you, you, you talk about proportionality. I just remind you that we might have 10,000 body bags here. That uh, proportionality is, is now a new... Uh, has a new definition. But uh, we, would, we would attack the Taliban who has been hosting. The euphemism is Osama bin Laden is a guest of the Taliban. Look, we, look. we would attack them for their hosting of bin Laden, wouldn't we? I think the precursor to all this is that we have to establish a link. Look, I happen to agree with you in a speculative way that bin Laden is behind this. I, I, I don't disagree with you there. What's the link? I mean, we have a link today that the people uh, that, uh, that, that uh, got on the planes in Boston and hijacked uh, the, the planes there, that one or more of them had some connection to bin Laden. So what kind of link is it that the world wants us to produce in order to justify our lashing back at, at a number of, over a, an incident of, of a number of casualties bigger than the Normandy invasion. Look, and, my, and my dad was in the Normandy invasion. Look, I, I happen to agree with you in your main point, but in the details, I, I diverge from you. Let me tell you what I mean. Because someone might be a fellow traveler, it is different from someone who is connected to an interlinked bunch of networks that finds its way back to bin Laden. And I think Prudence calls for us to do our investigation because then I think we can develop a greater coalition. Okay, but Brian, look, yeah. uh, th obviously they're doing the investigation. Otherwise, somebody, there'd be some smoke on the horizon someplace already. An investigation is underway. What, what I am arguing to you that is that the United States should not get in a position where it dithers and dawdles and lets the... The, uh, the blood run out of this thing. There's a good deal of anger right now, and, and the country is behind a response. Why, why wait while we have a bunch of Sherlock Holmes going around and nailing down exact connections everywhere when we know what happened? We wait, know it's Bin Laden. Wait, 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 you wait. know it's Bin Laden. Wait, 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 no. I, 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 I have a strong degree of probability that it's Bin Laden, but I think you have to recognize that we are part of a world community. And we have to make sure that before we go out and do something, and I agree with you, if we get the persuasive evidence that we all believe is coming in, that we should have a proportionate response. But nevertheless, we also have to recognize that we have allies in the Middle East, we have allies in Europe, that we Name have one that would argue with other responding today without even asking them. Name one. Uh, I, I think the Egyptians, I think the Saudi Arabians. Uh, but the look. Saudi Arabians whose riches depend on us would be angry for us for responding for this destruction of the World Trade John, Center John, without John, asking look, look, their permission? John, John, you know what? When, when I was a cop, you know, one of the first things I was taught is don't do the John Wayne reflex syndrome. Don't go out there shooting first and asking questions later. 
let's do our homework. We can do the same amount of, 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 of damage later on and hopefully not hit innocent people and do a proportionate response. Time is on our side. Just because we happen to be riled up now, I don't think represents a prudent response. What I think we have to do is do our homework. And by the way, the longer we wait, the more likely we can get other people who might be involved. I think there is actually a logistical reason for w taking a little bit of time to do our homework. Okay, we were, we were going to do our ho homework about the coal. We haven't done much about it. We were going to do our homework about the uh, embassy bombings. We dragged some people in, put them on trial. We were going to do our homework about the Beirut uh, uh, marine barracks bombings, and uh, not much happened there. We were going to do our homework about the Kobar Tower bombings, not much happened there. How long are we going to do homework, Brian, before we say to the world, we don't need anybody's permission to strike back. We're going to do it. Well, a actually, I, I think you make a very effective point there. For instance, with the Kobar Tower bombings, I, I think the cooperation has been less than stellar uh, from the Saudis. Uh, that being said, if you're talking, though, about a proportionate response to this particular incident, which is by far the worst act of terrorism, then, yeah, I do think we, we should wait a little bit and, and get our homework together. That being said, look, the Taliban still has some time to do the right thing. I wouldn't hold my breath, but we have bin Laden now as an international fugitive with m uh, a money reward on his head uh, in the millions. Um, and the Taliban can act on an international arrest warrant now. If they choose not to just for those prior acts, uh, I think we have greater leverage. But let's do our homework if we take a little bit of time. We are taking time. We're Good. clearly taking time. Yeah, but, but, but My argument to you is maybe we shouldn't take too much time. I, 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 I agree with you, but by the same token, I don't think that means that within a day or two of this horrendous tragedy happening, uh, that we just shoot from the hip. There are, there are a variety of things that we have to develop diplomatically, militarily. We have to uh, develop uh, certain kinds of intel and relationships and political dealings with our allies. And it's important to do your homework. It's one thing for people like us who are, are doing stuff in the media or in academia to say things. It's another thing to carry okay, out Brian, logistics. In your expertise, this yeah. is clearly a terror success. Uh, do the people who have the desire to commit this kind of terrorism say bingo we did it let's all stand down and take a nice vacation and be happy that we did such a great job or is this going to inspire them to uh, do more and do more s quicker rather than later I, I think for the short term you might very well s uh, see a stand down just because the uh, the bar is so high now you know people are so vigilant now there are no planes in the air like I said I just drove from San Francisco uh, Targets now are much more hardened than they were three days ago, so you might have a stand down just because it's more difficult. But long term, each of these successes and also the failures breed additional acts. That being said, though, we have 41,000 people dying in, in highway accidents. And, and, and this is a tragedy, but it's something that took months, maybe over a year, to plan for. Brian so Levin, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, end this right now and uh, ask you to just sit there and listen, because uh, Brian Levin of uh, UC, uh, the Cal State University, San Bernardino, a terrorism expert, uh, we, we have on the phone now with us our Fox News correspondent, Greg Palcott, who is in Pakistan. And, uh, Greg, I know that there is, uh, it's been described earlier as a love-hate relationship between uh, Pakistan and Oma Osama bin Laden. Uh, what is the word around where you are uh, about uh, what the United States should or will do? John, certainly there is a lot of uh, nervousness here, a lot of looking over to Washington to try to figure out what is next. Seared in the minds of everybody here in Islamabad, uh, Pakistan is, of course, the retaliatory, uh, retaliatory raids uh, conducted by the United States uh, against uh, Afghanistan, against the establishments, the training bases of uh, Osama bin Laden in Afghanistan following the, uh, following the U.S. embassy hits in East Africa. A lot of concern about that. What we're seeing now in tangible ways is uh, international uh, workers being evacuated from Afghanistan, UN taking out 80 members uh, of their staff throughout Afghanistan, NGOs also pulling out of Afghanistan, other workers involved with the trial of the U.S. and other missionaries that have been going on in, in Kabul. So certainly there is the, the feeling among the international community here that something 
could be happening. Something could be happening soon. They want to get their staffers out of there because if uh, if missiles, if bombs start flying in Afghanistan, certainly the foreigners, the international workers, uh, would be uh, certainly the first ones targeted. Here in Pakistan, you're, you're, you're right, John, it is a love-hate relationship. Now, that's what concerns the United States to a large extent. Pakistan, of course, it, it, it's, it's president saying that they are cooperating with the United States. They want to support their efforts to end terrorism and also to particularly deal with these attacks. But over the years, they have been a very, very large supporter of the Taliban regime. They have supplied them with money, with arms, with manpower. So uh, if you take that one step further, John, we're looking at, the, uh, it, at least in, in a back backdoor way, the, the Pakistan government helping to some degree Osama bin Laden, who's being hosted by the Taliban regime. There's been pressure being put here. The ambassador, De U new U.S. ambassador designate here, is meeting today with the president to impress on him that the United States expects 100 percent help here to try to, to resolve the situation. Uh, in Afghanistan itself, however, again, the Taliban regime is saying no, uh, there is no involvement by the regime or by Osama bin Laden, that it is not possible for Osama bin Laden to have been involved in these attacks, that they have kept him away from any kind of communication with the outside world. In fact, we were just getting reports in the past hour or so that the Taliban regime claims that they have Osama bin Laden under house arrest. They're also saying that, in fact, they would they would hand him over uh, for extra, in an extradition process if the evidence was provided. But this is what, John, the Taliban has been saying for a long time here. They've been saying that basically they have him under, under watch, that he is being monitored, that, in fact, they would be happy to hand him over if they only had the evidence. But their, their standards for that evidence is very, very high. And the United States, of course, is taking everything with a very large grain of salt, John. Greg, uh, aside from Afghanistan and the regime of the Taliban, who uh, I would sort, certainly be number one on the list of suspects, uh, what other countries in the region might have good reason to be nervous about uh, U.S. retaliatory strikes? Well, of course, we're talking about Osama bin Laden. He is a Saudi exile. He is in Afghanistan, but his network the al-Qaeda, that, that is uh, translated as the base. It is an organization with tentacles uh, stretching far, far from here and in various countries uh, throughout the, the Mideast and beyond. There are members of this group and in different subgroups in Sa Saudi Arabia, in Yemen, in Egypt, in Algeria, in Tunisia. And all of these groups are under, under a, the larger umbrella of this al-Qaeda group. So if we're talking about uh, retaliatory strikes, if we're talking about the United States, and in fact this is exactly what the Secretary of State Colin Powell has said, that it is not just one retaliatory strike that they're talking about, they're talking about an ongoing war, we're talking about something that might be taking out more than uh, one individual, one base uh, here in, Afghan in nearby Afghanistan, but trying to trying to route out those individuals throughout. Greg, but let me let me interrupt you because I, I just want to read something to you. The uh, Washington Post reporting tomorrow that Afghanistan's ruling Taliban militia has actually moved its top leader, Mohammed Omar, uh, out of his headquarters uh, and into hiding, anticipating a U.S. attack, and is repositioning its military hardware throughout the country, according to press reports today received. It, it, where you are uh, in Pakistani, by Pakistani is, intelligence sources. Um, and the quotes go more or less like this, uh, definite reports that the Taliban are now preparing to meet a major U.S. military onslaught. It's a warlike situation inside the Taliban military installations uh, inside Afghanistan. So uh, I take it that that's the sort of information that you are also hearing in Islamabad. Yeah. In, in fact, John, uh, the, the targets are pretty straightforward. Uh, United States intelligence knows about what are, are spoken of as dozens of bases that the U.S. feels are used inside Afghanistan to train terrorists of various nationalities to go out and, and do damage. And we're talking about including in the United States, of course. These terror bases uh, would be easily identified and easily targeted by the United States. But also, as you Greg, noted... let me interrupt you in that thought. We have to take a quick pause to let our, uh, some Fox stations leave us for their local news, but we will continue. Greg Palcott's on the phone. Let's take that pause. 
We are, we are back now. Uh, the, uh, once again, just uh, for those of us who are, for those who are joining us or uh, need to be refreshed, Greg Palcott talking to us from Islamabad, Pakistan, about what is going on inside Afghanistan as the Taliban regime braces for a U.S. attack of some sort. Uh, Greg, I was sorry to, I'm sorry to have interrupted you. John, in addition to the terror bases, which have been long identified by the United States intelligence, there are clearly the military installations of the Taliban regime, as well as the government offices and government facilities. One would think, although we're not privy to what's going on right now in the White House, the Pentagon, etc., one would think that one way to deal with the Taliban regime would be to say something like this. Unless you start giving up Osama bin Laden and others of his ilk, that are being hosted in your country, we will very easily start taking out the bits and pieces of your own government infrastructure. And that kind of a threat, that kind of a, a looming possibility, obviously is, is sinking into the, the minds of the Taliban leadership. As you mentioned in reports, we have uh, Muammar Omar, the, the, the leader, the religious leader of the Taliban regime, according to these reports, moving from his base in Kandahar, that's in the southern part of Afghanistan. That's going to be the problem, John, actually, with, with targeting any of these folks, however, the individuals, the people. We might be hitting buildings. We might be hitting bases. These bases often are, are nothing more than a, a few huts in, in, in a dirt field. But getting to the people might be more difficult. According to the, to the individuals that are close to Osama bin Laden, they can pick up and move camp within a half an hour. Great they can head off into the hint into the mountains there, Afghanistan. They are very mobile, John. Greg Palcott, our Fox News correspondent uh, overseas right now in Islamabad, Pakistan, right on the uh, border of Afghanistan. Uh, Greg has been inside Afghanistan and uh, talked to the Taliban leaders in recent months, and he is on the scene for us now. Greg, thanks very much. At this hour, officials in New York City are worried three additional buildings could collapse in the area where the World Trade Center towers used to stand. This new danger only complicates what has been one of the most difficult search and rescue efforts in history. John Scott reports. The fire raged high in Tower 1. Smoke boiled into the air, and the rescue effort was on. Volunteer firefighter Michael Maraglia was among the first to arrive. What we had to do is we had to battle our way into the, uh, into the Trade Center but first, to put out fires of the vehicles that were on fire. We put out maybe three, four dozen cars before we were able to get in to the actual uh, uh, center of it all. And that took over two hours just to put the fires out of the, of the cars. Smoke and debris made any rescue nearly impossible. You couldn't see, but you could hear. You could hear the steel bending. You could hear the crumbling. You could hear people's voices. There was nothing you could do. There was not a thing you could do for them. Then, a flash of hope. We, we do know there are people in the building that are alive. We know that for a fact. From somewhere in the rubble, at least one person called for help from a cell phone. Then, New York Mayor Rudolph Giuliani announced that one of New York's bravest had been pulled alive from the ruins of the World Trade Center. And I, I had one patient, we grabbed her, put in the ambulance. She was full of soot. She was covered from head to toe with ashes. Most of those injured were taken immediately to New York hospitals, with injuries ranging from burns to abrasions on corneas from flying debris. Many of the rescue workers themselves were brought in, treated for exhaustion and shock. Our job was to make sure that the firemen and the cops had food and water, got their eyes cleaned, got a place to lay down. At the Pentagon, rescue workers spent the night trying to shore up the building. The fire still burns, and a spokesman has said that that is hampering the rescue effort. And then, just as workers began to make progress in the rescue effort, came a new danger, a gas leak forcing the evacuation of the World Trade Center rescue site. The desperate attempts to find survivors in both locations will, no doubt, go on for days, possibly weeks. But as time passes, hope dwindles. In New York, John Scott, Fox News. Digging. That is what they're doing now in New York City. It is unfortunately too early to know how many people have died at this point, but 
As the mayor put it, it's too many to bear. A handful have been pulled out alive, and that gives the rescuers at least some hope as they work around the clock. Meanwhile, planes remain grounded all over the United States of America. Airports are closed. People are stranded. And the question is, when will the airlines be allowed to get back to business? And when they do, how will air travel change in this country? And now there's word the hijackers who carried out Tuesday's suicide missions got their training right here in the United States. They went to flight schools in Florida. There's news about that. We'll have it for you. And also news of five people being detained. Good evening, everybody, or good morning, rather. This is Fox's continuous coverage of America's Nightmare in New York City and in Washington, D.C. I'm Lori Dew. And I'm Rick Fulbaum. Obviously, it is day two of what has been absolutely a national and international disaster. There is evidence the death toll in the World Trade Center attacks could be in the thousands, as New York City Mayor Rudy Giuliani said earlier today. That is where our team coverage begins, near Ground Zero in New York City with our own David Lee Miller. Laurie, it's a little after 1 in the morning here on the East Coast, on the lower, uh, in lower Manhattan, and uh, rescue workers are still very much on the scene, and they're going to remain on the scene. There is still a great deal of work here to do. As for statistics, we do not have a precise number now of the expected fatalities, but as you mentioned, it is expected to be well into the thousands. Mayor Giuliani, in fact, has requested of the federal government that they provide to the city six thousand body bags that to supplement the supply of body bags that are now on hand as for survivors as you mentioned again this is almost day two since the tragedy we have reports now that there are only nine survivors that the authorities have been able to locate under the rubble one story especially miraculous the story of john mclaughlin he is a port authority police officer he was on the 82nd floor of one of the towers when suddenly the building began to give way he literally rode the debris all the way to the ground his injuries only broken legs and uh, fractured ankles now earlier we had some very tense moments about 5 30 this evening rescue workers police and vehicles were racing down church street away from the site of the world trade center there was concern that uh, a number of buildings here could collapse buildings that uh, were seriously damaged and st suffered structural damage after the blast of the twin towers some of the eyewitnesses says windows began to pop out and cracks began to appear in the structures we were broadcasting live a few blocks closer to the uh, towers suddenly in the midst of our broadcast the police unplugged our microphones and cameras told us to move it was too dangerous and we relocated to the position we're in now we have since learned that for the most part that appears to be, have been a false alarm. Those buildings, uh, at least for now, are considered safe enough for the uh, rescue workers to have returned to the scene. And here's what's going on right now at the scene. They are digging, they are, uh, digging into, the, into the wreckage. They are using uh, special uh, welding equipment to cut into the steel frame of the Twin Towers. Once they do that with their hands, they are actually taking the debris, worker to worker, placing it in special trucks, dump trucks, that then move up Church Street here all the way to Midtown Manhattan and to a location in New Jersey. The FBI is also examining the debris, what they're looking for, of course, any evidence in particular the black boxes that belong to the two jetliners that smashed into the towers. Now, as you might expect, the relatives and friends of the victims here are still very much in shock and anguish, still searching for news. We uh, talked to one woman a few hours ago. She identified herself as a high school teacher. We saw her wiping the white ash off of a car here in Lower Manhattan. We asked her, is this your car? And she told us, no, these are my friends. Back to you. All right, David Lee Miller in Lower Manhattan. David, thanks so much. The fire at the Pentagon, meantime, is finally out. And just like in New York, rescue workers are getting ready to go through the rubble. And unfortunately, they'll have to remove some bodies there. Fox's Brian Wilson has been there all evening, and he joins us there again from the Pentagon with the latest. Good evening, Brian. Hello, Lori. Hello, Rick. Uh, yes, the, the work continues around the clock here at the Pentagon. You know, we're not having the death toll numbers that you're going to see in New York. Still a grim task at hand. But let's talk about something that was rather patriotic and inspiring. It happened late this afternoon. Workers who have been uh, digging through the rubble here at the Pentagon climbed to the top of the building and unfurled a giant American flag alongside 
the uh, Pentagon. It is a huge flag. You can see it perhaps over my shoulder a moment ago. Uh, and it, this was about maybe 50, 60 yards from the impact crater site. And this all happened as, uh, a matter of fact, the President of the United States was here. The President left the White House. He came over to the Pentagon and uh, spent about an hour, we are told, where he visited with uh, the folks uh, who have been working around the clock to try to clean up this mess, to try to bring this situation under control. Now, the cleanup. It is not a pretty sight at the scene. The, uh, we now believe the death toll to stand at about 80. That number is expected to climb. But we must also tell you that the number that we were banning about yesterday is perhaps going as high as 800 people. That's probably going to be a bit uh, higher than, than a reality. Uh, we are being told now that 100, 150 people are unaccounted for. We can't get precise numbers. Nobody is saying that's, that's all we're going to get. Uh, but uh, they certainly are saying that the number 800 would be an absolute disastrous worst case scenario and they don't expect it actually to climb that high. So we are waiting to, to learn exactly what they can do here. They do not believe there are any survivors. Uh, they have to begin going through the rubble, but there is great concern about the stability of the crash site. They don't want to put the rescue workers at risk given the fact that they actually don't believe there is anyone there to be rescued. I'm Brian Wilson at the Pentagon. Back to you, Lori Rick. Brian, of course, the scene is also a crime scene. What is being done to preserve whatever evidence might be available there? Brian Wilson? I believe we've lost Brian Wilson, but we'll be checking back with him throughout the night. We're going to move on now to some other news and investigators who say that they know the identities of more than a dozen men who hijacked the four planes. The suspects leaving a trail up and down the East Coast. Fox's Todd Connor has been following the story for us tonight. He joins us now from Fox Central. Hi, Todd. What can you tell us about this? Hi, Rick and Lori. Well, the FBI believes anywhere from three to six hijackers were on each of the four planes that were taken over on Tuesday, and they're looking for others who may have helped these hijackers kill the thousands of innocent Americans. The FBI believes they may find some of their answers in Boston on Wednesday. Agents with shields, bulletproof vests, stormed Boston's Weston Hotel. Three people were taken into custody, but then those three people were later released. As we all know, two of the flying bombs that struck the World Trade Center came out of Boston's Logan International Airport, an airport which is now beefing up security. Tow trucks busy moving 2,000 cars from a parking garage there where authorities found a rental car possibly left behind by the hijackers. They confirmed it contained Arabic language flight training manuals and the Boston Globe reports it had an instruction video on flying commercial airlines and a fuel consumption calculator. Meanwhile, 400 FBI agents in Florida are checking at a few flight training schools, including Embry-Riddle Flight Training School, trying to determine if the killer pilots got their training there. We are cooperating with the FBI and other law enforcement officials. We are quickly responding to each and every request. All right, a former employee at another flight training school in Venice, Florida, says FBI agents told him that the car that was found at Logan International Airport was connected to two former students at that school. Meanwhile, Fox News has learned that two weeks ago, an American air, I should say two, several months ago, let me clarify that, several months ago, an American Airlines crew had their hotel rooms broken into when they're in Rome, Italy. Stolen were their pilots' uniforms and their IDs. And now, two weeks ago, American sent out a memo to its employees to be on the lookout for, quote, imposter pilots. So... Is that how these hijackers got aboard by posing as pilots? That could be the case possibly for the American flights, but there were two United flights as well that crashed. So these are the latest details coming to us now. Back to you, Lori and Rick. All right, Todd Connor reporting from Fox Central. Thanks very much. Now, United Flight 93 is the plane that crashed into Pennsylvania, and there is word that some of the passengers 
on that plane may have taken on the hijackers before that plane went down. They might have even known about the events that had taken place earlier in the morning at the World Trade Center. One of the victims actually called his wife on his cell phone, told her that they were being attacked. Then she told him what had happened at the World Trade Centers. He called her back later to say he and some of the other passengers were planning to act. Now, they may have acted against the hijackers, but of course, we may never know for sure. He was not the only passenger who made a last-minute call. As terrorists took over four flights Tuesday, passengers and crew members used cell phones to reach out with urgent cries for help, with information for authorities, or with last-second words of love for family members. Mark Bingham was aboard United Flight 93, which had left Newark for San Francisco. He reached family members at home. He just said, I want to let you all know that I love you very, very much in case I don't see you again. I said that. That the plane has been taken over by hijackers. And, um, and then I said, well, we love you very much too, Mark. Let me go get your mother. An unidentified man hiding in a bathroom aboard Flight 93 dialed 911 on his cell phone to reach a dispatcher outside Pittsburgh. We are being hijacked. We are being hijacked. This is not a joke, he said, before his phone went dead. Aboard the same flight, Laura and Grand Colas, on her way home to San Francisco from her grandmother's funeral in New Jersey, was able to reach her husband, Jack. We have been hijacked, she told him. They are being kind. I love you. Flight attendant C.C. Ross of Fort Myers, Florida, put through a panicked call to her husband, Lauren Lyles, who had just gotten their two sons off to school. He heard screams in the background as she told him, We've been hijacked. I love you. I love the children. Still on Flight 93, Thomas Burnett called his wife, Dina, and told her of a final act of resistance to terror. I know we're all going to die. There's three of us who are going to do something about it, he said. Flight 93 was the only plane that didn't reach its target, crashing into an empty field in southern Pennsylvania. Peter Hansen of Groton, Massachusetts, was aboard United Flight 175 with his wife and their three-year-old daughter as it left Boston for Los Angeles. He reached his father in Connecticut. Hansen told his parents he knew they were all going to die, but he tried to reassure them. Don't worry about us. It's going to be quick, Hansen told his father. United Flight 175 was the second plane to crash into the World Trade Center. Fox News commentator Barbara Olson was aboard American Airlines Flight 77 as it left Washington for Los Angeles. She was able to place two calls to her husband, Theodore Olson, the U.S. Solicitor General. Our plane is being hijacked. She then asked, what should I tell the pilot? The call was cut off, but she immediately called back to ask again, what should I tell the pilot? Those were her final words as minutes later, American Flight 77 became a massive missile and crashed into the Pentagon. Steve Brown, Fox News. President Bush working with Congress on legislation authorizing military retaliation. He is vowing to spend, quote, whatever it takes. Joining us now to analyze the political implications of any kind of retaliation is Jim Pinkerton. He is a columnist with Newsday and a Fox News contributor. Good evening, Jim. It's good to see you. Thanks so much uh, for coming thank, thank you. Well, uh, we have a little bit of breaking news to report. The House has just passed Resolution 4080, uh, voting on terrorist attack. Uh, what do you know about this? And it's really no surprise that they would pass this, is it, Jim? No, and I think it's actually a sort of uh, 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 not even a formality. It's yeah. a little unnecessary. I mean, I mean, plenty of presidents, including President Clinton, uh, including President Bush, uh, this President Bush, have ordered strikes. Um, when they thought it was necessary. Uh, obviously, this strengthens the president's hand uh, in terms of diplomacy and, and, and military action. Uh, but it just shows, I guess, just uh, how united the country is right now. But, so really, it was just kind of a formality more than anything? I, I think so. I mean, I mean, clearly, a lot's going to change. I mean, the, the number of, of $20 billion of special appropriations to, to deal with damage and and counterterrorism uh, is being thrown around. I can mm -hmm. see easily how they could spend uh, twenty billion dollars just on, 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 you know, rewards to, to awards to, to families and so on. But I was just sitting here w listening and making lists of things in terms of domestic issues. In terms of, I mean, foreign policy aside. I mean, we will go after Osama bin Laden if he's the guilty person. And my, my hunch would be that you know he'll be dead or in prison. 
um, you know, within the year, right. uh, just because he's so hot. I mean, even the Taliban seems to think that he's a little too much for them to, to, to keep around right now. And again, not only was it valuable for the U.S. Congress to do what it did today or yesterday, um, but also the, the NATO uh, to, mm -hmm. to join in like that. And it's clear that this has been such a des despicable and outrageous act that all the civilized nations of the, of the world are, are going to uh, join in. So the president is getting support, obviously, here at home. He has said he wants $20 billion, right. vowing to spend whatever it takes. We're hearing that the NATO nations say, if you attack one of us, you attack all of us, which is really what America needs to hear right now, isn't it? That's right. And, and, I mean, President Bush, this President Bush, not unlike his father, has been, I think, good about getting on the phone with foreign leaders. And, and uh, all day we've been hearing, you know, President Chirac of France called and President Putin of Russia called, I think, twice. Uh, uh, so that's, 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 that's very reassuring. But obviously there's a lot. The problem we're going to have is that the, the essence of all this, of this terrorism is not a, 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 a terrorist strike that requires a massive logistical infrastructure of like an army. This is, you know, according to your report, uh, you know, t 12 or maybe 24, you know, nuttily, crazily kamikaze people who obviously had a lot of planning and premeditation, but they weren't taking off from a base someplace. They would just, you know, quit their jobs as cab drivers or whatever and then got in an airplane and, and, and killed 10,000 people. So the, the, the problem we're really going to have is, is what we do here at home about issues like air traffic control. I mean, it is amazing to me uh, that in the most densely uh, traveled air corridors, including over Manhattan and also over Washington with all the sensitive facilities here, that they could be flying around airplanes uh, uh, off course sort of almost seemingly in, in, in erratic directions, and nobody seemed to notice, and that they could even crash an airplane into the, 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 the headquarters of the, of the U.S. military. I mean, Hi, if Jim. That doesn't Hi, Jim. It's Rick Fulbaum. Good morning. Right. So you're talking about um, what's going to happen here domestically. What about flights that are still grounded? We heard from the Secretary of Transportation today. He said he doesn't have a date. He can't tell us exactly when civil aviation is going to get back online and, uh, and, and the airline business is going to get back to normal uh, or at least get back to business. I mean, when, when would it be appropriate for, for airports to start opening up again and people to start getting on airplanes again? It would be appropriate when they have the, the sort of security that would uh, make people feel safe. Uh, if you've ever flown El Al, uh, the Israeli airline, uh, uh, you know, they, they they take you into a, a little room and just ask you questions and kind of frisk you if they feel like it. Uh, and they don't have much problem uh, with this sort of uh, hijacking and, and, and so on. And, and we do. All these, again, the Fox News has been reporting, you know, FAA investigators were able to infiltrate, you know, what was it, 68% of the time uh, a couple years ago. And again, it, it's amazing that, that those kind of statistics came into existence and, and nobody did anything about them. Uh, that won't happen again. I suspect that, that Transportation Secretary Mineta is going to say, look, I'm not going to allow this to happen while I'm Transportation Secretary, and we'll just take our time until we bring in enough security guards and, 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 and analysts and so on to get to the bottom of this. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to make air travel a slow but hopefully safer process uh, probably forever now. But Jim, you're talking about El Al and you're talking about Israel, where there is a totally different kind of mentality. Uh, amongst the government and amongst the people. We are Americans and we are not used to this kind of thing. I mean, how long is it going to take for people not just uh, in New York City and in Washington, D.C., uh, where people have been hit hardest by these attacks, but people in the middle of the country to begin to understand that there are going to be serious changes taking place uh, when it comes time for them to get onto an airplane? Well, I, I think uh, uh, nothing like watching these photographs, and I suspect Every American has seen these pictures, these horrible, grim pictures now for, you know, a couple hundred times in the last uh, uh, 36 hours or so. So, I, I mean, it's clearly going to be a, a cultural change. You're going to see all, a lot of these issues that became extremely uh, 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 argumentative here in Washington, like, for example, uh, surveillance of the Internet, surveillance of, of telephones, the, the so-called uh, echelon system that, that allegedly monitors uh, uh, transatlantic phone calls, this, this thing they call carnivore, 
uh, which keeps track of, of the FBI had to keep track of the Internet. Mm -hmm. uh, these have been incredibly controversial, and the government has sort of backed off on a lot of these security measures. I suspect, again, the polls I was seeing earlier tonight on Fox of, you know, 86% think we're at war and so on. Those are the kind of numbers that will ju justify significant changes in some of these domestic issues. Again, I, I come back to immigration as, as one. Uh, as we identify who these people are and we figure out, you know, when they came here, uh, not to say that there's anything wrong with immigrants per se, but just the reality that if these people came here recently and, 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 and killed a bunch of Americans, uh, we can't have that. Uh, uh, that'll change Jim. too. Jim, final question. We've only got about 30 seconds left. At some point, the hurt that everybody's feeling is going to give way to anger, and I think it already is. Um, the American people are going to at some point say, hey, whoever did this, Osama bin Laden or whoever, let's get him, let's get him good, right? I think that'll, I think that'll probably happen. I think uh, that he, but the, the issue will be the next terrorist after him. That's the, that's the thing we have to concentrate on uh, as policymakers. All right, Jim Pinkerton with Newsday and a Fox News contributor. Thanks for coming in tonight. We Thank really you. do appreciate it. Thanks, Jim. A few trigger-happy gas stations around the country are now quietly lowering their prices after panicking and jacking up the prices on Tuesday. That's right. We saw some gouging going on yesterday, and it wasn't just the gas station owners. Plenty of folks topped off their tanks, whether they needed to or not. Alicia Acuna has the story. Temporary price hikes generated by fears that the terrorist attacks on the United States may prompt a surge in gas prices sent anxious Americans out in droves on Tuesday to fill up their tanks. I heard Wichita is 450, Blue Springs is four dollars. In uh, southeast, I've heard it's six dollars a gallon. So uh, <laughs> I can't even think about that. Well, I heard it was going up to seven dollars a gallon in Texas. Although some gas stations argued their price increases were the result of supply and demand, this was the exception rather than the rule. Oil and gas analysts say there are no indications that the price of oil is going up due to the attacks on the East Coast. Uh, anybody who thinks that they can go out and raise the price and, uh, and have it uh, hold for very long is kidding themselves, in addition to being unpatriotic. Under threat of prosecution, gas stations that were gouging customers quickly dropped their prices back to normal. What's more, OPEC released a statement assuring consumers that all member countries remain committed to continuing their policy of strengthening market stability. Further reassurance came from the nation's largest oil company, ExxonMobil, asking all its customers to maintain their normal buying habits as they are trying to avoid an artificial shortage. Industry officials say an artificial shortage would come about if everyone ran out and filled their tanks at the same time. This would drain supplies and then prices would go up. In Denver, Alicia Acuna, Fox News. So the effects of Tuesday's terror attacks affecting world financial markets. The overseas markets will be open Thursday, today, but the U.S. stock market is going to be closed until at least Friday, probably even Monday. Joining us now with a look at the economic fallout from this attack, we are joined by our senior business correspondent, Brenda Butner. Hi, Brenda. Thanks so much. Well, you know, the last few days have felt like a year, haven't they? They sure have. Um, and in fact, it's only been since last Monday that we last heard the opening bell. Um, and it looks like the opening bell is going to ring again, perhaps on Friday, most likely on Monday. This is the longest time that we have ever gone without stock trading, unscheduled stock trading since the Great Depression, so it's been quite some time. And Wall Street officials are quite anxious to get that opening bell ringing again because they see it as a symbol of defiance against terrorism. The chairman of the New York Stock Exchange said it quite well when he said they can attack infrastructure, but they cannot attack ideals. They, cannot, they can take down buildings, but they cannot take down a fair, free market. So there may be some glitches um, there, there is huge infrastructure that's involved in, in, the, um, in the area, which is essentially a war zone in, in um, South Manhattan. But everyone is very anxious to get it going. Tomorrow, the bond market actually opens. Um, and it's expected that we may see some buying in bonds. There's usually a flight to quality, is what it's called, a flight to more safe instruments other than stocks. So we'll be looking for that. But uh, the overseas markets have been um, amazingly stable tonight, except with the exception of Thailand, Malaysia, and Taiwan, which did not open last night. So everybody took a big shock last night, and now they're stabilizing, as are the uh, currency markets. So everybody's waiting, uh, hopefully, for, to see what will happen in the U.S. market. So many of the companies, Brenda, that are traded on the stock exchange were based in the World yes. Trade Center towers. 
I'm just wondering about the psyche of the people uh, who do business down on Wall Street and how they'll be able to get themselves psychologically prepared to get back in there and get back to business. Well, it's not only psychologically, it's actually physically getting the people back into the NYSE, which is in, literally was in the shadow of the World Trade Center and is an icon of Wall Street um, itself, so that there was great concern that it itself might be a target. But yes, psychologically, this is very, very difficult, and, and many of the people whom I interview on a regular basis are still unaccounted for. It's very difficult for all of us, um, you know, the thousands of people who, who are yet unaccounted for. Very, very difficult for the entire community. Uh, I know I've got some friends who work at Morgan Stanley, and I know a lot of Morgan St uh, businesses like Morgan Stanley, other businesses, are based in the World Trade Center. Some are being accounted for. There's going to be a lot of loss of life and a lot of loss of paper. Yes. Sheer paperwork. And we're talking about billions of dollars here. and just so much that's going to be lost. Yes, records, um, computer files. We have yet to see, I think, exactly what will happen when that opening bell rings. We will have to see um, you know, how many glitches there actually are. But I think, again, officials are quite anxious to, to get it going. We're trying to get back to business as usual as a um, slap, basically, to the terrorists who, who tried to take it out. Saying they can't stop us, they can't stop our markets. Absolutely. All right, senior correspondent Brenda Butner, it's great to have you staying up late with us Absolutely. tonight. Absolutely, thank you. Thanks, Brenda. President Bush says the attacks against America, not just acts of terrorism, he says they were acts of war. He says the U.S. is ready to face its enemy. Just completed a meeting with our national security team, and we've received the latest uh, intelligence updates. The deliberate and deadly attacks which were carried out yesterday against our country were more than acts of terror. They were acts of war. This will require our country to unite in steadfast determination and resolve. Freedom and democracy are under attack. The American people need to know we're facing a different enemy than we have ever faced. This enemy hides in shadows and has no regard for human life. This is an enemy who preys on innocent and unsuspecting people, then runs for cover. But it won't be able to run for cover forever. This is an enemy that tries to hide, but it won't be able to hide forever. This is an enemy that thinks its harbors are safe, but they won't be safe forever. This enemy attacked not just our people, but all freedom-loving people everywhere in the world. The United States of America will use all our resources to conquer this enemy. We will rally the world. We will be patient, we'll be focused, and we'll be steadfast in our determination. This battle will take time and resolve, but make no mistake about it, we will win. The federal government and all our agencies are conducting business, but it is not business as usual. We are operating on heightened security alert. America is going forward, and as we do so, we must remain keenly aware of the threats to our country. Those in authority should take appropriate precautions to protect our citizens. But we will not allow this enemy to win the war by changing our way of life or restricting our freedoms. This morning I am sending to Congress a request for emergency funding authority so that we are prepared to spend whatever it takes to rescue victims, to help the citizens of New York City and Washington DC respond to this tragedy and to protect our national security. I want to thank the members of Congress for their unity and support. America is united. The freedom-loving nations of the world stand by our side. This will be a monumental struggle of good versus evil. But good will prevail. Thank you very much. 
And we want to take you now back down to lower Manhattan, where rescue workers continue to dig at the site where the World Trade Center towers once stood. David Lee Miller is joining us. He has been, uh, and he continues to join us from downtown, where that search is taking place. Hi, David. Hi there, Rick. A very difficult situation was made even more tense a few hours ago when the uh, Southerly Tower, parts of that further collapsed. Also, there were reports that two other buildings adjacent to the World uh, Trade uh, Towers were going to give way. Some of the workers there said the windows began to pop out. They noticed cracks in the structure that had been weakened. And suddenly we found that uh, workers, emergency crews equipment was uh, being brought down uh, Church Street, which is now where we are located, away from the site uh, for a while. Some of the workers began to run in the opposite direction from the area where the um, towers once stood. In fact, we were live on the air. Police pulled the plug literally on our cameras and microphones and relocated us to this location where they thought it would be much safer. We have since learned now that uh, for the most part that was a false alarm. The uh, buildings they thought were teetering that could give way show no signs of doing that at least in the near future and most of the workers have returned to the scene. The rescue operation is now continuing. They do however face a very difficult and gruesome task. In fact earlier we talked to a volunteer doctor who has been here. He in fact uh, treated four of the survivors and he said that uh, the scene about 10 blocks from where I am now located looks a lot worse than what you see on television. I think it does a disservice to the American people not to have media access right at the scene, as long as it's uh, secure and it doesn't jeopardize any national security, because what you see from far away, the shots that I'm seeing, it does not describe the horrific nature of the trauma, both physically, in terms of life, in terms of uh, psychological trauma, of all the rescue workers, the victims. You have to be up close. It looks like, it looks like a volcano went off, not a bomb. There's ash knee-deep. It's the craziest thing you've ever seen, and the American public needs to see it. They need to see what has been done to this country. I'm not sure that many Americans would like to see, if given the chance, all that devastation up close and personal. It is, according to those we have talked with, very, very disturbing. If this helps put it in perspective. The mayor of the city of New York, Rudy Giuliani, is asking federal officials now for six thousand body bags and that's to supplement the ones that the city already has and further complicating things we are now getting reports that there are asbestos particles in the air caused by the blast of the twin towers and for that reason uh, we are wearing these masks as are the rescue workers all the time because they say there is a serious health risk back to you in the studio all right, David, put your mask on. Thanks for the report. We'll check back with you. More than 200 people remain unaccounted for at the Pentagon. Rescue crews there are hoping to have enough demolition work done by daybreak to enter into that impact area. Fox's David Schuster is live at the Pentagon with the latest. And, David, what is concerning everybody the most right now at the Pentagon? Well, Lori, the greatest concern is simply the structure on the south side of the Pentagon where that American Airlines jetliner crashed into it. Uh, it has been very unstable. It's been described as uh, leaning at a 45-degree angle, some of the walls and beams. And until they can really uh, strengthen that part of the building, it is very unsafe, according to fire and rescue crews, for them to go very far. Uh, the good news, though, is that uh, it's been a totally different scene this evening than it was just 12 hours ago. The fires are completely out. There's not that same sort of... Uh, odor or stench in the air of the burning flames and the burning debris. Uh, furthermore, uh, for the first time now, all the, a, a lot of the lights are on on the north side of the Pentagon, something that was uh, completely dark last night. And you are actually seeing the parking lots uh, filling up with people. So clearly people are back to work at the Pentagon, at least in those areas that were unaffected by either the explosion or the flames or the uh, dumping of hundreds of uh, gallons of water a minute to try to control those flames earlier today. But again, workers describe uh, the structure as being very unstable. Uh, despite that, they have managed to recover some 80 bodies. Uh, there were reports from Arlington fire crews uh, about uh, 15 hours ago that the death toll might rise to as high as 800 because of the number of people that worked on the south side of the Pentagon where the jetliner went in. Uh, but since then, uh, everybody at the Pentagon, including the Secretary of Defense, has tried to dismiss some of those claims. Uh, the Secretary of Defense, Donald Rumsfeld, had a news conference earlier today. Here's part of what he had to say. We currently believe and are certainly hopeful that the number of casualties being reported in the press is high. Uh, as you know from your own observation out there, the work is still going forward. 
and uh, we won't know for some time uh, precise numbers, but uh, from everything that we currently know, the, the estimate that's been widely reported is uh, considerably high. Now, while they are optimistic that the numbers uh, may only go may only go as high as uh, 150, 175, there is not much hope at all here at the Pentagon of finding anybody alive. One of the reasons is because some of the fire and rescue crews have been have been able to drop in listening devices off of some of the baskets they that they essentially lower into the crevice created by that explosion on the side of the Pentagon. Uh, those listening devices, uh, Rick and Lori, have picked up absolutely nothing. David, as far as the Pentagon being the scene of a crime, do they feel like they're going to be able to get any kind of useful evidence or information from the crash site? Right, good question. It's, it's not really clear yet. Earlier today, uh, around noon, we saw lots of FBI agents, in fact, uh, just a, a, f a few hundred yards behind us, uh, sweeping the grounds, looking for any pieces of the plane that might have uh, been exploded back uh, on the impact there. So clearly they're looking for every uh, small piece of evidence they can find. It doesn't appear, at least as far as we can tell, that they've been able to get far enough into the building and the debris to really either look for the black boxes on that jetliner or any other evidence. Uh, but that is something that's, uh, that's on their mind. The FBI has uh, literally uh, dozens of agents on the ground, but all on the grounds, but also inside the building itself. Uh, they're looking hard, uh, but uh, it's hard to tell if they found anything yet. Uh, David, qu another quick question for you. Sure. Uh, a very touching moment earlier today at the Pentagon. President Bush visited the Pentagon, and it was during his trip there that the stars and stripes were proudly unfurled over part of the roof of the Pentagon. That's right. That's actually the, uh, the second or third time uh, they, they've done that. There were lower flags, that uh, there were smaller flags that were lowered on the Pentagon last night and again early this morning. But uh, somebody apparently brought that giant sized flag and they decided that before the president came that the firefighters to sort of show their symbolism of, of, of the effort that they're doing uh, uh, drape the flag. It's worth pointing out to Rick and Lloyd that uh, a lot of talk radio stations in Washington, the Washington area, are actually encouraging people to fly their flags. And so when we're coming in uh, from, uh, from Georgetown tonight, uh, parts of Arlington, you can see a lot of homes now in the area have flags that are flying, a lot of buildings, there's a lot of signs made. There was some uh, a handwritten sign that said, uh, rest in peace, uh, sir, uh, those who were killed. That, that sort of thing we're seeing pop up all over the Washington area. So maybe not so much of a surprise that some of the rescue workers would, uh, would fly a flag uh, themselves. All right, David Schuster reporting live from the Pentagon. Thanks very much. We just wanted to point out that the pictures that you were looking at were from New York City down in lower Manhattan where the exhausted rescue recovery crews continue to dig hour after hour. And well, there, we get another live picture. Investigators say that they know the identities of more than a dozen men who hijacked those four planes on Tuesday. Apparently, the suspects left a trail up and down the East Coast. Fox's Todd Connor has all the details. He's been following it for us all night. Todd, what's the latest on this? Well, Lori and Rick, a little bit of breaking news here. This uh, coming from an L.A. Times article today. They are saying that authorities searching for these terrorists have actually identified a team of as many as 50 infiltrators who supported or carried out the strikes. This, according to a source familiar with the investigation, telling this to the L.A. Times. The source said about 40 of the men have been accounted for, including those killed in the suicide attacks. And they are looking for 10 others who may have helped kill thousands of innocent Americans. Now, the FBI believes they may find some of their answers in Boston Wednesday nights, or Wednesday, rather, agents with shields and bulletproof vests stormed Boston's Weston Hotel. Three people were taken into custody at that time. They were later released. Two of the flying bombs, as we all know, that struck the Trade Center came out of Boston's Logan International Airport, an airport which is now beefing up their security. Tow trucks have moved 2,000 cars from a parking garage, where authorities also found a rental car, possibly left behind by the hijackers. They confirmed it contained Arabic-language flight training manuals and the Boston Globe reports. It also had an instructional video on flying commercial airlines and a fuel consumption calculator. Now, 400 FBI agents in Florida are checking out a few flight training schools down there, including Embry-Riddle, as you see right there. They're trying to determine if the killer pilots got their training at that school. We are cooperating with the FBI and other law enforcement officials. We are quickly responding 
to each and every request. Also, back to this article from the L.A. Times, uh, they report that in the hours after the assaults, agents searching cars and apartments up and down the East Coast found suicide notes in New York that some of the hijackers wrote for their parents. This coming from a story out of the L.A. Times. Also, I should report that our Brett Baer has reported that uh, a few months ago, an American Airlines crew had their room broken into in Rome, Italy, and that their their uniforms and their IDs had been stolen. Well, a couple of a weeks ago, American Airlines sent out a memo to its people reporting or asking them to be on the lookout for imposter pilots. No word if they had any connection with this particular attack on us, but that's the latest from here. Lori and Rick, back to you. Todd, thanks very much. So many questions on a lot of people's minds, including how do terrorists learn to fly commercial airplanes? We just heard a little bit about those schools that they might have attended right here in the United States of all places. And of course we know that the traffic in the air has been completely stopped. No planes or very few planes are being allowed to take off and land. And the question is, when will the skies be open for business again? Joining us now on the telephone is former NTSB investigator and former FAA scientist, Dr. Alan Deal. Dr. Deal, thanks very much for talking to us. Glad to, glad to be here. Obviously uh, the circumstances are rather traumatic and tragic. They sure are. Let's talk first of all about some changes that are going to have to take place immediately uh, in the commercial airlines business. What do you see happening and how quickly is it going to happen? Well, clearly the, the Secretary of Transportation, uh, Mr. Mineta, is looking at what needs to be done. I think that's one of the reasons why they're continuing to hold the aircraft on the ground. As we all know, they talked about lifting the the ban or the grounding uh, today at noon, and they decided not to do that. I suspect, uh, obviously, the, the ground boarding defense uh, mechanisms will be beefed up uh, immensely. They may uh, have to change the so-called psychological profiles of uh, the types of people they're looking for. Uh, those, by the way, had been uh, curtailed somewhat because of uh, uh, allegations of, uh, of uh, racial profiling. Racial profiling, I guess, is the best word. Uh, but they've served us in, in good stead over the decades. And, uh, Tell us what you mean by that. You're talking about the kind of people that the airlines supposedly look for before they get on the airplane? Exactly. Uh, if you remember, after the, I guess it was the Mariel boat lift, uh, there were a number of Cubans that uh, wanted to go back to Cuba. There was a, a, a rash of hijackings. And, of course, they, what they did is if they saw people that fit that general description, they didn't necessarily deny them boarding, but they singled them out for uh, a lot of additional searches. Uh, and... Uh, 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 they were uh, at high, uh, a heightened degree of vigilance if they fit the profile. Obviously, the, the details of the profile are, are classified, but uh, I'm not sure they're still using those because of the allegations of racial profiling, uh, you know, in recent months, I guess. Mr. Deal, um, obviously the big question is how on earth could this have happened? How could four hijackings have taken place? Everyone's saying this was a well-coordinated attack. It had been planned for months, et cetera, et cetera. But couldn't re this really just be a few guys with piloting experience, a knife, and a willingness to die? Well, uh, I, you know, I think all the evidence suggests to, uh, uh, that there was a major conspiracy. Uh, for example, just taking flying lessons. Everybody's talking about these Florida flying schools. Those are quite expensive. And the fact, if it does prove that, the, as the facts do prove out, that they were uh, in training down there, this suggests somebody must have been funding these individuals. Can and anyone take this kind of training? Oh, absolutely. It's very expensive, is, is my point. And uh, so somebody had to be sponsoring it. And if, there's, if it turns out there's several of these uh, pilot hijackers were, in fact, uh, being trained down there, that would suggest that there must be some coordination going on. I think the other thing that everybody has pointed to is the timing. I believe that two of the hijackings took place uh, approximately 50 seconds apart. So this, this suggests a very well-coordinated well procedure. And another thing that I do think that will have to change uh, is the training that the air crews get, both the cockpit crews and the cabin crews, the pilots and the flight attendants, on how you deal with hijackers. Uh, up until yesterday, the basic procedure was is to cooperate with them, take them where they want to go, let the FBI deal with this. Of course, no one had faced this kind of hijacking in the States, at least not to my knowledge. So uh, uh, obviously they, the, the crews probably had no clue and were, in fact, probably following procedures uh, on how, they, uh, how we previously worked with hijackers. And of course, the whole idea is to prevent 
any harm to the passengers. Uh, no one knew that uh, you know the hijackers were intent on killing all the passengers. So it may well be that uh, uh, we'll have to re-examine uh, those kind of that kind of training. And another thing that I do know was proposed in the past was uh, actually uh, armoring or bulletproofing the cabin door, uh, actually redesigning it such that it would prevent anybody from gaining forced entry to the cockpit uh, in flight. Uh, that suggestion was dropped because of the fact that we uh, have a lot more crashes than we do hijacking. And of course, if you did that, it'd be difficult to rescue the pilots uh, in a crash situation. So all these things are going to have to be reexamined uh, in light of what's happened yesterday. And what about the willingness, Dr. Deal, of the airlines to go along with these uh, changes or these recommendations? I mean, are they going to have to be forced to do this? And is it going to cost money to do it? And who's going to pay for all of it? Well, well obviously, the, the traveling public, you and I, are going to uh, pay the uh, increased uh, ticket cost to do this. I, uh, I'm not the right guy to ask. Obviously, the airline executives and the Air Transport Association. But you've worked with the airlines. How willing are they to adopt changes uh, when the NTSB, when the FAA say, look, this is something you need to do? Well, I, in general, they, they always look at the cost of this. And, and up until yesterday, uh, I guess the, the cost accountants for the airlines uh, decided this probably wasn't worth doing. And as far as I know, the FAA has not, in recent months, imposed uh, a, a, a significant increase in the security measures. Obviously, everything changed yesterday. But uh, my guess is uh, you'll find the executives of the airlines willing to, uh, to invest in, uh, in greater security and, and quickly. Let's talk for a moment about the so-called black boxes, the cockpit voice recorder and the flight data recorder. How difficult do you think it's going to be to recover these boxes from the New York and Pentagon sites? And is it going to be more likely that they are able to find these boxes at the Pennsylvania crash site? You'd think that the, uh, the Pennsylvania site would be far and away the easiest site. Uh, we, I don't know much about the angle of impact, but uh, the, the, the so-called black boxes are highly survivable. The problem, uh, particularly in the World Trade Center, is uh, the fact that they're literally buried under hundreds and thousands of tons of debris. Uh, I'm not sure. I was watching people remove some of that debris with uh, shovels and stuff, and I, I assume that somebody has instructed the recovery workers on what these boxes look like. Obviously, uh, they'll be very important, and uh, particularly the one from, uh, from Pennsylvania. You, you, you were, there's a lot of discussion about the alternate target. I think uh, uh, if they uh, did survive, and they certainly should be uh, locatable in, in, in uh, Pennsylvania, they, ought to provide, uh, they may provide some clues. Now, the other thing, these guys were significant enough, or sophisticated enough to shut down the transponders, so they may have been sophisticated enough to pull a so-called circuit breaker uh, that controls the uh, the cockpit voice recorder. If they did that, the boxes will be useless. But if not, uh, they could provide uh, uh, some important clues uh, for, on the targeting. We've all heard rumors that uh, that perhaps the Pentagon was not the target uh, initial target for the Washington-bound aircraft. And uh, again, if uh, if they recover the, the the cockpit voice recording box from the Pentagon, perhaps we'll we'll hear a discussion as to just what that target initially was. But there's no guarantee, is there? Uh, absolutely not. And as I said, if, if they did pull the, the circuit breaker or shut down, you can shut right. these the boxes down in flight. If they were sophisticated enough to shut down other pieces of electronics, maybe they knew enough to shut this down. And that'll be unfortunate if, uh, if that happened. Well, maybe luck will be on everybody's side in this case. Uh, Let's hope so, Laurie. All right. Alan Deal, former NTSB investigator and FAA scientist, thanks very much for taking the time to talk with us. You're certainly welcome. Well, as you just heard Dr. Deal say, as investigators search through the rubble in New York City and in Pennsylvania, one of their goals is to find that cockpit voice and data recorder. The so-called black boxes, which we talked about a moment ago, they could hold the key to a lot of unanswered questions. So what exactly are they and why are they so valuable? The so-called black boxes are actually fluorescent orange, and by airline regulations, nothing else can be this color on any commercial aircraft. There are usually two boxes in each flight. Investigators consider both to be essential because one records cockpit conversations and sounds, the other records technical data. The flight recorder is very good at telling us what's wrong with the airplane, things that are actually, you know, engine quit, uh, landing gear didn't come down, something like that. Something that actually has to do with the airplane, that's the flight recorder's strong point. 
voice recorder is very good at, at this operational, the, the man-machine interface, the crew, and how they interact with the airplane uh, and decisions that they make. The recorders are usually located in the back of a jet. That's because the most predictable point of impact in a crash is towards the front. Still, the boxes are made to withstand forces 10 times greater than a crash and temperatures higher than those caused by burning fuel. Most of the cockpit voice recorders and flight recorders that we get uh, look just like this. They look probably as good as the day they were made, maybe a few scratches and a few dents. Uh, every once in a while, we will get a recorder that, that has been uh, smashed. If it has been smashed in water, that is usually not a problem. Recorders retrieved from the ocean are kept in ocean water until investigators examine them. It's the air that hurts the tape once it's been wet. It actually, it will start to rust. So we have them shipped here in water, and uh, then as soon as we're ready to play them, we take them out of the water, dry them off, and then get a good copy of it before anything starts to deteriorate. We have had recorders uh, underwater for upwards of six and seven years, and uh, the, they're just fine. The flight data recorder, which tracks the technical and mechanical information, comes in two different formats. The first is a tape-based recorder, which gathers data on a 30-minute loop. The second format records data on computer chips and can compile more than 25 hours' worth of flight information. It all comes out as numbers, calculations, or technical words and bits. It's actually a waveform that, that is then, it's zeros and ones that our software decodes into numbers and then we can bring it up on the screen and see altitude and airspeed and different flight control positions and pitch and roll and, and what the aircraft is actually doing. It looks like a strip chart with the lines moving across the screen. At this station, flight data recorder specialist Cassandra Johnson examines a tape-based recorder. She has downloaded the data and her computer software has made the conversions. We're reading it out, we're getting good data, we have a graph of the incident or accident and we will pass it along to the investigator so that they can see what the recorder is telling them about the aircraft and the most important part is, is for them to focus on a certain systems. What the recorder is telling them is not always easy to picture. So the safety board sometimes generates a data-based animation to help explain what happened. This one is from a 1999 American Airlines crash. An MD-82 was coming into land at the airport in Little Rock, Arkansas. It was almost midnight, as you can see by the time up here. There were storms in the area, and the aircraft landed on the runway, um, proceeded to skid around on the runway, and then went off the end of the runway. Uh, down an embankment, impacted a steel structure, and 11 people, including the pilot, were, were killed. In that particular crash, investigators were also helped by the cockpit voice recorder. It revealed the pilots knew about the storms, but thought they had a clear path down the runway. And approach American 420, I know you're doing your best, but we're getting pretty close to the storm. We'll keep it tight we have to. Cockpit voice recorders give investigators a good idea of what the crew was doing when the incident happened. It can also paint a personal picture of despair and confusion. Sometimes the crew doesn't have any idea of what's going wrong. They don't have any more idea than, than we do uh, what's, what's going wrong with the airplane. They may say things that are just completely not right because from the information that they have, um, you know, that's their analysis of that information. And, and it's, it's very difficult sometimes to do that on the fly when things are really going badly. Vern Ellingstad is director of the Office of Research and Engineering at the NTSB. He says the safety board learns something new from every incident or crash. Aviation accidents are a very rare event. It's a very safe form of transportation. And the predictability of what might go wrong in each of these kind of rare you know, circumstances is very difficult. So we, we do, uh, you know, recover a, a, a huge amount of important information. Some safety experts believe it is not enough, and already the NTSB is considering whether recorders should have their own power supplies. In the crash of a Swiss air jet, the last six minutes were not on the data recorder because of an electrical problem in the plane. The safety board is also thinking about placing video cameras in the cockpit. Still, investigators believe that nothing provides as much information as the so-called black boxes. They are the key, say the experts, to piecing together what happened. In Washington, David Schuster, Fox News. It is almost 2 a.m. on the East Coast, and still there is new information that continues to come in on this story. We want to show you a picture of the L.A. Times website. And look at that man on the left-hand side. He may be 
And this may be the very first picture of one of the pilots who commandeered, hijacked one of those planes uh, that, that uh, caused so much despair and devastation. His name is Amanullah Atta Mohammed, and this is a man who apparently paid $10,000 to go to a flight school, the Huffman Aviation International Flight School, down in Venice, Florida, a story that we've been telling you about throughout the day. And the Huffman School is one of three flight schools in Florida that the FBI has been looking into. They've been asking for information about the students who are passengers, and apparently, according to the LA Times, this man who you're looking at, Amanullah Atta Mohammed, paid $10,000, along with another fella, to attend this Huffman International Flight School. And apparently, according to one of the folks who works there, he came in literally through the front door and claimed to be an Afghani citizen who entered this country from Germany. That is the claim. Now, Rudy Deckers, who is the owner of Huffman Aviation International, again, based in Venice, Florida, said, uh, quote, and this is according to the L.A. Times, they said they were not happy uh, with another flight school, and so they obtained their licenses here and left and they went to South Florida for jet training. He says they were normal students and worked very hard. They lived nearby and bicycled here every day. Decker said that one of the two men said he wanted to learn to fly jumbo jets. That is a picture of Amanullah Atta Mohammed, and uh, apparently he paid $10,000 along with another man to go to a flight school down in South Florida called Huffman Aviation, and this picture again comes to you from the LA Times. All right, we'll continue to follow this story and all the angles for you, but first we want to talk to you about the way that America's responded to this tragedy because uh, it, it really has been remarkable. It has been. People talk about the spirit, the triumph of the human spirit, people pulling together. We're certainly seeing that in New York and in Washington and in really all over the country. John Dupree has more. Once the jewels of New York's skyline, the World Trade Center towers stood up against terrorism long enough to save countless lives. The plane came through, it took out a few of the exterior columns of the building, and then set off this massive fire with the jet fuel. And fortunately, because of the perimeter tube system of the building, it was able to withstand the initial impact and allow a lot of people to get out. Other buildings would have toppled immediately, but the towers remained upright for nearly an hour, supported on the outside by closely spaced steel columns and struts, and on the inside by a second set of columns designed to bear the load of gravity, a double support system that withstood the crash, but not the raging jet fuel fire. The, the girders or the joists that hold up the floors collapsed, and as those fell to the floor below, they overwhelmed the capacity of that floor, and what we, we had it was what we call a progressive collapse, which then continued on through the base of the building until there, uh, it was a complete and total failure. Most experts say tall buildings will continue to be made out of steel. What may change, they say, is the design of signature skyscrapers, the tallest and most exposed buildings. They may never be built in quite the same way. It's not like we could ever design every building for this scenario, or should we? But after every major earthquake, for example, we change our building codes to improve our practice in the future, and uh, I would expect a similar thing will happen here. One possibility, designs that include more escape routes around the perimeter of the building, as well as in the center. But experts say no building can withstand an attack by a pilot willing to die for a cause. The challenge ahead, simply finding ways to reduce the loss of life. In San Francisco, Claudia Cowan, Fox News. All right, well, we apologize clearly. That was not John Dupree. That was Claudia Cowan reporting. All right. Uh, now let's take a look at the story from John Dupree about the spirit of America. An extraordinary disaster, a remarkable response. It wasn't just New Yorkers lining up around the block to give blood. They'll call you when they're ready. In the first six hours after the attacks, 700,000 Americans volunteered to roll up their sleeves. It's been overwhelming. Uh, you know, the outpouring of love and support from the community is, is really heartfelt. This Red Cross Center has seen record numbers of blood donors. Many realize their blood may not be used by East Coast victims, but it doesn't matter. It could have been me, um, and if, God forbid, it happened here in one of our buildings, I sure hope people in New York would be helping us out as well. I know it's a horrible, horrible thing, but, it, you know, it's 
it's nice to be part of the sort of a community of people who are really willing to help. The crisis has sparked an explosion of patriotism as Americans rally around the flag. Flag and banner, may I help you? This store sold 200 star-spangled banners before noon Wednesday. The United States flag represents freedom, represents the lives that have been lost for our freedom, for our independence. Americans want to do something, anything, to help and to show their support for the victims. But just take 15 seconds starting right now and just a quick moment of silence. 1,500 radio stations went silent at 8.42 a.m., 24 hours after the first plane struck. Churches, synagogues, and mosques report enormous turnout at special worship services. Religious and civic groups are raising countless dollars through money drives, all in response to an act of violence meant to terrorize, but one which in its aftermath seems to have galvanized Americans. In Los Angeles, John Dupree, Fox News. Last time I spoke to her, she told me the plane had gone into the building and she was gonna leave. Then she spoke to my cousin 10 minutes later and she was still in the building, but I know she made it out because she's on the safe list that they have. That was yesterday. We still haven't heard from her. We don't know if she's in the hospital. Um, we just, we just want to know what's going on. I can't talk. Families waiting, hoping, praying for any news about their loved ones while rescue workers are racing against the clock in the fading hope that survivors may still be found among the wreckage that once was the World Trade Center. It's 2 a.m. in the east, 11 p.m. in the west. I'm Rick Fulbaum. And I'm Lori Dew, and thank you so much for joining Fox News' special coverage of the attack on America. We want to give you a recap on all the latest in the terrorist attacks. After threats were called in, the NYPD says that the threat to the Empire State Building, which happened just a few hours ago, is actually a false alarm. Uh, you're looking at a darkened Empire State Building there. But a Port Authority source says that there may be as many as 20,000 dead and injured down near the World Trade Center. We're also learning that just a couple of weeks ago, American Airlines issued a memo to its employees to be on alert for imposter pilots. This after an American Airlines crew had their rooms broken into and only their uniforms and ID badges stolen. The feds are looking into this, saying it may have something to do with the hijackings. And law enforcement officials say the flight manifests from the four hijacked planes have been the most productive avenue so far in tracking down the terrorists and their supporters. But of course, the main focus remains on the search for survivors. Rescue workers continue their hourly vigil, digging through the rubble to try and recover survivors, but mostly victims from Tuesday morning's attacks. Fox team coverage begins now near Ground Zero in New York City with Rick Leventhal. Hi, Rick. Rick, Lori, we have a steady flow of large trucks rolling out of the uh, site here. Uh, many of these trucks loaded with large chunks of debris, steel, rock, that sort of thing. Uh, there's another one going by right now. We can see uh, hanging over the sides chunks of metal and, 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 and pieces of the World Trade Center as it's being removed uh, by heavy equipment in there. And uh, hundreds of workers on site going through that rubble, uh, using torches to, to cut through the steel girders and, and, uh, and trying to separate the large pieces, uh, ensuring that there, there are no um, victims in there, and then picking up those pieces and clearing them out so they can try and get deeper into the pile and hopefully find some more survivors in there. Uh, we're hearing scattered reports that they might uh, actually be getting some kind of cell phone contact from people still trapped in there, uh, unconfirmed reports at this point, I should say. Uh, but certainly the work is continuing here, which is good news because of the fact that the work was suspended late this afternoon after fears erupted that perhaps more buildings might collapse. Three buildings right across the street from the Twin Towers, uh, one Liberty Plaza, the World Financial Center, and 90 West, which is a historic building which was uh, built back in 1907. All three of them showing signs of structural failure. Uh, all three of them uh, concerning people on site uh, that they might in fact collapse. One of them, a, a, an office tower more than 50 stories high, 
I spoke to witnesses who saw one of those buildings swaying, claims to have seen smoke coming from the bottom and the top of that building. And right after the remains of the South Tower collapsed here just after 5 o'clock, and those other buildings began to show signs that they too might come down, hundreds of workers who were on scene uh, literally fled the area. They came running down the street. Police officers pushed everyone back, including the media, uh, clearing the area, trying to make sure that no more people would be hurt out here. Uh, those buildings have not come down yet, uh, but it's still likely or certainly possible that they will. And if they don't fall down, uh, some of them, if not all of them, may be taken down because of fears that they are not structurally sound. Again, the work continuing at the site behind me, uh, a grisly task, a, a monumental task, one that will take uh, a very, very long time to complete. Rick, as you check your pager there, I know that there have been uh, other complications for the rescue workers and actually for, for you as well. There are particles that are flying through the air, uh, debris from the World Trade Center that may, may contain some pretty hazardous stuff. Yeah, we're told there's asbestos in the air out here, and we're, we're all trying to wear our masks as much as possible uh, and still get the job done. Uh, we don't know how thick the asbestos is and, and how great the threat is, but uh, it, it's definitely unpleasant uh, breathing and, and, and just being out here in this air. Uh, most of the workers out here are wearing masks. Some of them are wearing uh, gas masks as well. Rick Leventhal down near Ground Zero. Rick, thanks very much. All right, now let's get an update on the rescue efforts that are going on at the Pentagon. And for that, we go live to Fox's David Schuster, who is standing by with the latest. And uh, David, what is going on there at 2 a.m. Uh, Thursday morning? Well, Lori, they've got a lot of floodlights on the south side of the Pentagon. The effort uh, seems to be to try to shore up some of the beams and some of the supports that are described as incredibly unstable. A number of rescue crews have said that it's uh, simply unsafe to go very far into the crevice that was created by the explosion yesterday. They hope to start going in tomorrow, but in the meantime, they're trying to shore up some of the structure to make it a little safer for the crews to go in. Uh, uh, at dawn, uh, at dusk on Wednesday, some of the firefighters unfurled a giant flag on the south side of the Pentagon. Uh, there had been smaller flags that had been placed over the last uh, 36 hours, but this was intended as a symbol uh, to show that uh, despite all the death and destruction and the damage, uh, that nonetheless uh, they were going to show their pride. Uh, this came, ironically, just a couple of minutes before President Bush came to the Pentagon. The president himself wanted to see some of the destruction and thank a number of the rescue crews for their efforts. The president uh, went one by one, shaking uh, dozens of hands of the crews who have been out here literally uh, 24 hours in a row. Uh, the president uh, stood uh, after shaking some of the hands. He looked at some of the damage himself. He was very solemn, we are told and stared at some of the damage and said that uh, a lot of this made him very angry. Um, by all accounts, it has been rough going for a lot of the fire and rescue crews that are here at the Pentagon. Firefighters describe some of the structural damage as worse than some what some of these same very firefighters saw in Oklahoma City. And the death toll here is expected to be about the same, if not higher. Already, 80 bodies have been pulled out of the wreckage, but they are expecting the death toll eventually to go above 200. There were 64 uh, passengers on that jetliner, and the Pentagon says this evening that there are approximately 150 military and civilians uh, that are missing from the Pentagon. However, things have changed here for the good at the Pentagon. The parking lots were filled this afternoon. Workers have been able to go to the north side of the Pentagon that had been filled with smoke for much of the day, and the lights are on in a great deal uh, of the Pentagon. So while work continues here on the south side, uh, the military establishment uh, getting its act back together uh, in most of, rest of the rest of the building. Rick and Lori. David Schuster reporting live from the Pentagon. Thanks very much, David. Well, investigators remarkably are quickly making headway in identifying the hijackers behind yesterday's terrorist attacks. Fox's Todd Connor is live now down in Fox Central with the details of the extent of this operation. Todd? Yeah, a little bit of uh, late-breaking news for you, too, Rick and Lori. Uh, authorities have now identified a team of as many as 50 people who helped carry out the terrorist attacks on the U.S. The L.A. Times reporting in Thursday's editions that a source familiar with the investigation tells them that 40 of these 50 men have been accounted for, including those who died in the attacks, but that 10 are still on the loose. Now, the man you're about to see here on the video from the L.A. Times website 
Amanula Atta Muhammad is believed to have been enrolled in a Florida flight training school at one time. And according to a detective in the Venice, Florida Police Department, FBI agents identified him as one of the men who flew the hijacked jets. Now, all day, from Florida to Boston, FBI agents armed with guns and search warrants looked for leads into who's behind these attacks. At the Westin Hotel, for instance, as you can see here, three people were taken into custody, but as we were told later, those three people were released. Now, two of the flying bombs that struck the World Trade Center towers came out of Boston's Logan International Airport, an airport which is now beefing up its security. This is where authorities also found a rental car with flight training manuals they believed was left behind by the hijackers. Meanwhile, down in Florida, 400 FBI agents are checking out a few of those flight training schools, including Embry-Riddle, which you see here, trying to determine if the killer pilots got their training there. The man we showed you before, Mr. Muhammad, he apparently had trained at the Huffman Aviation School. So. Right now, police very busy. Again, the L.A. Times reporting that 40 of the 50 men police and authorities believe was involved in these attacks have been accounted for. Ten, according to uh, this story, remain at large. By the way, in the hours immediately after the, after the assaults, they're reporting agents found in cars and apartments up and down the East Coast, they found suicide notes in New York that some of the hijackers wrote for their parents. That, according to the LA Times, pretty dramatic stuff coming out in today's editions. Lori Rick, back to you. All right, Todd Connor, thanks very much. Afghanistan, which is apparently where Osama bin Laden uh, has his hideout, they're bracing for U.S. retaliation there, but it's radical rulers there. The Taliban are still denying that the fugitive terrorist had a hand in the American attacks. Fox's Greg Palcott is live from Pakistan with the latest. And Greg, this is some preliminary information that we're getting in, but wondering if you can comment. Have you heard anything about the Taliban placing Osama bin Laden under house arrest? Yeah, Lori, Rick, uh, we're here in Islamabad, Pakistan, right next to Afghanistan, so we're hearing whatever we can hear from inside Afghanistan. And uh, apparently the Taliban regime is knocking down those reports. There had been reports earlier uh, today that Osama bin Laden and some of his top uh, colleagues had been placed under house arrest by the Taliban regime. Uh, in fact, the Taliban uh, government, through a spokesman of theirs, the Taliban regime says that they have not done that, that he has done nothing wrong, that they wouldn't want to do that anyway. In fact, in the past uh, day or so, the Taliban regime has been denying that Osama bin Laden is responsible for the attacks Tuesday in the United States. They say that he is cut off from a communication to the outside world, that they are aware of his, of his, of his whereabouts, and so there is no way that he could be involved. Uh, however, this is something that they've been saying for a long time. They've been saying, yes, we're happy to hand this man over to the United States if you provide evidence of any terror attacks. We haven't seen that evidence. We're not handing him over. Uh, Taliban itself, however, is apparently feeling a bit vulnerable also this morning. There are reports, just want to under, underscore that, reports that the leadership of the Taliban regime is moving away from its headquarters, especially in the southern part of Afghanistan, in Kandahar, where they are based. They are perhaps remembering the 1998 U.S. raids against Afghanistan and bases of Osama bin Laden there, that in response to the bombings of the U.S. embassies in East Africa, those bombings, uh, were linked to Osama bin Laden. Also concerns about retaliation among the international community in Afghanistan, the UN, NGO, others pulling out their foreign nationals, 80 from the UN alone, coming out yesterday and today. They're coming back here to Islamabad. They're worried about a possible U.S. strike and, of course, any other retaliation against foreigners. Here in Pakistan this morning, the new U.S. Ambassador, Wendy Chamberlain, will be U.S. ambassador, will be presenting her credentials to the Pakistan president. There is a lot of pressure also on this man, uh, Pakistan, the principal backer of the Taliban. Some say, some charge, that indirectly the Pakistan government is also helping Osama bin Laden. Pakistan president, for his part, says that he will cooperate with anything the United States wants to, wants to do in its efforts to, to route out this terrorism. Now, one American official here I was speaking to this morning uh, said to me, first of all, the link has not yet been made to Osama bin Laden. I think that's 
something we should all remember. We have not made conclusively that link yet. However, if that link is made, he also wanted to say that it's not just one man. It's not just Osama bin Laden. He is the head of a network called al-Qaeda, and that means a lot of different groups of various nationalities that could be involved in this attack. And I think we're seeing that now as the investigations are turning up uh, individuals of various nationalities who could be suspects in these attacks. Anyway, this is our view from Islamabad, Pakistan. Uh, things could be heating up here in the days to come. Rick, Lori. Uh, Greg Palcott. Thanks very much, Greg. Greg joining us on the phone from Pakistan. Tuesday's assaults on the World Trade Center Tower and the Pentagon, the worst attacks of their kind in history. And indeed, so many questions remain. And now joining us to perhaps shed some light on what is happening now, we're joined by William Daly, a former FBI investigator who now runs Control Risks Group. Thanks so much for being with us tonight, Bill. All right, thanks, Abby. And, uh, you know, we're hearing these reports that Osama bin Laden may be under house arrest, and you heard Greg Palcott reporting that some of the rulers of the Taliban may be leaving their posts. What do you make of all this? Well, first of all, I think there's a couple of uh, ploys um, underfoot here. We saw the same thing go on in, in Libya uh, when we were looking for the uh, accused uh, masterminds behind the downing of Pan Am 103, yeah. when they said uh, they're here and until you can prove that they are responsible for it. We're going to keep them here. We'll hold on to them. You know, so we start to have this positioning by which maybe it gives people some time, some distance, puts maybe the United States uh, in a very um, difficult position maybe internationally to start saying, well, they're going to hand them over to you. Then, you know, why are you going after them? But I think we have to look beyond this and realize that they're uh, really just ploys and they're really just moves to be able to put things off a little bit longer. Bill, one of the first things that uh, everyone agrees needs to be done is the information needs to be gathered. We need to figure out exactly who is responsible for this before there's any kind of retaliatory attack. So the information gathering has already begun, but from your standpoint and with your area of expertise, how is that done? What's going on right now uh, inside the FBI? Uh, we saw the, the, uh, the uh, storming of the hotels in Boston mm -hmm. today. Um, how is all of this information being gathered, and, and how is the work being done? Well, Rick, as they've, they've said, this is the, the largest investigation that they've had, uh, that they've ever done. And I can only imagine, because I know some of the people that are there, uh, the daunting task ahead of them. And there's a brand-new director. Brand-new director. Uh, obviously, the Bureau coming out from uh, concerns over some past uh, issues that have arisen between files being missing and some other issues. Uh, but you can see that they are pulling together as an organized, unified effort and moving very quickly through this investigation. My thoughts when I first heard about this, and actually saw it here when I was in the studio uh, when it was breaking, was that this has such a wide base of support that it's not going to take too much to be able to follow those footprints in the sand and start to put this together. Normally you start looking at crime scenes, and you use the crime scene evidence to then help you perhaps find people responsible. In this case, is that the people who conducted this uh, had to do things that were more overt, which we're finding out now. And we're actually backing into the investigation from, from eyewitnesses and other people coming forward and other information from Manifest, uh, which is helping move this thing along very quickly. And it's looking like whoever was responsible for this does have ties to Osama bin Laden. Obviously, we can't confirm anything. We want to be very careful not to indict this man right away. But if it turns out to be... How do we get this guy? He is very tricky. He comes out when he wants to come out, but he's very well hidden, perhaps by the Taliban. So how do we get him, and, and at what point do you just start attacking places where he is known to have been in the past? Well, certainly that's, you know, that's one approach, is that one approach might be you know, to go after known places where, where he has been and, and training camps where they may have uh, 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 trained people, places where they've recruited people. There's this variety of sites that U.S. intelligence already knows about from their investigation of the USS Cole, from the embassy bombing investigation. So there is a lot of information out there that U.S. intelligence has. The question is, where is he at any one day? Uh, we've, we've seen that even from uh, the bombings of uh, um, during the Gulf War, uh, is that Saddam Hussein moved around and there were locations where U.S. intelligence thought that he was, he was present and he was able to avoid and evade, uh, you know, U.S. Uh, war, war planes. So we can kind of see the same mentality when someone moves around. But uh, we have to say is that someone like this is that we will get him. Uh, we will get him uh, one way or the other if he's responsible. 
and it may, uh, it may require some additional work and effort to locate exactly where he is, but I am confident that with the resources of not only the U.S., but of other countries that are supportive of us, we will get it. It's so strange here if he is responsible, bin Laden, because it's not as though this is the leader of some foreign nation. This is the leader of some very widespread uh, terrorist network with cells of people, and we're learning cells of people right here in our country. Exactly, Rick. I mean, the, and I think the, the, the most difficult thing for people, for Americans to realize is that, you know, we have brought people into this country who we now are finding out had some records, had some association in the past with either, the, either him or other, in, uh, other, other terrorist groups. We've allowed them in. We allowed them to go for training in our country, you know, to go for pilot training. We allowed them to, you know, go on, get jobs, and, and, and allow them then eventually to have this occur. So I think when we start looking down the road, we're going to have to look outside the box. So we've been working very um, in the past with, with a certain set of, of values, a certain set of ways we do things. But after this, we all need to be looking outside the box in all the ways that we gather So what does that include? So what are you talking about exactly? I'm talking about the uh, aggressive ways of gathering intelligence uh, overseas, um, of perhaps uh, looking at the way that uh, we not only secure uh, airlines and uh, places of business, but how we also handle people who, uh, who apply to the United States for citizenship or to reside here. There are a number of different factors that we need to be looking at here, not suggesting we do anything in a knee-jerk reaction, but there are things that need to be done uh, as we get into this new world. This is, this is the, the, the uh, war, war of the 21st century. This is different than knowing your enemy, you're looking him in the eye, is over a bunker. This is people who are scattered, who are very smart, and who have networks connected by computers and satellites. And indeed, Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld today in his news conference called this a 21st century battlefield. Everybody's been calling this an act of war. The president is now weighing his options. We're using the words war. We're using the words battlefield. How do we play this war? Well, that, that's the thing, Laurie, is that we're on a really a whole different playing field than we were in the past. Is that we're looking at multiple locations where these people may have been trained, uh, where they currently reside, uh, how how many people are out there in total, it's difficult to assess how many people are followers. We've, we've seen them commit horrendous acts between the USS Cole, the bombings in the US uh, embassies. Uh, we know that uh, their, their uh, intent on what they do, and they're also very, become very good at what they do. We've been talking about this report that's uh, going to be in tomorrow's uh, Los Angeles Times that talks about a list of 50 infiltrators that authorities are searching for nationwide, and they've been able to account for 40 of them, which means that there are 10 uh, who are still out there. Right, and we're going to see, I think, more of this. We're going to see this, uh, this number grow. Uh, we're going to see connections reach out, I believe. Uh, we've already, it's been suggested, uh, to connections of uh, perhaps people coming through Canada, like we saw, uh, don't forget, during the uh, millennium uh, period, we uh, intercepted someone coming from Canada. Uh, later on, phone records and other communications uh, showed that there was connection to people in Canada and elsewhere here in the U.S. who were supporters. So uh, this, this number will grow in the, and the spider web moves on out. Very quickly, before we let you go for now, are we going to see a lot of tightening of border security between the U.S. and Canada and even the U.S. and Mexico because of this? Well, I, it's difficult to say initially, but I, again, thinking outside that box and thinking about how we secure ourselves in this new 21st century, you know, battle and war that we're going to be engaged in, uh, we're going to start looking at a lot of things we before we never thought we'd have to. Hmm. Indeed, everything has changed. Everything's changed. All right, Bill Daly, former FBI investigator, we're going to bring you back in the next half hour and talk with you a little bit more. You also uh, were instrumental on redesigning security at the World Trade Center after the bombing in 1993. And we want to talk with you about that and much more in the next half hour, so we okay, hope you'll Lord. stick around. We'll do. Thanks very much. All right, well, President Bush told the country that freedom and democracy were under attack, saying these acts of mass murder were intended to frighten our nation, but they have failed. And there are a lot of us who are proving him wrong, folks showing what they're made of coming together as a nation in support. An outbound train early Wednesday, under the Hudson River and rumbling away from the devastation, grief grabbing hold. In their gestures and in their faces, the sadness is plain. Outside the city, stillness, 
At 8 a.m., some of America's most traveled commuter routes are barren. The bridges and tunnels coming in from all directions, linking directly into Manhattan, are shut down. An uneasy calm. Such a strange feeling now because of the uncertainty. The morning papers say it's war. Some are sure of just one thing. It's important to show you pride in America, especially after something like this happens. Stars and stripes showing up through the sorrow. To some, it's a comfort. You're going about your business, which you have to do, but it's not the same, and we know it's not the same. Mike Lewis will never be the same. Now trying to organize a meeting of his co-workers. People are trying to get some sort of skeleton crew over to 101 Hudson. They saw the worst of the worst. The metal squeaking and bending and burning and bursting open. I mean, it was just sounds that I'm never going to ever be able to, to forget. And then p seeing people jump out of windows and burning people, it's just out of control. That's what makes America a strong country is going through experiences like this and being able to rebuild and go on. Everything that happened, the flag still stood, and that's how we can stand to. Stand strong, he says, while we all take a step back and see what's happened. In New Jersey, Eric Lilligren, Fox News. And rescue workers continue to search through the night for victims of the terrorist attack in New York City. But from the rubble, heroic efforts coming to the surface, families and friends of victims remembering their loved ones. The awful, ugly horror of these attacks is now. The comprehension, the absorption of them is well down the road. Learning the names and faces of those who died is an important step because knowing the victims gives us individuals to mourn. Among the first to die in the attacks was 52-year-old John Oganowski. Oganowski of Massachusetts was the pilot of American Airlines Flight 11, the first of two planes that smashed into the World Trade Center. He was remembered Tuesday in his hometown church. You wouldn't believe the feeling that you, that you have inside when, you, when you're watching these events take place on television and then find out, realize that it's uh, somebody that you grew up with. His co-pilot, Tom McGinnis, age 42, was also remembered in a similar service in neighboring New Hampshire. McGinnis was married with two children. They were only two of the 93 people aboard Flight 11. Among the other victims, David Angel, 54, executive producer of Frasier. His wife, Lynn, was traveling with him. Also on board, Barbara Olson, age 45, a frequent guest on the Fox News Channel. She placed a cell phone call to her husband, the nation's solicitor general, Theodore Olson, during the agony of the flight's final minutes. She told him that the plane had been hijacked by attackers using knives and sharp instruments. Other relatives also received the same kind of desperate phone calls in the flight's final moments. He said, I want to let you know that I love you. And I'm, uh, I'm uh, flying. I'm, I think he said, I'm in the air. I'm calling you uh, on the air phone of the airplane. Also aboard, Barry Berenson, the widow of actor Anthony Perkins. On the ground, even the rescuers became victims. We lost um, the deputy chief of the fire department and uh, the chief of the department. Six victims, six of thousands, in an attack so brutal it seems impossible to comprehend. What we know is that the dead are young and old, men and women, girls and boys. They come from places like Stoneham, Portsmouth, and Long Beach. One of the most remarkable stories comes from aboard United Airlines Flight 93. Reports say a passenger, Jeremy Glick, called his family and told them the plane had been hijacked and that all aboard were going to die. Glick also said he and the other passengers were going to try to stop the hijackers from succeeding in their attempt to destroy a government installation. He told his family he loved them and hung up. Apparently, their efforts succeeded. Flight 93 crashed in a wooded area outside Pittsburgh. It's believed that their actions saved a Washington landmark. As the tragedy deepens, there will be many more stories of heroism and many more names and faces to mourn. In New York, John Scott, Fox News. Terrorist attacks can shake the foundations of our biggest buildings, but they cannot touch the foundation of America. These acts shattered steel, 
but they cannot dent the steel of American resolve. This is uh, a vicious attack upon New York. It's an attack upon America. It's an attack upon the whole concept of freedom and our way of life. Uh, and we cannot let these at attacks succeed. From the mountains to the prairies to the oceans, with all. Our hearts go out to all the victims and to their families. It is a tragedy, but as the president has made clear, it is a tragedy that we are strong enough to overcome. Our spirits will not be broken. We are, in a sense, seeing the definition of a, of a new battlefield uh, in the world, a 20th, 21st century battlefield. God bless America, my home sweet home. New York is going to be here, and we're going to rebuild, and we're going to be stronger than we were before. coverage of terrorism hits America continues. The men, women, and children who have been killed and injured putting a human face on these terrorist attacks. Let's take a look now at one family whose lives have changed forever. Tuesday began with a game of basketball for 34-year-old Michael Lynch. Then he went to his job at Cantor Fitzgerald on the 104th floor of Tower One and called his wife. She hasn't heard from him since. I would say it was about 8.30 and um, he just said that um, he was at work and he had finished playing basketball, he was there, and that he would talk to me later. And that was the last time I spoke to him. What have the last 24 hours been like and, and, and what's been your strength as, as you've watched events unfold on television and listened to what's happened and read about it? Well, I'm just trying to be strong for Caroline. Since the towers crumbled, Michelle Lynch has been keeping a vigil at her Stuyvesant Town apartment surrounded by her family, including one-year-old Caroline. It's a roller coaster of emotions. You have hope, and then you have no hope, and you just want answers. But tonight, another evening is passing, and there's still no word from Michael. He was generous and loving, thoughtful, and the best father and husband that we could ever hope for. We just hope he's safe and not suffering. Well, the feds aren't wasting any time tracking down those responsible for the attacks. Literally thousands of federal agents are investigating. Meanwhile, authorities are saying that more than a dozen hijackers, possibly several dozen, are linked to Tuesday's assault. We're facing a different enemy. As quickly as firemen and police rush to the scenes of Tuesday's attacks, other state and federal law enforcement agencies were on the trail of those behind this act of war. Immediately after the first report of a plane crashing into the World Trade Towers, numerous federal agencies coordinating with the White House mobilized their resources. Just a day after the attacks, leads and tips seemed to be in abundance. Law enforcement officials followed up on hundreds of leads all across the country. At those command posts and at a number of offices around the country where there are leads, more than 4,000 special agents who are assigned to assist this investigation. Boston, at Logan Airport, where two of the airliners began their doomed flights, officials reportedly seized a car that contained a flight manual. I want to reassure all New England citizens that your law enforcement is aggressively investigating this hor horrific event. Also in Boston and nearby Newton, Heavily armed police raided and searched hotel rooms, following up on tips that the people involved may have conducted planning, may have been aided in and around that city. A source told the Boston Herald that five Arab men had been identified as suspects, including a trained pilot. 
Near Pittsburgh, authorities say the United flight that went down there may hold some of the most valuable clues. Incriminating papers and records survived the crash. They showed up at the door, uh, showed us a picture of the man, asked us if we recognized him, and we said that we did recognize him, and then they just informed us that, that uh, they had, uh, uh, were doing a search. Florida. FBI agents focus their attention on flight schools. The question they're trying to answer, is this where the attackers learn to fly heavy jets? And in Washington, the announcement that despite all this destruction, our unseen enemy would have done more. We have specific and credible information that the White House and Air Force One were also intended targets of these attacks. And amidst all the uncertainty, there is one thing for certain. American justice plans on working swiftly and surely. Our spirits will not be broken. The resilience of this society will not be broken. We will find out who is responsible for this, and they will pay for it. In New York, John Gibson, Fox News. Well, from Main Street to Wall Street, the attack on the World Trade Center has rocked financial markets throughout the world. Joining us now is Fox senior business correspondent Brenda Butner. And Brenda, some good news, I guess, out of Asia? Yes, um, good news. Uh, basically, the Asian markets have, have stabilized. They had a tough time last night, but uh, the Nikkei ended up about three points today. And although that isn't much by percentage terms, we'll take it at this point. Um, all eyes remain upon the very silent floor of the New York Stock Exchange and over at the NASDAQ. We did have a couple of um, markets overseas in Asia that were down more significantly. Malaysia was down about 4%, but Hong Kong ended up as well. Japanese exporter stocks were taking a real hit. Those stocks such as Sony and Canon, um, which export because there's real fears that the terrorist attack on America is going to really precipitate a global recession and that exporters will be hurt um, uh, quite, quite badly. So that's, that's why that is happening. Um, I can tell you, however, that oil is stabilized. That had taken a big spike yesterday um, on the heels of the attack. And also the dollar, which went up quite substantially, has fallen from very ex extremely inflated prices that immediately followed the, ta the attacks. A lot of times money flows into so-called safe havens like the dollar in times such as these. But we've got about a half hour before the uh, German index opens and then about an hour before London opens. So it will be very interesting to see what happens in Europe if they have the same sort of stability that we have seen overnight, which would uh, portend uh, basically some, some good times ahead for the uh, U.S. stock markets, which will open at the earliest on Friday, the latest on Monday. You talk about the risk of a global recession here in this country. We've, we've been talking about whether or not we're in a recession. The U.S. economy is in a recession. Um, and there are a lot of people I've been reading who are saying that this could just really put us over the edge. Yes, yes, we are on the brink. Um, there are some estimates that say that this could take us down by five-tenths of a percent in terms of GDP. We were already just barely hovering above the flat line. The technical definition of recession is two consecutive quarters of negative GDP. Um, for many of us, it feels like a recession. If you see your neighbor lose a job, it feels like a recession despite all of these economists' technical terms. But it, depending on how consumers respond to this attack, if they say, I'm going to zip up my wallets, I'm going to hunker down, I'm not going to spend, they were basically the only buffer between us and recession. However, they very well could come out and say, I'm not going to let this get to us. We're going to rally around the flag and, and show the terrorists. And in fact, it was interesting, and New York City Mayor Rudy Giuliani only said this morning, go out, go to yes. restaurants, go to the Gap, buy things. Keep your life normal, as normal as you can, and, and maybe people will do that. Yes, get back to business as usual, which is exactly what the uh, New York Stock Exchange is trying to do, and as well as the NASDAQ by opening up so soon. So soon. Uh, maybe Friday, probably more likely on Monday. How important is it going to be for the American people to hear that bell ringing saying, we're back? It has tremendous symbolic significance, I think. And, and uh, the Wall Street officials know that. They want that opening bell to be ringing out to the terrorists to say, Wall Street is back. We are not going to let you. You can take down our buildings, but you're not taking down our markets. Brenda Butner, thank you very much, Brenda. Thank you. All right, we have been talking about five people who have been detained 
Uh, these are people that uh, authorities are looking into as po being possibly involved with the assault. We want to go now to Todd Connor, who's in Fox Central, with more on that. Todd. Rick, thank you very much. As you two know, this investigation moving really at breakneck speed, and that's, of course, why we want to bring you up to date on the latest that we're getting in here at Fox News. The L.A. Times reporting in Thursday's editions that a source familiar with the investigation tells them that 40 of 50 men involved in this attack on the U.S. have been accounted for, and that 10 of those are still on the loose. That according to the L.A. Times. Our first look at a possible hijacker, if we can bring up the video from the L.A. Times website, is a man you're about to see. His name is Amnullah Atta Muhammad. is believed to have been enrolled in a Florida flight training school at one time, and according to a detective in the Venice, Florida Police Department, FBI agents identified this guy right here as one of the men who flew the hijacked jets. This, according to the L.A. Times. Now, all day, from Florida to Boston, FBI agents armed with guns and search warrants have been looking into leads about who's behind these attacks. At the Westin Hotel, for example, three people were taken into custody by Boston police. They were later released. However, in South Florida, FBI agents searched at least three homes in southern Florida. One of the homes rented to a couple and their four children until this past weekend, we're told, when they abruptly moved. Investigators taking away bags of evidence in that case. However, at least two other homes lived pilots. One of those was taken into custody, but has not yet been arrested. And I want to leave you with this. Also in the LA Times, they report that the attackers who carried Middle Eastern passports belonged to four independent cells. That according to law enforcement and intellig intelligence officials. Again, that the attackers that have been identified have carried Middle Eastern passports and belong to four independent cells. Much more on the story uh, breaking uh, every minute, it seems. Uh, so, uh, Rick and Lori, we're going to send it back to you right now. All right, Todd, thanks so much. Rescue workers in New York City working around the clock, searching for victims of the attacks down in lower Manhattan. What a grim task that must be. We return now to our own David Lee Miller, who is live at Ground Zero in New York City with the latest. Hi, David. Good morning, Lori. We have some new information. We've been saying uh, for a while now that so far uh, nine people have survived and been taken out of this rubble. Now with me is David Silver. He is a Red Cross volunteer disaster services, and uh, he just left the site, and he can tell us uh, firsthand that uh, there are a number of people that you know for a fact who are still alive trapped under the rubble. Yeah, that's correct. Um, several firefighters have been dispatched to go underneath the, uh, the promenade area which is underneath both World Trade Center 1 and 2, uh, with a battalion chief looking for, I believe it's two sergeants and one female officer and one civilian officer, uh, one civilian person. Now, how did you learn that people were trapped there? Let's start with, with the civilian. We talked about that just a moment ago. All right. Um, while you're working closely with the city, um, they seem to say things in not beknownst that you're around. And when you're digging for looking for for survivors, this is what was said. The civilian, though, how did how did, did she communicate with the outside, and in she what way? She communicated through her cell phone to Seattle, and then back from Seattle to here, and that's how they knew that she was down there. She described Krispy Kreme and uh, some other store that was down there. And also down there, a number of uh, police officers, and that was how, how are they communicating directly that with the was rescuers? That confirmed to me uh, from a sergeant over here who, uh, who I befriended, and uh, he told me that communication was broke off as of today, that that communication with those police officers were broken off. What time today? Uh, he did not mention. So their state is uh, one that we do not know now. We don't know how long ago since they communicated. You'd assume, I, I would like to, to, to assume that it was because their batteries ran out in, in terms of mechanical devices. That so that's talking what, using a cell phone? Uh, well, whatever means they communicate with, that's the means that they did communicate with the police to suggest that they are still alive and they're waiting for rescue. And what is being done to rescue them? Uh, like I said, they sent down a uh, battalion chief and at least 20 members of the fire department. Also, uh, FEMA is going in through a different angle to, um, to, to see if they can extricate them from a different angle because it's very precarious now that the buildings have fallen. Um, there are two other buildings that may fall as well or may be brought down, um, and they want to extricate these people before that additional uh, uh, weight is put on there. Any identification, any names? 
absolutely no names at all. And I know it's a very gruesome sight. Relate for me what it is you've witnessed during the last uh, 20 hours that you've been here today alone. Um, a, lot of, a lot of people putting their heart out to, uh, to, to commit themselves to doing what is right here uh, in, in, in light of what was done wrong to us. Um, gruesome. Um, there are body parts which are being found, but that's it, not whole body parts. And, and it's up to the tasks of whoever, forensics or whatever, to, to ascertain who these body parts belong to. Um, when you gather a body part, you gather as much information as you can. Um, for instance, a belt buckle or anything nearby that may relate to the body, clothing, so that that might help as to where the body came from or who that person may be. But without question, uh, aside from all of that, um, I've got a gut feeling being here for two days, there are plenty of live bodies there, and I don't want to give false hope or anything, but I don't think that we've reached the, uh, the, the, the location of where a massive amount of people are, and that's just my gut feeling. How are you holding up having to deal with this? Just a little bit tired. It's encouraging to see so many different people here. Um, I've never seen anything on this scale in your work, of course. Never, never, never. Maybe a, a building that went on fire and relocating families, but never nothing like this. David Silver of the Red Cross, thank you for joining us. And uh, that is the latest from here. I should also let you know that uh, we're getting conflicting reports about uh, how many people may have died in this blast. Uh, according to at least one source with the Pard Authority, we heard that it was upwards of 20,000. But the mayor of New York, we know this for fact, has asked for 6,000 body bags to be delivered by the federal government to supplement the ones that New York City already has. Back to you. Right. David Lee Miller with a ray of sunshine there. Thanks very much. Well, joining us once again to talk about what has been going on there at the World Trade Center and beyond is Bill Daly, former FBI investigator and the head of Control Risks Group. And uh, Bill, again, just a, maybe a little ray of sunshine. Some people may be trapped under the rubble. You worked on redesigning security at the World Trade Center after the bombing in 1993. You know what kind of a structure this is. What do you make of the fact that there may still be, and it looks like there are some people still alive trapped in the rubble? Well, certainly it's extremely encouraging news coming the heels of an afternoon where people said they, they didn't hear tapping anymore, that there were no more cell call calls, there were no more radio transmissions, that this is certainly a ray of hope. And knowing that location the way that I do, and I do know it very intimately because I've worked in that area, worked on that project, worked in the World Financial Center, is that there are many underground areas. There's a shopping mall literally underneath the concourse of the World Trade Center between the two towers, and there are various sublevels. So there are pockets of space where potentially people could be alive. And I think this is very encouraging to know that um, at least there might be some possibility to get people out. And yet it is, it's like a needle in a haystack, isn't it? it? It would be a needle in a haystack. It would certainly be a horrific thing for the people being trapped down there to know that uh, they're down there, and also for rescue workers now to have to go through levels of rubble. Bill, I want to tell you about a report that's just crossing on the Associated Press, and I know you haven't seen this, and our audience probably hasn't heard about it yet, but the AP is writing that in the waning days of the Clinton presidency, senior officials received specific intelligence about the whereabouts of Osama bin Laden and weighed a military plan to strike the suspected terrorist mastermind's location the administration ultimately opted against an attack. I mean, this is, this is really something that uh, I, I guess, is it because we've got this executive order that was passed back in the 1970s that the United States is not allowed to uh, go after world leaders wherever they are? I mean, I, I'm not asking you to go into the minds of the Clinton yeah. administration and the decision-making process, um, but that whole idea, is, is that really going to have to be rethought? Well, certainly, Rick, that whole idea of, of uh, prohi uh, prohibiting us from going after people who we feel are, are threats to our national security, um, you know, I believe has been something that has uh, overshadowed perhaps uh, some of the better public interest. Um, I'm not suggesting that uh, we rescind that order. I'm just suggesting that I think that's how people behaved. I'm not surprised that we did have some information as to where he was. I mean, it was even out in the press where we saw pictures of him at his daughter's wedding, or at least post the daughter's mm -hmm. wedding. So, I mean, there are people there, people around who would know where he was, and I believe that at some point U.S. intelligence knew specifically where he was, but the question was, what would they do? How likely is it that Bush would revoke that order, do you think? I think it's very difficult at this point, and it's probably something that needs to be reflected upon 
post this incident. There are a lot of things that we're talking about here, whether it's policy, whether it's talking about law, whether we're thinking outside of the, the box as far as what we need to do to protect ourselves, need to be taken into context of long term, what do we do, and need to be uh, taken uh, place in a more sobering time after we get through what we're getting through now. One of the problems, according to this article, is uh, when they were debating whether or not to go ahead with this military option was that the information that they had might have been stale at that point because he's someone that is known to move around so often. Exactly. That could have been one of the difficulties. I mean, information intelligence like that sometimes lags, and even if it's confirmed, it can lag in a period of days or weeks from exactly, uh, and at that point, you know, the person has moved. Bill Daly, former FBI investigator and now the head of Control Risks Group. Thank you so much for your expertise. We appreciate it as Thank always. You, Thank you. Thank you, Bill. As investigators search through the, through the rubble in New York City, the Pentagon, and in Pennsylvania, one of the goals is to try to find that cockpit voice and data recorder from each of the four planes. The so-called black boxes. What exactly are they and why are they so valuable? Uh, our David Schuster joins us again from the Pentagon with more on that. Hello, David. Laura, good evening. Uh, officials are convinced that the black boxes will help investigators piece together the crucial moments when the hijackers storm the cockpit and uh, change the direction, the course of these aircraft. As the FBI sifts through the wreckage, they hope to be able to locate these boxes through their distinctive color. The so-called black boxes are actually fluorescent orange, and by airline regulations, nothing else can be this color on any commercial aircraft. There are usually two boxes on each flight. Investigators consider both to be essential because one records cockpit conversations and sounds, the other records technical data. The flight recorder is very good at telling us what's wrong with the airplane, things that are actually, you know, engine quit, uh, landing gear didn't come down, something like that. Something that actually has to do with the airplane, that's the flight recorder's strong point. The voice recorder is very good at, at this operational, the, the man-machine interface, the crew and how they interact with the airplane uh, and decisions that they make. The recorders are usually located in the back of a jet. That's because the most predictable point of impact in a crash is towards the front. Still, the boxes are made to withstand forces 10 times greater than a crash and temperatures higher than those caused by burning fuel. Most of the cockpit voice recorders and flight recorders that we get uh, look just like this. They look probably as good as the day they were made, maybe a few scratches and a few dents. Uh, every once in a while we will get a recorder that, that has been uh, smashed. If it has been smashed in water, that is usually not a problem. Recorders retrieved from the ocean are kept in ocean water until investigators examine them. It's the air that hurts the tape once it's been wet. It actually will start to rust, so we have them shipped here in water and uh, then as soon as we're ready to play them, we take them out of the water, dry them off, and then get a good copy of it before anything starts to deteriorate. We have had recorders uh, underwater for upwards of six and seven years, and uh, they're just fine. The flight data recorder, which tracks the technical and mechanical information, comes in two different formats. The first is a tape-based recorder, which gathers data on a 30-minute loop. The second format records data on computer chips and can compile more than 25 hours worth of flight information. It all comes out as numbers, calculations, or technical words and bits. It's actually a waveform that, that is then, it's zeros and ones that our software decodes into numbers and then we can bring it up on the screen and see altitude and airspeed and different flight control positions and pitch and roll and, and what the aircraft is actually doing. It looks like a strip chart with the lines moving across the screen. At this station, flight data recorder specialist Cassandra Johnson examines a tape-based recorder. She has downloaded the data and her computer software has made the conversions. We're reading it out. We're getting good data. We have a graph of the incident or accident and we will pass it along to the investigator so that they can see what the recorder is telling them about the aircraft and the most important part is, is for them to focus on a certain systems. What the recorder is telling them is not always easy to picture. So the safety board sometimes generates a database animation to help explain what happened. This one is from a 1999 American Airlines crash. An MD-82 was coming into land at the airport in Little Rock, Arkansas. It was almost midnight, as you can see by the time up here. There were storms in the area, and the aircraft landed on the runway, um, proceeded to skid around on the runway, and then went off the end of the runway. Uh, down an embankment, impacted a steel structure, 
and 11 people, including the pilot, were, were killed. In that particular crash, investigators were also helped by the cockpit voice recorder. It revealed the pilots knew about the storms, but thought they had a clear path down the runway. And approach American 420, I know you're doing your best, but we're getting pretty close to the storm. We'll keep it tight as we have to. Cockpit voice recorders give investigators a good idea of what the crew was doing when the incident happened. It can also paint a personal picture of despair and confusion. Sometimes the crew doesn't have any idea what's going wrong. They don't have any more idea than, than we do uh, what's, what's going wrong with the airplane. They may say things that are just completely not right because from the information that they have, um, you know, that's their analysis of that information. And, and it's, it's very difficult sometimes to do that on the fly when things are really going badly. Vern Ellingstad is director of the Office of Research and Engineering at the NTSB. He says the safety board learns something new from every incident or crash. Aviation accidents are a very rare event. It's a very safe form of transportation. And the predictability of what might go wrong in each of these kind of rare you know, circumstances is very difficult. So we, we do, uh, you know, recover a, a, a huge amount of important information. Some safety experts believe it is not enough, and already the NTSB is considering whether recorders should have their own power supplies. In the crash of a Swiss air jet, the last six minutes were not on the data recorder because of an electrical problem in the plane. The safety board is also thinking about placing video cameras in the cockpit. Still, investigators believe that nothing provides as much information as the so-called black boxes. They are the key, say the experts, to piecing together what happened. In Washington, David Schuster, Fox News. Well, the World Trade Center Twin Towers were targeted back in 1993 and did survive a terrorist attack. Yeah, that was a car bomb that went right into the basement, and luckily, the buildings did survive, but Tuesday's assault proved too much for the world-famous skyscrapers, collapsing the buildings and changing this city's skyline forever. Once the jewels of New York's skyline, the World Trade Center towers stood up against terrorism long enough to save countless lives. The plane came through, it took out a few of the exterior columns of the building and then set off this massive fire with the jet fuel. And fortunately, because of the perimeter tube system of the building, it was able to withstand the initial impact and allow a lot of people to get out. Other buildings would have toppled immediately, but the towers remained upright for nearly an hour, supported on the outside by closely spaced steel columns and struts, and on the inside by a second set of columns designed to bear the load of gravity, a double support system that withstood the crash, but not the raging jet fuel fire. The, the girders or the joists that hold up the floors collapsed, and as those fell to the floor below, they overwhelmed the capacity of that floor, and what we, we had was what we call a progressive collapse, which then continued on through the base of the building until there, uh, it was a complete and total failure. Most experts say tall buildings will continue to be made out of steel. What may change, they say, is the design of signature skyscrapers, the tallest and most exposed buildings. They may never be built in quite the same way. It's not like we could ever design every building for this scenario, or should we? But after every major earthquake, for example, we change our building codes to improve our practice in the future, and uh, I would expect a similar thing will happen here. One possibility, designs that include more escape routes around the perimeter of the building as well as in the center. But experts say no building can withstand an attack by a pilot willing to die for a cause. The challenge ahead, simply finding ways to reduce the loss of life. In San Francisco, Claudia Cowan, Fox News. And rescue workers have a long road ahead of them. They are just scratching the surface now of this rescue and recovery effort they're, uh, they're doing. And even though only 82, only 82 have been confirmed dead, thousands are feared dead. And now we have an updated list of the victims of Tuesday's terrorist attacks.
It is 3 a.m. in the East Coast, 3 a.m. in New York City and Washington, D.C., midnight in the West as we continue our nonstop coverage of the terror attacks against the United States. Hello, it is good to have you with us. I'm Lori Dew. And I'm Rick Fulbaum. Here are the latest developments at this hour, starting with emergency workers in New York who continue to dig through the rubble at ground zero. The death toll is expected to be huge. So far, there are 82 confirmed fatalities. Also this hour, the Washington Post is reporting that Afghanistan, the alleged hideout for terror mastermind Osama bin Laden, bracing for an imminent U.S. attack, Meantime, the U.S. State Department is advising worldwide caution. The Los Angeles Times is reporting this hour that a team of 50 people, 50, may be responsible for carrying out the strikes. Also from the L.A. Times, FBI agents have found suicide notes in New York that were written by some of the hijackers. We will continue to update you on the very latest on the terrorist attacks in a moment. But first, we have a breaking story to tell you about. A twin-engine plane carrying 16 Americans and three American crew members has crashed in Mexico's Yucatan state. All those on board were killed. The Americans were from the Seattle area. They were returning from a visit to Mayan ruins in Mexico and had planned to attend a Washington University football game in Florida. There was no distress call from the pilot before the crash. Once again, a twin-engine plane carrying 19 people, mostly American tourists, have been killed in a plane crash in Mexico's Yucatan state. And now back to our coverage of the terror attacks against the U.S. New York City Mayor Rudy Giuliani confirming that he has ordered 6,000 body bags to be brought to the city. David Lee Miller has more on the recovery operation from the site where the World Trade Center towers once stood. David? Good morning, Rick. It's been now almost two days since the terrorists struck, and uh, so far only nine bodies, they say, have been recovered. Just a short time ago, live on the air, we talked with one of the Red Cross rescue workers, and he told us that uh, at this hour, a battalion chief and 20 firefighters are now trying to make their way into the rubble because they believe that four people, at least four people, he says, are still alive. He says a woman has been in contact with her family using a cell phone in Seattle. He also says here that... During the day, authorities have talked with three police officers who are in the rubble. He was unable to confirm, though, how long it has been since those trapped police officers talked with some of the uh, rescue officers. Now, flying overhead, you can hear, by the way, it sounds like one of the uh, jet fighters that have been uh, flying above Manhattan ever since the uh, blasts here at the Twin Towers. There were some very tense moments late this afternoon, about 5.30. The authorities here said that uh, one of the uh, towers, the southern tower, what was left of it began to crumble, and they also feared at that time that two adjacent buildings were going to give way. The authorities then told all the rescue workers, fire personnel, to move north up Church Street, away from the uh, rescue effort, away from where the towers once stood. We were on the air live at the time. Our microphone and our television camera were disconnected, and uh, for a while, the rescue efforts uh, were scaled down dramatically. But uh, a number of hours later, it was learned that that was, uh, for the most part, a false alarm. The buildings they thought might crumble were in no uh, immediate danger of doing so. And at this hour, rescue efforts are continuing. As I said, they are frantically searching using dogs, acoustical equipment, and uh, tractors, cranes, and whatever type of heavy machinery they could get their hands on to try and get to the survivors. But to a great extent, this is also a uh, search and recovery mission. As you mentioned, the mayor of the city of New York has asked for 6,000 additional body bags that in addition to the ones that New York City already has. No official estimate right now on the uh, death toll in total. There are conflicting figures that are uh, being uh, tossed around, but one Port Authority official told Fox News that it is expected that the uh, death toll could exceed 20,000. Back to you. David, I know that one of the other things that's complicating the rescue efforts there are some uh, particles and debris that are flying through the air. That's right, Rick. Apparently, uh, the uh, uh, particles you're talking about, according to uh, some of the officials we've, we've talked with, are asbestos. They contain asbestos, which is a carcinogen. And uh, some of the National Guardsmen actually went around instructing us and instructing others to make sure that at all times we use uh, some type of mask or a filtration system. So more and more you'll see people down here who are wearing these masks. And in fact, as soon as we get off the air, I will put mine on because uh, it's really unclear how much asbestos there is. But I did talk to a doctor down here 
And in his words, he said uh, the asbestos level had been measured and it was off the scale. Back to you. All right, David Lee Miller down in New York City. We'll let him put that mask on. Thanks for the report. Well, it will be some time before America can attach firm casualty figures to this nightmare in New York and in Washington. But many folks are already mourning the tragic loss of their loved ones. John Scott tells some of the stories of some of those who are known to have died. The awful, ugly horror of these attacks is now. The comprehension, the absorption of them is well down the road. Learning the names and faces of those who died is an important step because knowing the victims gives us individuals to mourn. Among the first to die in the attacks was 52-year-old John Oganowski. Oganowski of Massachusetts was the pilot of American Airlines Flight 11, the first of two planes that smashed into the World Trade Center. He was remembered Tuesday in his hometown church. You wouldn't believe the feeling that you, that you have inside when, you, when you're watching these events take place on television and then find out, realize that it's uh, somebody that you grew up with. His co-pilot, Tom McGinnis, age 42, was also remembered in a similar service in neighboring New Hampshire. McGinnis was married with two children. They were only two of the 93 people aboard Flight 11. Among the other victims, David Angel, 54, executive producer of Frasier. His wife, Lynn, was traveling with him. Also on board, Barbara Olson, age 45, a frequent guest on the Fox News Channel. She placed a cell phone call to her husband, the nation's solicitor general, Theodore Olson, during the agony of the flight's final minutes. She told him that the plane had been hijacked by attackers using knives and sharp instruments. Other relatives also received the same kind of desperate phone calls in the flight's final moments. He said, I want to let you know that I love you. And I'm, uh, I'm uh, flying. I'm, I think he said, I'm in the air. I'm calling you uh, on the air phone of the airplane. Also aboard, Barry Berenson, the widow of actor Anthony Perkins. On the ground, even the rescuers became victims. We lost um, the deputy chief of the fire department and uh, the chief of the department. Six victims, six of thousands, in an attack so brutal it seems impossible to comprehend. What we know is that the dead are young and old, men and women, girls and boys. They come from places like Stoneham, Portsmouth, and Long Beach. One of the most remarkable stories comes from aboard United Airlines Flight 93. Reports say a passenger, Jeremy Glick, called his family and told them the plane had been hijacked and that all aboard were going to die. Glick also said he and the other passengers were going to try to stop the hijackers from succeeding in their attempt to destroy a government installation. He told his family he loved them and hung up. Apparently, their efforts succeeded. Flight 93 crashed in a wooded area outside Pittsburgh. It's believed that their actions saved a Washington landmark. As the tragedy deepens, there will be many more stories of heroism and many more names and faces to mourn. In New York, John Scott, Fox News. You have been looking at pictures from Lower Manhattan where the search and rescue operations continue in Washington, or actually in Arlington, Virginia, in the Washington, D.C. area, it's quite a different situation there where they don't expect to find any survivors uh, after the attack at the Pentagon. David Schuster joins us now live from the Pentagon with more. David? Rick, that's right. Uh, they dropped in some listening devices yesterday and have heard uh, absolutely nothing, so there's not a lot of optimism here that they will find anybody alive. Uh, the effort at this hour is simply to try to shore up some of the structures, some of the beams. Apparently, they are sort of piercing down at a 45 degree angle and there's great fear uh, that at some point part of the structure may still collapse. So they're trying to uh, build some support there. At uh, dusk on Wednesday, some of the firefighters in a, in a show of symbolism unfurled a giant flag from the roof of the Pentagon on the south side. Uh, they draped that flag then over the side. The governor of Virginia on Tuesday night had urged residents in the Commonwealth and in the entire Washington area to show their support by displaying flags, and that is a, a rallying cry that has been picked up on a lot of uh, local radio stations. And driving through the Washington area, you can see flags all over the place. Uh, the flag at the Pentagon came out just before President Bush came down here in Arlington to uh, pay his own respects. 
uh, to the dead, but also to thank all of the firefighters, all the rescue crews for their hard work. The president going one by one, very solemnly saying that he appreciated all of these efforts. By all accounts, it is rough going for some of these firefighters. Some of them describe the damage here as being worse than, the, than in the Alfred P. Murrah Federal Building in Oklahoma City. And some of the fire and rescue crews from Fairfax, Virginia, who are here now, were also in Oklahoma City. And the death toll here is expected to be higher than Oklahoma City. Already, the uh, fire crews have managed to pull out approximately 80 bodies. Uh, there had been some reports that the death toll at the Pentagon might go as high as 800, because that is the number that officials said worked in the general area where the jetliner smashed into the building. Uh, but uh, several senior Defense Department officials, including the Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld, are downplaying that figure. The Secretary of Defense spoke at a news conference last night. Here's part of what he had to say. We currently believe and are certainly hopeful that the number of casualties being reported in the press is high. Uh, as you know from your own observation out there, the work is still going forward, and uh, we won't know for some time uh, precise numbers, but uh, from everything that we currently know, the, the estimate that's been widely reported is uh, considerably high. The Pentagon says that there are approximately 150 military and civilian workers uh, who were working in the Pentagon who remain unaccounted for. And when you combine that with the 64 who are on the jetliner, uh, they are expecting that the death toll will go over 200. Uh, there is a little bit of good, no good news, though, here at the Pentagon. Uh, in the last uh, 12 or 14 hours, a lot of people on the north side of the building have managed to get back to work. The fires are completely out. Some of the lights are back on. There are cars back in the parking lot now. So clearly some of the work here at the uh, Department of Defense continues as some of the rescue crews are hoping to get in and try to remove some more of the debris uh, when dawn comes in just a couple of hours. Rick and Lori. David, I know that here in New York, uh, the feelings have been evolving. Of course, yesterday it was a shock and disbelief, I mean, on Tuesday, and then uh, things are beginning to shift and people are beginning to get angry. I'm wondering about the, the mood at the Pentagon and whether you can sense that kind of a shift there. Rick, uh, to some degree, although perhaps very different in the sense that uh, a lot of the people who work at the Pentagon have served at uh, military bases and installations around the world, and there's much more of a matter-of-fact attitude, I, I gather, here than, uh, say, in New York City. A lot of people have been through bombings of the Marine barracks in Lebanon and other incidents around the world, so they're used to some of the carnage that, unfortunately, U.S. military forces sometimes face. I would say the anger comes from the fact that almost all of the workers here the, the, this is not a battlefield, per se, as a lot of people have pointed out. This is a, an office building that simply houses some of the, some of the computers and some of the people who deal with some of the, some of the logistics with the Department of Defense. Okay. Uh, and that's the, where the anger comes from. I think still there's a certain, in the military culture, there's a certain acceptance uh, that U.S. forces will be targeted. And there had been some uh, worries that at some point, because the Pentagon is essentially in the flight path of National Airport, that it wouldn't be that difficult someday for some terrorist, if they were able to commandeer an aircraft, to smash it into the Pentagon. So that fear had been lingering, but there, 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 I would say that there is some anger, but probably nothing compared to what you're seeing in New York, Rick and Lori. David Schuster at the Pentagon. Thank you, David. Attorney General John Ashcroft is calling this the most massive and intensive investigation ever conducted in America. And reports early this morning are now saying that 50 people may have been involved in these terrorist attacks Tuesday morning. Our own Todd Connor has been following this for us all night. He joins us now with the latest on the search for suspects. Hi, Todd. Hey, Lori. Hey, Rick. Uh, we are getting new information in every few minutes, as a matter of fact, and especially since the uh, morning papers are starting to hit the newsstands. The LA Times is reporting in Thursday's edition that a source familiar with the investigation tells them that 40 of those 50 men believed to have been involved in this attack on the U.S have been accounted for, but that 10 of those men are still on the loose. Now, our first look at a possible hijacker, a possible hijacker, this man, Emanula Atta Muhammad. He is believed to have been enrolled in a Florida flight training school at one time, and according to a detective in the Venice, Florida Police Department, FBI agents identified him as one of the men who flew the hijacked 
jets. This in a report from the LA Times. Now all day from Florida to Boston, FBI agents armed with guns and search warrants look for leads into who's behind these attacks. At the Westin Hotel, three people taken into custody, but those three people later released. And in South Florida, FBI agents searched at least three homes. One of the homes was rented to a couple and their four children until this past weekend when we're told they abruptly moved. Investigators taking away bags of evidence from there. And at two other homes lived pilots. One was taken into custody but has not been arrested. The other one was gone. And as I said, Lori and Rick, news coming to us every few minutes. I was checking the New York Times morning edition. A couple of things. This first one, very disturbing. Officials said a group of about five men were under investigation in Union City, which is across the Hudson from Manhattan, suspected of assisting the hijackers. In addition, they say the man had apparently set up cameras on the Hudson River and fixed them on the World Trade Center. They photographed the attacks and were said to have congratulated each other afterwards that according to officials not sure how they know they did that but that's what the story says in the new york times also one last thing a senior federal official said that american intelligence had recently identified several people believed to be linked to mr osama bin laden and his organization and told immigration that they should be placed on a watch list to prevent them from coming into the u.s well after a check following that notification immigration officials figured out they had already entered the U.S., and it is possible that they were involved in Tuesday's attacks. Lori and Rick, back to you. Todd Connor, thanks very much. And we're joined now in the studio by former FBI investigator William Daly, who joins us with uh, his insight on all of this. And I'm wondering, because we've been hearing about these developments, and they seem to be coming very rapidly now, uh, should Americans be reassured that the FBI and that investigators are coming up with uh, with these leads and are, are uh, coming up with, with all of this as quickly as they are. Absolutely, Rick. They should be reassured and to know that a lot of this information may have been resident, may have been already in the files, and it's a matter of getting additional pieces of information where they can cross-reference through their indices and then determine how different people fit into the picture. And they're moving very quickly, not only on the ground, as we've seen interviewing people, but they're also, from what I understand, going after records for a telephone company, from Internet access records, those things that start to further spread out those, those arms of that spider web and start to link maybe other people out who were some way complicit in this may have provided some type of support or advice. We know this is one of the largest operations and investigations the FBI has ever handled. How big? What are we talking about? How many agents are we talking about? Right now, reports are putting it at close to 4,000 FBI agents, additional couple, uh, a couple thousand support personnel, uh, about 1,000 or a little bit less in the forensic technical side, people to do analysis. We're talking about close to 25 to 30 percent of the FBI's assets, people, and equipment are being dedicated towards this. Let's go back to Tuesday morning when we first learned about this. The President of the United States was in Florida. He was then taken to two other locations via Air Force One. Now, we learned what's now Wednesday, um, that, that the White House and Air Force One were targets of the hijackers, and now we're getting some of the first dramatic pictures, as you see there, in, in your upper right-hand screen, we're looking at fighter jets, mm -hmm. which are mm -hmm. flying next to Air Force One. Right. I believe there's only been one other time that fighter jets had been deployed to escort Air Force One when, uh, when there was a conference down in, in Columbia, a drug conference. Uh, other than that, these type of protocols are reserved only for, for matters of severe emergency. And it's one of the first steps uh, that's available to the government in order to protect our leader and other uh, leaders inside the government to give us the strength to go on. I've had the good fortune of flying in an F-14 and uh, flying very high, and I know what they're capable of doing. This is serious stuff, isn't it? I mean, this is about as secure as you can get, is it not? Absolutely. As, as we all know, probably from the things we read and, and movies, that Air Force One is a flying uh, communications post. It's a mobile White House. But there are other places around the country, too, that people need to know where the president could go to and control things and command the military from if, if it warranted. I was referring to the fact that it was being guarded, if you will, in the air by these fighter jets. So uh, you would hope that it would be impenetrable. It's, it, it, would be as, it would be as secure as, as anyone would, would ever hope or we would ever need to hope. Bill, I want to ask you about Osama bin Laden because he really is uh, the one that uh, a, a lot of uh, people are pointing the finger at. We have a lot of foreign intelligence 
um, uh, organizations from foreign countries that are all saying that bin Laden is the prime suspect here. How much proof is enough proof before the U.S. can go after this guy? Well, you know, this is, uh, now we're getting into uh, outside of the, the, the court and judicial system, into the court of uh, public and international opinion. And I think uh, we're going to have to demonstrate to s some degree, and I'm not saying beyond a reasonable doubt, I'm not saying with documents or, or photos showing him standing with, with people that we now know to be involved in this incident, but we would need to demonstrate something, both the American people and elsewhere, that we have done this that is prudent, that this is the person behind it, and then when we take these actions, uh, that we are then... Uh, reducing our risk and giving everyone a better, a better and safer place to live in. So, do you expect that this is going to take some, some time, days, weeks, months before there's some sort of a retaliation? Uh, my sense, just on the way the investigation is moving now, that we're probably talking of of days before we have something uh, that provides to provide us that uh, that level of comfort. What the government decides to do with it at that point uh, is difficult to say. But I think we're moving very quickly along that. That, uh, that train line towards uh, some type of a, a connection. Well, obviously we don't know exactly what is in store once it starts, but do you think now that Americans should begin to get into a, a different mindset? I mean, we're all recovering from uh, the attacks of Tuesday. Do we need to prepare ourselves psychologically for the idea of America going to war? Well, I think as we discussed even earlier for our audience is that war now has become a uh, more of a symbolic uh, word than what we maybe traditionally knew when we went to, to war after World War II, is that we are at war with terrorism uh, and with terrorists. And the thing is to define where they are, uh, where they're being harbored, and to take action. So yes, in that, in that regard, we are, and I think that Americans uh, uh, need to know the government, I believe, will do what they have to do, and it needs to be done, not just in retaliation, but to give us a better sense of well-being. And you would think that there would be public support for this, uh, very different from conflicts we've seen in the past, such as Vietnam. I mean, this is affecting tens of thousands of people on American soil. All right, and we've seen the leaders of Congress stand together. All right, uh, William Daly, we're going to ask you to stick around. We're going to bring you back to have further discussion about uh, Tuesday morning's tragedy, so stick around. All right. William. All right. Well, the country, and really the world, has been watching with disbelief at Tuesday's horror right here on American soil, but now stories of heroism rising from the smoke and the ash. Nothing. Leave the families alone. What I have seen on their faces is grief and shock at what's happened. Um, they've gone through a terrible tragedy and a horrible loss. He'd called his wife a few minutes before the Pentagon was hit. He forgot. He didn't have a cell phone, so apparently he was on his office phone and called her and told her to turn on the television that uh, look at what's going on in New York City. And that was the last anybody heard from David. I've uh, been told that he's not in one of the emergency rooms. The plane hit his office, the office he was in. They have not found him. And the Pentagon has announced that uh, there is no hope for any survival, survivors left in the rubble. There's always hope, but we also have to face reality to go on. Uh, it's tough. It's tough. These two little girls, lovely wife, and uh, a tough future. He said, I, I want you to know I love you very much, and uh, I'm uh, calling you uh, from the plane. Uh, we've been taken over. There are three men that say they have a bomb. And I said, well, who are they, Mark? And uh, he said, he repeated that he loved me, and he said, I, I, I don't think he said, I don't know who they are. He just, he, he became distracted there as if someone was speaking to him. And he said, it's something to the effect of it's true. And, uh, and then the phone went dead. Maybe he cut the fuel off or something, the fuel supply off, unbeknownst to the hijackers. I, I'm thinking he might have, the way it came down, apparently, it was, looked like it had, there was no power to the airplane. It looked like it came straight down, and it didn't hit whatever target they were going for. He helped us grow this company from about 100 people to 2,000 people or maybe more. And he gave his life for it. It's tough, but he did what he wanted to do. I hope that 
President Bush is the caliber or can come up with some of the backbone that Ronald Reagan or Harry Truman had and not back down from these people. And we've been asking you to give us a call. We want to know what your thoughts are about all of this. And our first caller on the line is from Hawaii, and it's Lehua. Hello, Lehua. Good morning or good evening to you, actually, in Hawaii. far away, all our hearts here are with the victims and their families. It's such a horrible tragedy and it's terrible that it took something like this for Americans to stick together. Um, we just, everybody down here wants to do as much as they can. We're giving blood and praying and that's pretty much all they can do. But um, God bless everybody and hopefully America will rise above this. Lehua, thank you very much. Let's go to the nation's heartland now. John in Wisconsin is standing by. And hi, John. What's on your mind tonight? Good morning. Um, what's on my mind? I, I, you know, I'm, America's the freedom of the free, and we open up our arms to everybody. But these people are killing us as of what happened yesterday. I think that the people that are wanting to come into America to be citizens here, I think there should be more of that checked out of who's coming into our country. I think where the people that are coming in from other countries should be at the airport should be very well scrutinized. If we even probably sign up for coming to America to, uh, maybe months ahead of time so that they can be investigated. All right, well, there's sort of a fine line between investigating and going too far with that. But John from Wisconsin, we thank you for your call. And let's go to Alabama now. And Dan, go ahead, Dan, you're on. Hi, how are you guys doing? We're doing okay. How are you? Uh, I'm doing pretty well. I tell you, I'm uh, really upset about this whole situation. Um, I'm calling from Alabama, and my heart goes out to all the uh, good, fine people in New York City. Um, I really feel really terrible about this, and um, I would like to take this opportunity to say that uh, the folks in the South, and I think the uh, whole United States in general is behind um, the fact that we retaliate against these people immediately and we do not waste any more time. Dan, um, thanks very much for the call. We appreciate it. And we appreciate your thoughts. All right, we want to check now with Brenda Butner, who's our senior business correspondent. She's joining us now with a look at how the foreign markets are reacting. Uh, to the events over the last couple of days. Hi, Brenda. Hey, Lori and Rick. Well, trading just getting underway in Europe, in Germany's DAX, the London FTSE, and Paris's CAC 40. And if Asia, where the closing bell has sounded, is any indication that terrorists are not having their desired effect, the markets remain calm, cool, and very business as usual. With the exception of Malaysia and Taiwan, which both opened tonight for the first time since the attacks, there have really been only fractional gains or losses in Asia. It seems that Europe will also lack a bit of direction as all eyes are on the NYSE and the NASDAQ, which remain silent, closed, until the earliest on Friday or the latest on Monday when trading will commence. Right out of the gate, the DAX, or the Frankfurt market, jumped almost a percent, but observers expect another volatile session. Yet over there, as here, those in the financial community have much more on their minds than dollars and cents or pounds and pence. A feeling of total devastation of a loss of one's family. You can't blame them. They've known and dealt with these people now, many of them for up to 20 years, certainly between five and 20 years. Speak to them every day across the line in New York, work with them, trade with them, cooperate with them. They're family. And one day they're there and the next day they're not. But what you're also looking at in terms of amongst the people who've unfortunately been killed are the brightest crop of their generation. Very true, and words we are hearing again and again as many on Wall Street await word of their friends and colleagues as the rescue effort continues hand by hand as you're watching live now. Lori, Rick. Brenda, thank you very much. And now we want to take a few moments to get you caught up on the latest news that we have for you at 3.30 a.m. Eastern Time this morning. Here are the very latest developments. As you saw a moment ago, emergency workers continue to dig through the rubble at ground zero, literally hand by hand, a bucket brigade, if you will, continuing 
throughout the hours as they have been doing for almost 48 hours now. The death toll expected to be enormous into the thousands. 82 deaths have been confirmed so far at the World Trade Center location. In other developments, there are reports that Afghanistan is bracing for an imminent U.S. attack. Meantime, the U.S. State Department is advising worldwide caution. And the Los Angeles Times is reporting that a team of 50 people could be responsible for carrying out these attacks. Also from the L.A. Times, FBI agents have apparently found suicide notes in New York that were written by some of the hijackers. There are so many tragic stories that have been repeated throughout the New York City area. Somebody wakes up and brushes their teeth and goes to work on Tuesday morning, just like they always do, except a lot of people never came home. Dave Price of Fox News Station WNYW here in New York City tells of one such story. Tuesday began with a game of basketball for 34-year-old Michael Lynch. Then he went to his job at Cantor Fitzgerald on the 104th floor of Tower One and called his wife. She hasn't heard from him since. I would say it was about 8.30, and um, he just said that um, he was at work, and he had finished playing basketball. He was there, and that he would talk to me later, and that was the last time I spoke to him. What have the last 24 hours been like, and, and, and what's been your strength? As, as you've watched events unfold on television and listened to what's happened and read about it? Well, I'm just trying to be strong for Caroline. Since the towers crumbled, Michelle Lynch has been keeping a vigil at her Stuyvesant Town apartment, surrounded by her family, including one-year-old Caroline. It's a roller coaster of emotions. You have hope, and then you have no hope, and you just want answers. But tonight, another evening is passing, and there's still no word from Michael. He was generous and loving, thoughtful, and the best father and husband that we could ever hope for. We just hope he's safe and not suffering. We do too. Tuesday's terror attacks are catastrophic enough for the adult victims, but many who died left little ones who will grieve for them and other children unable to understand what happened. Julia Chavez visited a New Jersey school where the staff is trying to help these children cope. This is how students at Brookdale Elementary in Bloomfield began their day. Under the American flag at half-staff, they had a moment of silence. For all those who lost their lives in this tragic event. The devastation and destruction at the World Trade Center was the topic of discussion in every classroom. They tried to evacuate as many people as they could, as quickly as they could, but just think about how big those buildings are and how many tens of thousands of people worked in them and, and visited them every day. Teachers tried to address concerns. Children were asking many questions about the tragic events in our country. Many went to their parents. It's hard. My dad was in World War II, and he never wanted me to see this. Never mind her. It's, it's horrible. Mia Solero has two children. She says it's been one of the hardest things she's had to deal with as a parent. You know, I have a, a five-year-old son who starts nursery school today, and he said to me last night, are they going to bomb my school too? You never are comfortable with situations this horrific. Since the tragedy can be difficult for young ones to comprehend, officials at the 11 schools in Bloomfield are offering help. I'm really upset about what happened to the Twin Towers. Counselors, social workers, and psychologists are on hand to help kids deal with the crisis. We're letting the children know that they're safe. Um, a lot of children were concerned about uh, danger to themselves, to the school, to their families. So we're just reiterating that they are safe. With these images seen on national TV, counselors say parents should monitor what children are watching. You know, if the, ch if the children seem to be disturbed by it, then don't watch it while the children are in the room put a video in, turn on another station. Judy Chavez, Fox 5 News. Mm, all these stories coming out in the, in the days and weeks and months ahead. Well, joining us again is someone who's been with us throughout the evening, former FBI investigator and senior vice president of Control Risks Group, an international security consulting firm, Bill Daly. 
Bill, welcome back. We, we love having All you right. here. You have a particularly unique perspective because after the World Trade Center bombing in 1993, you were instrumental in helping redesign the security. If you would, tell us a little bit about your role and, and how familiar you are with the World Trade Center. Well, you know, Lori, uh, and this is more from a per very personal perspective. Yes. You know, we've we've been talking about this uh, more as a uh, for for the public uh, appetite and, and what they need to hear from a news perspective. But I was actually sitting in the studio yesterday, just shortly after the second plane hit, and sat here and watched on the monitors as as the buildings crumpled, knowing very well the people who I know who I've worked with over the years were in those buildings because they were people who were personally involved in redeveloping not only security but fire life safety. I would have to say from a personal perspective, uh, I know people now who are unaccounted for. I know people who, who would have been there next to the fire command people who were also now killed and uh, would have been directing people out. They, they also redesigned the way people get out of the buildings more, more quickly, easily, better lit staircases. So there are some true heroes here that uh, people know their names. Uh, but they are the heroes. Do you think because of the redesign work that was done, more people were saved on Tuesday? Oh, without a doubt. There's no doubt about it that the lessons learned from the first incident not only helped the World Trade Center, but also other buildings around the world. Uh, people from the Port Authority have gone out and spoken to groups and, and people who build buildings and service buildings to better understand the way to deal with calamities. Certainly nothing like anyone would have expected we saw uh, yesterday but those that, uh, that broached severe terrorist attacks. Bill, since you specialize in risk and controlling risk, what do you think is going on at other buildings in New York City and other skyscrapers around the country right now? We have heard that we need to be on the lookout and be alert for other potential attacks. So what's going on? Well, the things that, uh, that I'm hearing from, from, from clients that we work with, um, from just observations here in New York, is that a lot of the buildings have, uh, have bunkered down. They've tightened up security with the screening people coming into the buildings. Uh, with their, their, I believe after this, we'll be reevaluating certain aspects of, of how buildings deal with crises, how they deal with security. Uh, this incident that occurred is, is so far out on the spectrum of, of certainly uh, things that... Uh, uh, that have occurred in the past and things that buildings can deal with, but there are things day to day uh, that are that are threats that are still going to be existing no matter where we go in the future that people need to look at. And I just want to remind folks what we're looking at here, and this is literally a hand to hand bucket brigade that is going on. And and you know we've been showing this video for the last um, 24, 36 hours or so, and I don't want it to lose its importance. Look at what these people are doing hand by hand, going through this rubble, trying to help find any survivors and then the grim task of finding victims. And this is going on right now at 3.30 in the morning. Bill, if you would sort of tell us a little bit more about what these folks are going through, these, these very brave fire department workers and these police officers. Well, having known many of them personally, people who are in the fire department, people in the police department in, in, in New York, uh, these people are ones that, that put aside their personal safety and well-being, uh, the well-being of their families. They're people working 24 hours a day, neighbors, friends of, of mine. Uh, people are out there digging in literally and figuratively. Uh, and people need to understand when they look at these pictures, and it's, it's difficult for those who may not have visited that area, that we are talking about, when we talk about square blocks, we're talking about probably quarter-mile sections uh, that have been literally leveled. Uh, there, there are buildings that, that I've worked in that are now no longer standing or those that are ready to fall down and, and some that will have to be taken down because they were too close and they've, they've suffered some structural damage. So we're, we're talking about an area that I would imagine uh, has to be uh, uh, totally encompassing close to probably about half square mile in total that's been affected by this. What happens down there? I mean, uh, you know, perhaps it's too premature to be talking about the future, but at some point they're going to have to try to to decide what to do, what would be appropriate uh, to do in this particular space down in Lower Manhattan, and what would be appropriate? Well, you know, the uh, uh, first first uh, reaction is, you know, let's rebuild, let's let's go back. We'll we'll show them. We'll we'll rise again from the ashes. Um, practically speaking, it, it may be something different. We may not need to do that in order to accomplish that same, you know, level of of rebuilding. Um, 
I, I don't feel as though if we, we built another tower, we would be at any more risk than we are today. We still have other landmark buildings in New York, places of, of where, where tourists gather and, and other high-profile locations. Uh, but there may be a practical issue there. Uh, there may be one even almost, in a sense, memorializing those people who, who worked in those towers, that maybe we don't want to do the same thing over again. We don't want to uh, have these, these tardy place what the towers stood for. And I think there's, there's probably some psychological effect that people have to deal with, and that is any people working in tall buildings around the country and, and notable buildings, um, what does it mean for them? And it will take a while for a whole psyche to really readjust to this. And I think that's why we all need to be looking towards the future, towards readjusting how we, we live, work, how we, how we handle uh, our personal security, how we handle our, our country's security, and uh, I think we'll, we'll then feel a lot better. So much we can talk with you about. Um, as I look at these pictures, I, I can't take my eyes off them. And we may have met some of these folks, uh, some of these police officers, fire officials, you know, walking the beat in our neighborhoods. How do they keep going? I realize that you're not a former police officer, but, but you have worked with many of these people. How do you keep going hour after hour in something that is so incredibly serious? I think what it is is that they, they realize that this is, uh, this is their chance, this is their, their opportunity to help people who can't help themselves. And I think that's why people go into these services, is there's a bit of altruism, is they have a choice of going into you know, business or something else, and they say, I'm going to go into a business that helps people. Certainly the pay isn't there, there's, there's challenges there even in the city today with, with, uh, with pay scales. Uh, so these people are doing it for the fact that they want to help people, and this is the, the true sign of people reaching out and helping their fellow neighbors. We have people who have come down to that site to help from fire departments and rescue companies from the surrounding area, from some from states far, far away. So it certainly is a, a tribute not only to people here in New York, but throughout the country who have, who have literally uh, helped. And Bill, with your background with the FBI, the investigators, um, are they in there right now while all of this work is going on? Uh, they are. Uh, in fact, once in a while in, in some of the shots you'll see, you'll, you'll see FBI windbreakers out there. Uh, they, I, knowing how they work, they would be documenting the area, photographing it, uh, be looking at various pieces of evidence as they may feel evidence comes up during the digging. Uh, they're, of course, looking for certain things that uh, may help them, whether it's the flight recorders um, or um, or other information that comes out as a result of digging through this. And uh, it's, it's a daunting task. It's a dangerous task. Uh, there's obviously they're limited by the fact that uh, this is, as I said before, literally square blocks of city now in, in Rumble. William Daly is a former FBI investigator currently with Control Risks. Thank you very much, William, for joining us uh, now and actually throughout the night. We appreciate it. Thank you it. both. Really appreciate your perspective. Thanks very much. You know, depression and despair could very easily come with this kind of a disaster, and that would seem completely appropriate for a lot of people, and the American people are a resilient one. John Dupree has this heartwarming story. An extraordinary disaster, a remarkable response. It wasn't just New Yorkers lining up around the block to give blood. In the first six hours after the attacks, 700,000 Americans volunteered to roll up their sleeves. It's been overwhelming. Uh, you know, the outpouring of love and support from the community is, is really heartfelt. This Red Cross Center has seen record numbers of blood donors. Many realize their blood may not be used by East Coast victims, but it doesn't matter. It could have been me, um, and if, God forbid, it happened here in one of our buildings, I sure hope people in New York would be helping us out as well. I know it's a horrible, horrible thing, but, it, you know, it's nice to be part of the sort of a community of people who are really willing to help. The crisis has sparked an explosion of patriotism as Americans rally around the flag. Flag and banner, may I help you? This store sold 200 star-spangled banners before noon Wednesday. The United States flag represents freedom, represents the lives that have been lost for our freedom, for our independence. Americans want to do something, anything, to help and to show their support for the victims. But just take 15 seconds starting right now and just a quick moment of silence. 1,500 radio stations went silent at 8.42 a.m., 24 hours after the first plane struck. Churches, synagogues, and mosques report enormous turnout at special worship services. Religious and civic groups are raising countless dollars through money drives. 
all in response to an act of violence meant to terrorize, but one which in its aftermath seems to have galvanized Americans. In Los Angeles, John Dupree, Fox News. Well, information continues to come into Fox News Channel fast and furiously. There are some new developments in the investigation of who was responsible for Tuesday morning's dastardly attacks in Washington and New York. Let's go now to Fox Central Wolf. Todd Connor is standing by. Todd, what's going on? Well, Lori and Rick, uh, our Rita Cosby has been talking to her law enforcement sources, and she's passed along a little new information for us. Her sources tell Fox News that searches have now taken place so far at 20 locations in six states in this investigation for the uh, suspected hijackers. The states are Maine, Massachusetts, Florida, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Virginia. Other states are expected to have homes and businesses searched on Thursday, including some possibly on the West Coast. Now, earlier we had heard that there were as many as 50 people involved in this uh, attack on America. Her sources also say that they have some evidence that someone had been coordinating this attack, most likely from the U.S., for more than a year. And they go on to say that there are indications that at least one of the hijackers had a ramp pass, which would allow him to get on the ramp area prior to takeoff, which would enable him to get access to the plane, the catering service, etc., which would provide many, many opportunities, as you two know, to get items smuggled onto the plane, such as knives or fake bombs that they may have had with them. They also say some of the hijackers' uh, passenger tickets were purchased by cash. Others, as many as seven, were purchased through the same credit card number. And one last thing, the source tells our Rita Cosby that the Pentagon appears to have also been an intended target for the hijackers, that it wasn't an entirely last-minute change to hit it, although it may have been a last-minute change for that plane to hit it, possibly when the plane that crashed in Pennsylvania could not make its target, which could have been uh, the Pentagon, then the plane that struck the Pentagon, which may have been intended for a different target, possibly the White House, that's why that plane struck the Pentagon. So that is the latest from uh, Rita Cosby and Fox News. We'll bring more information to you in uh, the next few minutes or so. Lori and Rick. All right, Todd. So many developments just keep coming in. It's almost hard to keep up, uh, but we want to keep all of you informed. And we also want to know what's on your mind. This is a very tough time for everyone, and perhaps by calling in, it may help a little bit. And, of course, you can always call us at one 888 Tell Fox, the phone lines are open. We'd love to hear from you. As we take a look at a live picture of this bucket brigade that continues to go on at the rescue site down in lower New York City, our first caller on the line is from Pennsylvania. And Rose, you're on. Hi, Rose. Good morning. Hi, how are you? Okay, go um, ahead. What I'm calling about, I guess, is I've had um, tremendous disappointment and, and building anger all day about the fact that uh, these these pilots um, were from Afghani. They were they were educated and learned all their their skills to to sabotage our country right in our country. And I'm a little upset that our intelligence wasn't more on top of this information um, to make us feel more secure. And I know that you can't profile every single person from the Middle East, but we've been warned for years that this this group these groups were going to come after us, and it just disappoints me with the technology that we have that our intelligence was not more on top of this through through the websites and just through listening you know watching these kids at this school these schools in florida what were they doing what type of lifestyle did they leave you know live and where were they from what kind of activity went around them i think these schools should be a lot more responsible for who they have come in to it and you know what they what they do they're, they're just not responsible yeah rose you're not alone in voicing upset with uh, the the intelligence community, in fact, lawmakers in Congress are, are also very upset, and you can bet that when the uh, new budget is agreed to, that there will be a lot more money devoted to the intelligence community uh, and those efforts, which is something that we hear has really been scaled back on the last couple of years, uh, and, and uh, that will obviously it's just like change. We, we, we took it for granted. We, yeah. we would see this bin Laden's face flashed on the news, and we'd look and we'd go, I myself would look and go, what a fool, you know, what's he up to? But we're safe. We don't have to worry about him. And now we know that's not the case. Rose, thanks very much for the sure. call. Our next caller is Justin in Illinois. Hi, Justin. What's on your mind tonight? 
Yeah, so I just want to give my deepest sympathy to all the ones that we've lost in this tragedy and all the ones that risked their lives to try to save the people that were in the rubble. And also I've heard many things of uh, many Americans attacking other Americans because they are of different race. I would like to say that we should put a forth um, an effort to having all this stop because it is not us that made this horrible event happen. It is the one that had the thought to sink as low as killing innocent people. And I know us Americans would never sink as low as that. Well, Justin, we, we don't know yet who is responsible, although it is, it is looking like uh, Native American people who are from the United States were not responsible for this. Uh, I can see your point of view and uh, appreciate the call. Thanks very much. No Diana from California, you're on. Good morning, Diana. Uh, hi. Um, I just like to say, just watching all the coverage with the people in New York, I am just amazed at their courage and their strength and all the people, no matter what race or sex, coming together. This is what our nation is truly about. And a lot of people, would, a lot of New Yorkers would say that this is what New York is all about. I mean, this is a town that has a lot of different kinds of people from all over the world. And uh, you are seeing people's true colors as they, as they uh, volunteer and do whatever they can right now. Yeah, I'm 3,000 miles away from it and just feeling for these people and the people that I work with and all of us just want to do something to help and come together as a nation and show these people you're not going to stop us. Diana, thanks very much for calling. Thank you. From California to Florida we go now where Fred is on the line. And uh, Fred, what are your thoughts on this and do you have any thoughts about how the U.S. should respond? Uh, yes. Um I'm ex-military, and I truly believe that every time we've gone to war or acts of war, we've never finished a job. Fred, let me interrupt you and ask you uh, what branch of the military you served in and uh, for how long? I was in the U.S. Navy, and I was in for eight years. Uh, from when to when? From 80 to 88, and then I, I uh, was called back to serve in the Gulf. And you, you, saw, you did you actually go to Kuwait yes. or Iraq? All yes. right, and um, so if you would expand a little bit on the point you were making about how the United States, you say, never finishes the job? Yes, it seems like every time we get to the point where we can actually do something that will prevent something like this from happening, to us as a nation, to, to eliminate the mad dogs that are out there that we are going to war against. It happened with my father in World War II when we were at the brink and, and of, of just if they can't run their countries correctly, we need to take them and run them correctly. And we had a mad dog loose in our backyard. And what do you do with a mad dog? You eliminate it. And uh, it just, it, 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 this is so upsetting. My prayers are out for every single American, and especially the families of all the people that have died. Well, the President of the United States and his Security Council are they're weighing their options right now trying to figure out what to do how to appropriately respond uh, Fred I really appreciate the call tonight and uh, appreciate you. your perspective thank you God bless America thank you very much the attacks were uh, here on the East Coast but uh, sending shockwaves all across the country and two of the planes involved in, in those hijackings were bound for Los Angeles uh, and California and Deborah is our next caller and she joins us from California. Good morning, Deborah. Good morning. Um, I'm calling my son is 14 years old and he was just totally devastated and he has seen in our town that uh, everybody has gotten their flags out and is flying them and he wishes to issue a challenge to all Americans to please fly the colors, stand by what you believe in, our prayers are with all of the families, the friends, the many people who are suffering now, the tragedies that are going to come out of this. How we hope and pray that they can overcome it. Yep, you know? it's an excellent idea to take out the flags. Now is a great time to do that. I'm wondering, Deborah, uh, mm -hmm. how, how have you handled this with your son? Um, how do you talk to a young person about the, all of this? We sat down together. Um, he was getting ready for school when uh, this was occurring, and he came in and told me to sit down and watch this with him, and I watched it with him, and 
He asked me a lot of questions about it, and I tried the best of my ability to explain it to him. And I come from a law enforcement background. Um, I'm a medically retired CEO, and uh, so I kind of took the approach of trying to explain that the only thing we can do now is to help in any way we can and to pray for the people, all of the people, because we have to pull together. We're in an hour of crisis, and uh, we all have to pull together and help in any way we can. How has your son's school been involved in, uh, in, in talking to the kids? They've um, talked about terrorism, and it's hard for them to understand, you know, exactly, you know, what type of people that, you know, we're going to have to deal with because, you know, terrorism isn't really something that comes up in school. It's just, you know, you never think it's going to happen to you. So it's not, you know, we've never really had to explain it to them because it's never really happened to us, such as this. So they have to go back and try and explain, you know, who could possibly be the people that are responsible for this. And, you know, once again, we don't have all the information, so no, we, don't. we can't put a lot of blame on, you know, one certain type of uh, culture, people. Uh, we just have to wait and see. And then uh, I'm sure that the president and everybody will deal with this in a professional manner and Deborah? take care of what needs taken care of. Deborah, thanks very much for the call. We Thank appreciate you. it. Bye. All right, our final call is Chris in Utah. Chris, we've only got about 30 seconds left, uh, but if you would tell us, you are a world away from New York, but what do you make of what's been going on here? Well, actually, um, you know, I don't really think it's fair, um, mainly for, I would say, the foreign people from Iraq or Afghanistan that are here, because what they do, they just actually laugh, and I think that they're using our freedoms to go ahead and live here, and then from there, they go ahead and just laugh at us for what's happening. And with the upcoming Olympics coming to Salt Lake City, we're wondering what's going to happen here when that time comes around, too. We've actually got a little more time, Chris. Uh, I, I'm curious as to what specifically you mean by that. Well, people are just wondering, you know, uh, questioning security here. Uh, mm -hmm. What about Salt Lake City? Right. And well, we're just questioning what may happen here. You know, if this can happen, you know, in New York and there's no, no big... Uh, conventions or anything big happening at that time we're wondering what would happen you know possibly with the Olympics and what bomb threats have happened in the past you know what may occur around this time right we saw the 1996 Summer Olympic bombing and of course the terror in Munich in 1972 and the Summer Olympic Games there um, unfortunately it is this these kinds of horrible things are happening Chris in Utah thanks very much as we continue to look at this bucket brigade going on at 3.57 a.m. in the morning. It is almost a David versus Goliath situation. These people using their hands to try to sift through the rubble. Our coverage continues, and right now we want to pause to show you a list of the latest names of people who were known to have died in the attacks against the U.S. this week, a list that is certain to grow much longer in the next couple of days. These are just the first names that we know of who died in the attacks, and we offer our hopes and our prayers to them and to their loved ones.
everybody. It is 4 a.m. in the East Coast now, 1 a.m. in the West, as we continue our nonstop coverage of the terror attacks against the United States. Hello, everybody. I'm Lori Dew. And I'm Rick Fulbaum. Here are the latest developments at this hour. Emergency workers in New York City continue to dig through the rubble at Ground Zero in Lower Manhattan. The death toll is expected to be huge, but right now there are only 82 fatalities that have been confirmed so far. Some newspapers coming out this morning. The Washington Post reporting that Afghanistan is bracing for an imminent U.S. attack. Meantime, the U.S. State Department is advising worldwide caution. And the Los Angeles Times with another report that a team of 50 people may be responsible for carrying out the terror strikes. Also from the L.A. Times, FBI agents have found suicide notes all over the country that were apparently written by some of the hijackers. We will have the latest on the terrorist attacks in a moment, but first we have some other breaking news to tell you about. A twin-engine plane carrying 16 Americans and three Mexican crew members has crashed in Mexico's Yucatan state. All those on board were killed. The Americans were from the Seattle area. They were all returning from a visit to the Mayan ruins and planned to attend a University of Washington football game in Florida. There was no distress call from the pilot before the crash. Once again, a twin-engine plane carrying 16 Americans and three Mexican crew members has crashed in the Yucatan state of Mexico. All those on board were killed. All right, back to our coverage now of the terror strikes this week, and we continue uh, our coverage. Uh, Mayor Giuliani of New York City has confirmed that he's ordered 6,000 body bags for the victims. Eric Sean has more on the recovery operation. He is at Ground Zero, right near where the Tro World Trade Center towers once stood. Eric, good morning. Uh, good morning, Rick uh, and Lori. We did have uh, more hope yesterday uh, in terms of the search and rescue. Uh, Sadly, only five people have been rescued from the ruins of the World Trade Center just a couple of blocks uh, behind me. Five people, those are the lucky ones so far, but of course the search and rescue effort continues here unabated as 2,000 police firefighters from an old part of this area and uh, from out of state who are bolstered by many, many volunteers are tediously with difficulty, step by step, removing concrete, blasted stone, rocks, steel, iron, twisted metal and debris, hand by hand, piece by piece, in their desperate effort to try and find more survivors of this dastardly and devious terrorist attack on the World Trade Center. Uh, we have talked to some of the, uh, the Red Cross workers here who say that there is one particular area where a, a battalion chief of the New York City Fire Department and some of his men uh, perhaps may be trapped, uh, but we have been hearing conflicting reports, uh, nothing specific. What does give the rescuers hope are the, what's called voids. Those are huge areas, 50, 60, 70 feet deep, where concrete may fall. That could give people air pockets, could give people uh, a structure uh, to take cover, to protect them when that building came uh, crashing down on top of them so horrendously. Uh, but what we have heard the latest is that the shopping mall underneath the World Trade Center is basically uh, basically been cleared of people that most of those people who are in the bottom were able to escape before the building came crashing down. Uh, there is a danger of uh, collapse, we're told, from two other buildings here in the area. Uh, the World Trade Center was more than just the two towers. There also was a complex of other office buildings. One is the Millennium Hotel, which is right across the street, a fairly new building uh, that uh, may have been structurally weakened, as well as one Liberty Plaza, which is across the uh, street on the west side. Uh, which is uh, near the uh, Hudson River, uh, those buildings apparently have been threatened uh, by the uh, fires and explosions here. Uh, there was some thought that they may have to be taken down at some point, and no word on that, just that there could be a danger of collapse at that time. Throughout this uh, early morning hours, the dump trucks continue to come by us, filled with the debris that is plucked from the uh, huge gaping hole. The debris is uh, then put onto barges and sent to the Fresh Kills landfill in Staten Island, where FBI teams and NTSB teams are sifting through all the ruins, NTSB specifically, hopefully trying to find if uh, the black box uh, can be recovered in the flight data recorder to try and get some more information from the two uh, airplanes that hit here, much as they have been able to try and gather from the plane that crashed in uh, Pennsylvania. But so far here, 257 police officers and firefighters are still missing. Mayor Giuliani has ordered 6,000 body bags. Uh, so, of course, the prognosis is grim, but there is hope 
that there still could be people obviously trapped uh, inside that. And I have to tell you, we've been hearing from the phone calls this morning, this is the spirit of America. Many people here are doing it uh, voluntarily. They're working 24 hours on, 24 hours off, trying to do the best they can from the iron workers who just rushed in from Brooklyn on their own time to start cutting through because uh, they have the expertise with the acetylene torches and, and such uh, to uh, other people such as volunteer firemen from upstate New York who are doing the best they can to try and uh, speed along this process. Back to you. Eric, I know the air there is thick with particles, debris, and dust that are flying through the air, and I know you've got a mask uh, around your neck, uh, and if you need to uh, tell me to stop asking you questions, then I, then I will, so that you can put that mask on there, buddy. But uh, I'm just wondering what kind of shifts the rescue workers are, are, are going on right now. Do you know how long they're in there? Because obviously we can't tell when they're being switched in and out, but obviously the same group of, of, uh, of rescue workers haven't been there the whole time. Well, it varies. I mean, uh, some have 24 on, 24 hours off. Others are 12 hours on, 12 hours off, or as long as they can go. But then they go home and get some rest and, uh, and come back again. Some people, of course, have been here since uh, the, uh, the terrorist attack uh, on uh, Tuesday morning. So, uh, so that varies, uh, not in terms of just a specific organized manner of scheduling for everybody. Uh, let me just explain for this mask. Uh, the, the, it depends upon where the wind shifts. The wind now is shifting that way, which blows a lot of the smoke, which is still smoldering from the fires behind us. But then when the wind shifts around and comes back over us, you've got this thick, acrid smoke. It uh, burns in your eyes and burns in your throat. Of course, there's also the threat of asbestos contamination. Uh, authorities saying that uh, some asbestos had been released. Uh, so we obviously have these masks for precautions. And also, it is really an irritant. I, after reporting here uh, yesterday for 12 hours, when I went home last night, lying in bed just thinking how uh, it really gets in your throat and your eyes. And we're three, four blocks from ground zero. So think about the guys who are in the hall or inside the uh, smoldering ruins, what they're going through. And they are volunteers, a lot of them, doing it on their own time to help try and save humanity. And Eric, uh, among the, the folks who are in there, it's not just fire and, and police folks, it's also the FBI. What can you tell us about any kind of FBI staging area, where they will go with any evidence that they may find? Well, that's what it is being taken to the uh, Fresh Kills landfill in uh, Staten Island, uh, where then they shift through the evidence there or, and right. the ruins. Let me show you here. You've got, this is basically the scene all night and all day. More new trucks. These are huge tractor trailer trucks, empty trucks, you know, just convoys going down. Uh, and these trucks come from uh, various states. There are hundreds of them, and then they get filled up, and then they go back filled, and uh, it's just a continual procession. These trucks happen to be from Connecticut, uh, and that is how they're getting uh, all of this material out of there. Uh, yesterday, we were told that they had 120 truckloads. That obviously increasing now uh, to hundreds and hundreds of trucks uh, that are in a very coordinated effort coming down this way. They get filled up, and then they go off to the barges to be, uh, for, for the uh, debris to be sent to Staten Island. All right, such a, a difficult and very busy process. Eric, Sean, take care and please put on that mask and uh, take care of yourself. Thanks very much for the update. Okay, you too, guys. Right. Thanks, Eric. We want to go now to the Pentagon near Washington where David Schuster is standing by with the latest on what's going on there. Good morning, David. Right, good morning. Very different scene here. The air is clear. The fires have been out for uh, almost 12 hours now. The biggest challenge right now for some of the fire crews and some of the engineers are these sort of... Uh, these beams and these structures in the Pentagon, they remain apparently very unstable. Uh, throughout the night, we've seen workers walking on the roof of the Pentagon, checking out some of the beams. We understand there are some logistical problems as far as some of the really heavy equipment that they'd like to take into some of the concentric rings towards the inner side of the Pentagon. There are sort of tunnels and paths, but they were never meant for the large trucks or the large equipment that they would like to use to be able to remove uh, some of this uh, debris. So a lot of logistical challenges here at the Pentagon. Uh, late on Wednesday, some firefighters who were on the roof unfurled a giant flag uh, off of the Pentagon. Uh, this uh, was something that uh, uh, the governor of Virginia, James Gilmore, had suggested that uh, 
people in the area to show their support, their solidarity with the rescue workers. The Pentagon might fly the flag, and so you had the firefighters flying one. A number of radio stations have picked up uh, the rallying cry, and across the Washington metropolitan area, you can see a lot of homes now that are also sporting uh, American flags that they are flying. Uh, the flag here at the Pentagon came out uh, just a few minutes before President Bush came to pay his respects to those who died here at the Pentagon, but also to thank all of the rescue workers, all the firefighters, the president one by one expressing his support, saying that the entire nation stands with all of those who are uh, trying to dig through some of the rubble here at the Pentagon. By all accounts, it has been fairly rough going. A number of firefighters have said that the damage here, the structural damage at the point of impact at the Pentagon uh, was worse than what some of these very same firefighters say that they saw in Oklahoma City with the Alfred P. Murrah Federal Building. And the death toll here at the Pentagon is expected to be higher. 168 died in Oklahoma City. Here at the Pentagon, 80 bodies have been retrieved, but they are expecting that number to go up, perhaps more than 200. Uh, at one point yesterday, some media accounts are referring to Arlington County Fire officials uh, said that perhaps the death toll could be as high as 800 because that's the number of uh, office workers the Pentagon estimated were in this area where the jetliner slammed into the building. Uh, but since yesterday, a number of defense officials, including the Secretary of Defense, have tried to downplay that figure. Uh, the Secretary of Defense spoke at a news conference last night. Here's part of what he had to say. We currently believe and are certainly hopeful that the number of casualties being reported in the press is high. Uh, as you know from your own observation out there, the work is still going forward, and uh, we won't know for some time uh, precise numbers, but uh, from everything that we currently know, the, the estimate that's been widely reported is uh, considerably high. Now, just to put it all in some perspective, though, they are still expecting uh, at least uh, 200 dead here at the Pentagon. Uh, there were 64 on the jetliner and approximately 150 military and civilian workers uh, inside the Pentagon who have yet to be accounted for. Rick and Lori. Uh, David, very quickly, I want to ask you about uh, concerns that folks may have there about the stability uh, of the building where the plane actually came in and crashed into the Pentagon. Right. Part of the concern is that uh, there are still pieces. There, there are essentially five floors to the Pentagon. There's a hole about 200 feet. We've all seen the pictures. Next to that, they're apparently inside on some of the concentric rings. There are still four and five floors that, according to some uh, fire crews, are st essentially hanging by a thread. So part of the effort to, before they can even go in to try to find more of the bodies in some of the places that might not be as obvious, Part of the effort, according to the rescue crews, is simply build up some st structure work to essentially give more support to some of these precarious uh, pieces of beam, these precarious beams and metal structures. And they say a lot of that work has to be completed before some of the fire crews uh, will feel that it is safe for them to go farther in. One of the things that we have seen them doing is they will actually take a crane and drop a basket down into the crevice to try to see uh, where there might be some supports needed, where might the, the fire crews be able to go. That's also, we understand, how they dropped in some of the listening devices. They were hoping, hoping that they might see some signs of life, but uh, unfortunately they have heard over the last 24 hours absolutely nothing. Another difference between the scene uh, here in New York and the scene there is that in New York City, people are still walking around in, in shock and disbelief at what happened, uh, whereas, as we spoke about earlier, David, you say the people at the Pentagon, not surprisingly, since it's the military headquarters, are a little more battle-hardened. Rick, that's absolutely right. I mean, there's just sort of every expectation that uh, a number of the people at the Pentagon here have served at various mil military installations around the world. Uh, unfortunately, this has been something that the military has faced before. I think one other difference, Rick, is simply the proximity in Manhattan. Of course, very, as you know, very tightly crowded there together. So many people affected uh, here. We're about as close as, as, as just about anybody in the area. And we're about 500 yards away from the Pentagon. And the Pentagon is really sort of separated from the rest of the city. Uh, the highways around the area have been closed. And it's really difficult for people in the Washington area to get a sense as to what's really happened here at the Pentagon, unlike where in New York, you just look up and you see that the World Trade Center towers are not there. Here at the Pentagon, that's not that same sort of visual impact on uh, residents across the city. David, David Schuster at the Pentagon. David, thank you very much. Attorney General John Ashcroft is calling this the most massive and intensive investigation ever conducted in America. 
Of course, the investigation going on both in Washington, D.C. and in New York. And some reports are now saying that as many as 50 people might have been involved in these terrorist attacks. Todd Connor has been following this for us all night and into the morning and has the very latest on the search for suspects. Hi, Todd. Hi, Lori. Hi, Rick. Well, the L.A. Times reporting that 40 of those 50 are accounted for, with 10 of those still on the loose. And law enforcement sources now telling our Rita Cosby that searches for these killers have spread over six states and 20 locations in those six states. Most of those are on the East Coast, but later today, the FBI is expected to search some homes and businesses on the West Coast. Now, the LA Times gives us our first look at a possible hijacker. If we can take a look at the LA Times website. This man that you're going to see here is Emmanuel Atta Muhammad. He is believed to have been enrolled in a Florida flight training school at one time. And according to a detective in the Venice, Florida Police Department, FBI agents identified him as one of the men who flew the hijacked jets. Very important report in the L.A. Times today. Also today, from Florida to Boston, FBI agents armed with guns and search warrants. They looked for leads into who is behind these attacks. At the Westin Hotel, for example, three people were taken into custody. However, we should note that those three people were later released. And down in South Florida, FBI agents searched at least three homes there. One of the homes was rented to a couple and their four children until this past weekend when we are told they abruptly moved. Investigators taking away bags of evidence and at two other homes lived pilots. One was taken into custody at this time. As far as we know, he has not been arrested. The other one was just gone from that location. Also, as we take you back to live pictures of the rescue and recovery, law enforcement sources are telling Fox News that at least one of the hijackers had a ramp pass, which means he would have had the ability to get weapons on board and anything else he wanted. And Fox News has learned a few months ago an American Airlines crew in Rome, Italy had their hotel rooms broken into and stolen were pilots' uniforms and IDs. Now, two weeks ago, American even issued a memo to employees to be on the lookout for imposter pilots. Officials telling us, though, at, at this time, they're not sure if this had anything to do with the attacks. And one last thing, if I may, that's very disconcerting, at least to me. The New York Times reporting today that officials told them a group of five men suspected of assisting the hijackers had set up their cameras along the Hudson River, which is just across from Manhattan. They had trained those cameras on the World Trade Center, the Twin Towers. Now, officials telling the New York Times they photographed those attacks and were said to have congratulated each other after the attacks on the World Trade Center. Lori, Rick, back to you. Jeez. All right, it's unbelievable. Ooh. Todd Connor, thanks very much, Todd. You know, it goes without saying that airport security in this country has suffered a catastrophic failure, and to some airline passengers, all of this might come as a shock, but there are a lot of people who follow the airline industry very closely. They know what goes on at the airports, and they say they're not surprised at all. William Lajeunesse has more. Airport security. Our system say experts is full of holes from baggage check-in to the cockpit door. There's a small latch, but as we've seen uh, before, that latch can be broken very easily to somebody who's serious about getting in a cockpit. It can be done with a heavy object, a blunt object. It could be done with a rope. It could be done with a small knife. So it doesn't have to carry a gun through security. That poses a tough challenge for those who screen carry-on luggage. According to reports, our weakest link. After the crash of TWA Flight 800, a dozen government audits revealed gaping holes in passenger screening, calling airport staff underpaid, inexperienced, and poorly trained. Baggage screeners earning $6 an hour with no fringe benefits. At some airports, turnover exceeded 400%, compared to 50% in Europe, where airlines typically hire ex-police. That's the key point right there, is the people who are checking the x-ray machines. Are they qualified? They know how to do the job. Are they strong enough to question people as they come through? I'm sorry. Another problem? Hoping to save money, some airports have outdated technology. Some airlines refuse to use bomb detection equipment because of flight delays. And while experts admit it's impossible to stop everyone in every threat, they can learn from every incident. One airport audit showed undercover agents using phony IDs and uniforms penetrating security 70% of the time. Others in plain clothes illegally boarded airplanes well before check-in. It got so bad that two years ago the FAA threatened to put armed agents on every plane. 
but backed down after the airlines complained. And next week, the agency was scheduled to release mandatory tough new rules on baggage screening. In Los Angeles, William Lajeunesse, Fox News. Well, we here at Fox pride ourselves in taking your phone calls every day, and this day is no different. We want to hear what you have to say about what has been going on in the last uh, close to 48 hours now as we look at a picture of the hand-by-hand -hand process of sifting through the rubble down in lower Manhattan, where just 48 hours ago, the two World Trade Center towers stood proudly. Our first call is Satara in Illinois, and good morning to you, Satara. Good what, morning. What is on your mind this morning? Well, I just wanted to let people know that I'm an Arab American, and I was born in New York, and watching this over the past few days has really just made me sick. I mean, just physically sick. I wanted to let people know that no one calling themselves a Muslim would murder people like this. It's just very emotional. I'm sure it for is. Me. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, uh, I just want everybody to send out their prayers and their love to these people. Well, Satara, you're right about that. Um, everybody needs our prayers right now in New York, Washington, really all around the country. Let me ask you a personal question. Mm -hmm. Have people been looking at you a little differently the last couple of days? Are, are people staring at you because um, you're Arab American? Are they? No, I mean, they. I, I'm not sure that they would know. I, uh -huh. I don't cover my head. Okay. I mean, I'm Muslim, but I don't cover my head. Okay. Um, and I have a lot of friends who who know me and know about my culture and know about my religion and know that this is not something that we condone, that it's wrong. It's suicide and it's murder, two things in Islam that, that are wrong. So... And yet there are, are some people who are willing to lose their lives over this. We don't know exactly who is responsible, although uh, all leads are pointing to uh, Osama bin Laden and some of his uh, followers. Um, well, so unfortunately, like in every religion, there are very misguided people who take the scriptures and corrupt them. Right. Satara, so, thank you very much for the call thank tonight. You. We appreciate it. Okay. Good night. Good night. Good night. Let's go to Texas now, and Kyle, you're on the phone. Good morning, Kyle. Good morning. I live in New Jersey. I'm one of the people who's kind of trapped in Texas. <laughs> what do you mean by that? I, have a f I had a flight that was supposed to go back into New Jersey on Tuesday, and because of this... Because of all the planes being grounded, you haven't been able to get home. Exactly. And, I mean, I would love to be there helping out because I'm CPR and first aid certified as well as a certified welder. But unfortunately, I can't be. But what I have noticed is that everyone is so focused on the New York side getting into the, the wreckage and trying to get people out. I'm wondering, have, has anyone focused on the New Jersey side going into the sub-basement? The, the, the New Jersey side down near the World Trade Center? Are you talking about that near the PATH trains? Yes. Well, uh, you know what? I don't know the answer to that question, but we do know that rescue workers have been underground. Uh, they have found pockets underneath. You know, there's that whole mall area underneath the World Trade Center Plaza, uh, and that is an area where rescue efforts are going on right now. Um, but uh, as far I, I'm, I'm curious, and do you have any information? Have you been able to get any information from your airline in terms of when you might be able to get home? Because we heard today from uh, the transportation secretary on Wednesday, actually, that people whose flights were diverted uh, and only those people who were ticketed to fly uh, would soon be able to get home. Do you know about that? Well, I'm actually at my destination. I mean, my flight wasn't diverted. I came into Dallas on Thursday of last week. I was supposed to fly back out to New Jersey on Tuesday, but all of my flights were canceled. But what I was saying was, as far as the sub-basement, if they go through the PATH system, especially at the Exchange Place station, one stop, the next stop after Exchange Place is the World Trade Center, right. the sub-basement, which is below the mall area. I know this because I use the PATH system a lot. Okay, I understand what you're saying now, and, and I understand now I'm told 
that the debris, a lot of the debris when the buildings collapsed, fell north uh, onto that area that you're talking about. Mm. Well, we, we'll, be, we'll stay tuned to Fox News, uh, at Kyle, and, and we'll continue to check and get some information for you on that. All right, let's go clear out to Hawaii now where Norma joins us. And uh, Norma, good evening to you. What do you make of what you have seen so many thousands of miles away from where you are? God, um, I can only tell you uh, it's so frustrating to be so far away and not be able to do anything. Uh, the mood here, uh, I live on the Marine Corps base, and um, very first, my first thought I hate, I'm ashamed to admit yesterday morning, when I woke up and my mother-in-law called me from California to let me know what was going on and I thought dear God don't let them find out because I don't want my husband going to war he is an excellent marine though and he helped me understand we have a 10 month old son so mm. I thought I don't want my husband going to war and my son growing up without a father mm. and uh, my husband helped me to understand that um, I mean I married him when he was already in the Marine Corps and I knew on some level, I knew that one day he might have to go to war, but I just never expected anything like this to happen. And uh, it, the mood here is everyone is so frustrated. And now, little by little, we're beginning to understand, you know, that I got together with a few of the other wives this morning, and uh, we were in class, and we were just started discussing the whole issue. And um, we've all just made up our minds that, you know, we have to support our husbands and we have to we're the backbone and we have to support them and be not make them feel guilty when they have to leave and right just get everything ready we're god we're running around like you know chickens yeah. with our heads cut off trying to get powers of attorney done well norma uh indeed we may see a lot of activity in the coming months and we wish you and your family the best of luck and of course um, all of our military forces will be needing all of our good thoughts and prayers. Uh, Norma in Hawaii, thanks for the call and thanks to all of you for calling in this morning. Well, now we want to go to our senior financial correspondent, Brenda Butner, who has a look at how the foreign markets are reacting to what happened uh, almost 48 hours ago. And, uh, Brenda, I know that you have some news about the Nikkei and possibly some other markets. Yes, some minus signs in Paris, London, and Germany, but not significant drops. And as in Asia, we don't expect to see much definitive action one way or the other out of the overseas markets overnight. That's because the last time we heard the closing bell ring, uh, ring out trading on Wall Street was Monday afternoon the day before, and tomorrow it will once again be silent. No equities trading in the U.S. for the third day in a row. Not since the Great Depression have we seen such a long, unscheduled stop to the markets. But not for much longer, say NYSE and NASDAQ officials. Wall Street wants to get to business as usual as early as Friday and no later than Monday. They intend the opening bell to be heard far beyond the canyons of Wall Street, a signal that though terrorists could fell buildings, they cannot bring down the free markets. Now, the challenge is to effectively communicate transactions in an area that is essentially a war zone. So you should expect some glitches at first. Wall Street has never been through such a disaster, but the intent is to start sooner rather than later and the overseas markets offer some clues into what may happen when we do once get business underway remarkable resilience overseas also some of the more defensive plays such as gold which had spiked initially after the attack lost some of their Tuesday gains we can also learn from history it shows that US stocks have been strong in the face of terrorism and war whether the Gulf War or the bombing of the Trade Center or even the assassination of a president so the numbers may indeed take quite a tumble once we hear that bell either Friday or Monday but don't assume that will set the tone for the longer term back over to you Lori and Rick senior business correspondent Brenda Butner Brenda thank you very much it is just about the bottom of the hour now and we want to get you caught up on all the latest news that we have for you this morning because things have been developing overnight that's right we're getting information literally every few minutes we want to bring you up to date on the very latest developments emergency workers are continuing to dig hand by hand through the rubble at ground zero which of course is where the World Trade Center towers once stood the death toll is expected to be enormous into the thousands 82 deaths have been confirmed so far at that location there are reports that Afghanistan is bracing for an imminent US attack meantime the US State Department is a 
advising worldwide caution. And the Los Angeles Times is reporting that a team of 50 people may be responsible for carrying out these strikes. Also from the Los Angeles Times, FBI agents have found suicide notes in New York that were written by some of the hijackers. As we look at video there of the very first plane coming into the first World Trade Center tower Tuesday morning. You know, so many people, uh, especially people here in the New York City area, waiting on word of well, the possible fate of their loved ones who have been missing since Tuesday's terror attacks. And we in the media are doing what we can to help to get word out about those who are still unaccounted for. Penny Crone is among our reporters who's trying to help. This terror has broken so many hearts. So many people are so frightened and so desperate to find their loved ones. We have hundreds of these pieces of, of pictures of an identification that people here have been handing to us and asking us, can you help us? Can you help us find them? Right now at Bellevue, it is closed. Before earlier, people were able to go in and check the names. And we have this young lady with us. You, you said you're pregnant. Yeah. And tell me, your daddy was in World Trade Center? Yeah, he was in Tower 2 in the 96th floor. And it's been desperate since yesterday. This is tragic. This is not fair. We are, you know, that the media, the police department, the firemen are all working. You have to take care of yourself and keep hoping. You know that. Yes. And please, if you find him, his name is Archangel Vasquez. He's six foot tall, bald. I look just like him, so... You don't have a picture? No, I but don't. you must take care of yourself and your new baby to come. Thank you. He would want that? Yes, he would. And then, hopefully, you'll find him. Thank you. Penny Crone reporting. Well, no doctors can help one of the victims in the worst terrorist attack in America's history, the World Trade Center itself. But before those twin towers, those 110-floor towers, were lost forever, the buildings managed to survive an impact that would have instantly destroyed most skyscrapers and buy enough time to save countless lives. Claudia Cowan reports. Once the jewels of New York skyline, the World Trade Center towers stood up against terrorism long enough to save countless lives. The plane came through. It took out a few of the exterior columns of the building and then set off this massive fire with the jet fuel. And fortunately, because of the perimeter tube system of the building, it was able to withstand the initial impact and allow a lot of people to get out. Other buildings would have toppled immediately, but the towers remained upright for nearly an hour, supported on the outside by closely spaced steel columns and struts, and on the inside by a second set of columns designed to bear the load of gravity, a double support system that withstood the crash, but not the raging jet fuel fire. The, the girders or the joists that hold up the floors collapsed, and as those fell to the floor below, they overwhelmed the capacity of that floor, and we, we, we had it was what we call a progressive collapse, which then continued on through the base of the building until there, uh, it was a complete and total failure. Most experts say tall buildings will continue to be made out of steel. What may change, they say, is the design of signature skyscrapers, the tallest and most exposed buildings. They may never be built in quite the same way. It's not like we could ever design every building for this scenario, or should we? But after every major earthquake, for example, we change our building codes to improve our practice in the future, and uh, I would expect a similar thing will happen here. One possibility, designs that include more escape routes around the perimeter of the building, as well as in the center. But experts say no building can withstand an attack by a pilot willing to die for a cause. The challenge ahead? simply finding ways to reduce the loss of life. In San Francisco, Claudia Cowan, Fox News. You know, as investigators search through the rubble here in New York City, in Washington, D.C., at the Pentagon, and also in Pennsylvania, one of their goals is to try to find that cockpit voice and data recorder at each one of those sites, the so-called black boxes that may hold the key to a lot of our unanswered questions. So what exactly are they, and why are they so valuable? Fox News correspondent David Schuster explains. The so-called black boxes are actually fluorescent orange, and by airline regulations, nothing else can be this color on any commercial aircraft. There are usually two boxes on each flight. Investigators consider both to be essential because one records cockpit conversations and sounds, the other records technical data. The flight recorder is very good at telling us what's wrong with the airplane, things that are actually, you know, engine quit, uh, 
landing gear didn't come down, something like that. Something that, that actually has to do with the airplane, that's the flight recorder's strong point. The voice recorder is very good at, at this operational, the, the man-machine interface, the crew and how they interact with the airplane uh, and decisions that they make. The recorders are usually located in the back of a jet. That's because the most predictable point of impact in a crash is towards the front. Still, the boxes are made to withstand forces 10 times greater than a crash and temperatures higher than those caused by burning fuel. Most of the cockpit voice recorders and flight recorders that we get uh, look just like this. They look probably as good as the day they were made, maybe a few scratches and a few dents. Uh, every once in a while, we will get a recorder that, that has been uh, smashed. If it has been smashed in water, that is usually not a problem. Recorders retrieved from the ocean are kept in ocean water until investigators examine them. It's the air that hurts the tape once it's been wet. It actually will start to rust. So we have them shipped here in water, and uh, as soon as we're ready to play them, we take them out of the water, dry them off, and then get a good copy of it before anything starts to deteriorate. We have had recorders uh, underwater for upwards of six and seven years, and uh, the, they're just fine. The flight data recorder, which tracks the technical and mechanical information, comes in two different formats. The first is a tape-based recorder, which gathers data on a 30-minute loop. The second format records data on computer chips and can compile more than 25 hours' worth of flight information. It all comes out as numbers, calculations, or technical words and bits. It's actually a waveform that, that is then, it's zeros and ones that our software decodes into numbers and then we can bring it up on the screen and see altitude and airspeed and different flight control positions and pitch and roll and, and what the aircraft is actually doing. It looks like a strip chart with the lines moving across the screen. At this station, flight data recorder specialist Cassandra Johnson examines a tape-based recorder. She has downloaded the data, and her computer software has made the conversions. We're reading it out. We're getting good data. We have a graph of the incident or accident, and we will pass it along to the investigator so that they can see what the recorder is telling them about the aircraft. And the most important part is, is for them to focus on a certain systems. What the recorder is telling them is not always easy to picture. So the safety board sometimes generates a data-based animation to help explain what happened. This one is from a 1999 American Airlines crash. An MD-82 was coming in to land at the airport in Little Rock, Arkansas. It was almost midnight, as you can see by the time up here. There were storms in the area, and the aircraft landed on the runway, um, proceeded to skid around on the runway, and then went off the end of the runway. Uh, down an embankment, impacted a steel structure, and 11 people, including the pilot, were, were killed. In that particular crash, investigators were also helped by the cockpit voice recorder. It revealed the pilots knew about the storms, but thought they had a clear path down the runway. And approach American 420, I know you're doing your best, but we're getting pretty close to the storm. We'll keep it timing, we have to. Cockpit voice recorders give investigators a good idea of what the crew was doing when the incident happened. It can also paint a personal picture of despair and confusion. Sometimes the crew doesn't have any idea of what's going wrong. They don't have any more idea than, than we do uh, what's, what's going wrong with the airplane. They may say things that are just completely not right because from the information that they have, um, you know, that's their analysis of that information. And, and it's, it's very difficult sometimes to do that on the fly when things are really going badly. Vern Ellingstad is director of the Office of Research and Engineering at the NTSB. He says the safety board learns something new from every incident or crash. Aviation accidents are a very rare event. It's a very safe form of transportation. And the predictability of what might go wrong in each of these kind of rare you know, circumstances is very difficult. So we, we do, uh, you know, recover a, a, a huge amount of important information. Some safety experts believe it is not enough, and already the NTSB is considering whether recorders should have their own power supplies. In the crash of a Swiss air jet, the last six minutes were not on the data recorder because of an electrical problem in the plane. The safety board is also thinking about placing video cameras in the cockpit. Still, investigators believe that nothing provides as much information as the so-called black boxes. They are the key, say the experts, to piecing together what happened. In Washington, David Schuster, Fox News. All right, let's turn our attention now from the black boxes to this surreal scene in lower Manhattan. 
At 4.40 a.m. in the morning, hundreds of firefighters, rescue crews, police officers, FBI, sifting through the rubble, continuing to dig through hand by hand at ground zero from Tuesday morning's attack. What's been called a bucket brigade. And if you look closely, you can literally see these workers handing buckets to each other. They are having to do this very piecemeal, hand by hand, David versus Goliath kind of process. The progress is maddeningly slow for these folks. And now we look at a picture from the Pentagon where the plane slammed into it just moments after the plane slammed into the two World Trade Centers. The damage, not as bad there, but still, it's going to be a long time before the Pentagon is the same. A lot of structural damage there, about five stories there. Um, a big gaping hole in the Pentagon and just rubble in New York City. You know, it's amazing. I, I, just as we look at that picture of the Pentagon and we, we see what's left of the World Trade Center bombing, I was thinking about the images of the Alfred P. Mara Federal Building in Oklahoma City that, you know, is now just a part of, of our collective consciousness. We all know what that building looked like, of course, before it came down. These images are still fresh, but we will all know them. They, they're all becoming all too familiar Those to us. Those open floors, just rows and rows of floors, and not so many with the Pentagon, but yes, it's frighteningly familiar. All right. Well, moving on to something else that's very frightening. Some of the passengers on United Flight 93 appear to have taken on their hijackers before crashing eventually in Pennsylvania. One of the victims called his wife on a cell phone and told her they were being hijacked. She told him what happened at the World Trade Center Tower, so he knew about that. And he called back later to say that he and some other passengers were planning to act and they may have acted against the hijackers. We may never know exactly what they did for sure. He wasn't the only passenger who made a last minute call. As terrorists took over four flights Tuesday, passengers and crew members used cell phones to reach out with urgent cries for help, with information for authorities, or with last second words of love for family members. Mark Bingham was aboard United Flight 93, which had left Newark for San Francisco. He reached family members at home. He just said, I want to let you all know that I love you very, very much in case I don't see you again. I said that. That the plane has been taken over by hijackers. And, um, and then I said, well, we love you very much too, Mark. Let me go get your mother. An unidentified man hiding in a bathroom aboard Flight 93 dialed 911 on his cell phone to reach a dispatcher outside Pittsburgh. We are being hijacked. We are being hijacked. This is not a joke, he said, before his phone went dead. Aboard the same flight, Lauren Grancolis, on her way home to San Francisco from her grandmother's funeral in New Jersey, was able to reach her husband, Jack. We have been hijacked, she told him. They are being kind. I love you. Flight attendant C.C. Ross of Fort Myers, Florida, put through a panicked call to her husband, Lauren Lyles, who had just gotten their two sons off to school. He heard screams in the background as she told him, we've been hijacked. I love you. I love the children. Still on Flight 93, Thomas Burnett called his wife, Dina, and told her of a final act of resistance to terror. I know we're all going to die. There's three of us who are going to do something about it, he said. Flight 93 was the only plane that didn't reach its target crashing into an empty field in southern Pennsylvania. Peter Hansen of Groton, Massachusetts, was aboard United Flight 175 with his wife and their three-year-old daughter as it left Boston for Los Angeles. He reached his father in Connecticut. Hansen told his parents he knew they were all going to die, but he tried to reassure them. Don't worry about us. It's going to be quick, Hansen told his father. United Flight 175 was the second plane to crash into the World Trade Center. Fox News commentator Barbara Olson was aboard American Airlines Flight 77 as it left Washington for Los Angeles. She was able to place two calls to her husband, Theodore Olson, the U.S. Solicitor General. Our plane is being hijacked. She then asked, what should I tell the pilot? The call was cut off, but she immediately called back to ask again, what should I tell the pilot? Those were her final words as minutes later, American Flight 77 became a massive missile and crashed into the Pentagon. Steve Brown, Fox News. 
The search for whom might have been involved in, in to coordinate and carrying out these attacks continues, and it's not just going on in this country, it's going on overseas as well. Todd Connor joins us now from Fox Central with some late breaking developments. Todd? That's right, Rick and Lori. A, a little uh, nugget of information coming to us from Hamburg, Germany. Investigators over in Germany right now working under very tight security as they go through an apartment where two men believed to be linked to these terrorist attacks in the United States once lived. We'll take a look at the video now from uh, the LA Times website earlier today. You're looking at one of those suspects, Mohammed Atta. Uh, Rita Cosby also uh, brought you his name and his picture earlier last night. He and another man, Marwan al uh were once um, students at a Florida flight school and had arrived from Germany to Florida in July of 2000. So this apartment that they're searching today in Germany, these suspects hadn't lived in for really more than a year, but still investigators hope to gain some sort of information, gain some kind of clue from this apartment where uh, apparently two suspects in the terrorist attacks once lived. Again, these two men came from Germany in July of 2000. They lived in Florida at least until January, where they were students at Huffman Aviation uh, Flying School down in Florida. So that's the latest from here. Back to you two. All right, Todd. Thanks very much. All right. Well, we've been taking your phone calls uh, throughout the evening and now into the early morning, and uh, we always love to hear from any, everyone in, in times like this. Sometimes it's helpful to say what's on your mind, and um, we appreciate everyone who has called in. And the first person we're going to talk to right now is from California, Cal. You're on the line. Good morning, Cal. Good morning. How what are you? Um, we're doing okay. How are you doing? Um, well, it's been a terror, terror day. Yep. Terror second day. Yep. Um, it's going to be terror like weeks and months, Cal. It will be. Uh, first, I would like to send condolences to everybody's families and friends of all the people that have lost their lives and from being from a Middle Eastern descent being here a long time I would like to let everybody know that anybody who would commit an act like this is truly a terrorist but I also would like to everybody to be able to distinguish between terrorists and Muslims there's always been a thing about Muslim terrorists and really good Muslims believe in the book just like Christians and all the other religions and I would like to let everybody know that we condemn killing even one person let alone the quantities the book tells us we have to live in peace God is one and only and we all believe in living in a peaceful world and I would like to let everybody know that Muslims real Muslims don't do these kind of acts terrorists do and we're against anybody and everybody who takes one single life. Cal, has anybody taken out their uh, anger or frustrations against you or anyone well, in your family? Personally not, but however, the mosques in California, and especially the, uh, in Santa Clara, which is a very active mosque, uh, has received many, many terror uh, telephone calls, uh, threatening telephone calls. Uh, personally, I have not had any problems um, my neighbors and everybody around are very very good uh, american citizens uh, who believe in peace like i do and we all share the same mentality which is we believe that peace is really what should be and not these kind of acts and being a true muslim i would let everybody know in the united states and would love to have the media try to be able to distinguish between a terrorist and a Muslim, because a true Muslim will never do such an act. Well, by uh, calling in tonight, I think that and uh, do you... Do me a favor, please. Right. Let our educators, because here in California, educators are again associating Muslims with terrorists. One of my friend's kids are going to school and hearing these remarks, Muslim terrorists, this and that. And it would be nice to have our educators educate people that there is a difference. Well, I think there will be time for the media be to talk about that very subject, and we appreciate you calling and uh, giving us some education on it. Thanks very much, Cal. All right, let's go all the way out to Hawaii now, where Nathaniel is on the line. And Nathaniel, this is many thousands of miles away from you, but what do you make of what you have seen in the last 48 hours? 
Well, of course, it's just uh, absolutely terrible, and uh, my, my condolences go out to all those who've been, who've been affected by this tragedy. Um, I'm really calling, though, because I, I'm starting to see a theme on a lot of the news programs where uh, uh, people are saying that the intelligence community must have uh, failed at some point in time, and uh, I myself work in the intelligence community. And I'd like, pe like to let people know that, you know, we work very hard with um, what we have, but even some of the news organizations saying as many as 50 people being involved, you have to take that into consideration. That's 50 people out of the billions of people in this world. Mm. And we're not infallible. Nobody is. And for years we've been asking for more money, especially for the, the human intelligence side of the business, and it hasn't come around. And maybe it takes something like this for people to...